Introduction to the Priest and His Disciples. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. The Priest and His Disciples by Kurata Hyakuzo. Translated by Glenn William Shaw, 1886 1961. Epigraph. E'en the worst of sinners' eyes simply on the Buddha cry, and safe folded in his breast, in salvation's self find rest. Though eyes have I, I cannot see, for lust of things preventeth me. But his great mercy never ending, ever lighteth all my wending. The Right Belief, Song of Invocation. Translator's Introduction. Kurata Hyakuzo the author of the reading drama shuketo sono deshi of which this book is a sentence for sentence translation was born in eighteen ninety one in shobara a secluded little village some fifty miles north of onomichi in hiroshima ken he comes of an old family which has for generations conducted a substantial country dry goods store there and owns a considerable acreage in neighbouring rice fields after graduating with a good record from his provincial middle school he was sent by his father to pursue his studies at the first high school in tokyo but he read what appealed to him rather than what he was told to read and left school without completing the course he had just lost his two elder sisters given up his studies been disappointed in love and fallen victim to an incurable tubercular affliction when at the age of twenty-six after having contemplated committing suicide and determined rather to fight out his life to its natural end he wrote this the first and still the greatest of the many successes which have now made him the idol of a growing group of young japanese who find in his writings the encouragement and stimulus to help them brave out their own difficulties shuketo sonodeshi is a story of religion and love woven about the lives of shinran shonin and his disciples shinran eleven seventy three to twelve sixty two was the founder of the shin sect of buddhism the outstanding features of which are its doctrine of salvation through faith in the buddha amida and its recognition of a normal married life for priests and laymen it is today the largest and most influential of the buddhist sects having over nineteen thousand temples nearly fifteen thousand priests and adherents running up into the millions worship for them consists of the sincere recitation of the invocation namu amida butsu save us o amida buddha since its publication in nineteen eighteen shuketo sonodeshi has gone through well over a hundred editions it has been rearranged for stage production and after successful presentation before crowded and almost worshipfully attentive houses at the imperial theatre and the yurakuza in tokyo and later at the naniwaza in osaka is now on the road in the provinces and it has been the immediate cause of a whole flood of books on the life of shinran that still continue to come from the press in undiminished numbers its great popularity seems to be due not to its being good propaganda for the most popular of the buddhist sects which it undoubtedly is nor to its being a historically accurate portrayal of the greatest revolutionizing figure in japanese buddhism which it certainly is not but rather to the sincere and moving exposition it presents of the religious philosophy of a thinking and struggling contemporary in an unsettled land of change in japan today as indeed in all lands there are many people who cannot believe in anything and kurato offers them in story form what he believes to be the only reasonable attitude toward life his story is packed with anachronisms and errors of fact his shinran is not the historical shinran some of the words he puts into shinran's mouth were surely never spoken by anybody in kyoto in the thirteenth century he has simply taken a great and admired teacher whose heart looks to him like his own and without violent wrenching made him the vehicle for the expression of his own convictions and where did he get the terms with which to understand and in which to clothe those convictions he got them everywhere just as every modern japanese writer does out of his everyday life 
out of his reading of japanese chinese and western literature out of buddhism and out of christianity he makes no distinction between them but having taken them all for his own uses them as his own his book may be called a twentieth century laboratory demonstration of that process of borrowing and adaptation that has through the ages altered all religions some buddhist critics have avowed that shinran must be weeping in his grave at the picture kurata has drawn of him some foreign christians will surely call parts of the book deliberate steals but other followers of shinran have pointed out that if that generous reformer were living today his teachings to the people of japan would be less unlike those of kurata than the illiberal critics suppose and many liberal christians too care more for the teaching than for its identification and will find this book a mixture in which their favorite beliefs are working as a leaven whatever others may think kurata hyakuzo is evidently a serious man fighting death with his art and breathing into that art what he believes to be a vital message leonardo da vinci's last supper and mona lisa hang together on the wall by his sickbed at omori near tokyo and speak eloquently of two different loves he has added to his japanese birthright one the love of the man jesus and the other the love of the feminine soul i have limited myself to the task of making a faithful translation of the words of the author where the text contains expressions employed in christian phraseology i have tried carefully not to read into them either more or less than their natural content hitsuji should certainly be rendered sheep despite its unnatural use as a japanese religious metaphor but whether doji no mure literally a bevy of boys the doji of which is a word ordinarily used to designate the youths who wait upon saintly persons in the east should be turned into the hebrew word cherubim is at least open to question my only deliberate departure from the original however has been in the rearrangement for the sake of uniformity of some of the material at the heads of acts and scenes and here and there of the paragraphing of stage directions the japanese pronunciation of proper names has been used throughout and all japanese titles of courtesy have been retained i am indebted to the author for his kind permission to publish this translation and to my friend and neighbor mr nagura jiro for the invaluable assistance that makes me believe i have approached accuracy in my work glenn w shaw yamaguchi june third nineteen twenty two End of Translator's Introduction Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Induction to the Priest and His Disciples by Kurata Hyakuzo Translated by Glenn William Shaw, 1886-1961 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine induction mortality a vision that came to me once on a day man walking on the face of the earth i am born and bathed in sunlight and breathing in the atmosphere i live truly i live see that beautifully colored arch of a sky and this black earth on which these naked feet of mine walk with firm step luxuriant trees and grasses flying and frisking birds and beasts and better still the preciousness of woman the love of children ah i would live i would live pauses up to this day i have known all manner of grief but the more i suffer the more i like this world ah strange world i cling to thee lovable shaba i would play in the forests of worldly passions i would live a thousand nay ten thousand years for ever for ever a being with covered face appears being what are you man i'm a man being then you're a thing that dies aren't you man i'm alive that's all i know being you evade again i see man my father died my father's father too oh many of my beloved neighbors also have died but that i shall die i cannot believe being you're spoilt aren't you man after a moment's hesitation in truth i'm afraid i fear i may die ah you've looked through my heart the truth is i think i may die 
for from the beginning my ancestors the wise patriarchs have called themselves mortal being it's the truth like birds and beasts grasses and trees fishes and shells you die man who are you you who speak with these words of authority being i'm the servant of that which never dies don't you know me man i seem to know you but no i don't after all being often you seem to call my name especially of late so often as to vex me man then is it possible that you humbly i beg you to take off your veil and let me see your face but once being i don't show my face to mortals to things that die man why not being because if seen of a mortal i'd die of shame man in the words thing that dies i hear what seems to be a meaning of contempt being that's because death comes of sin the sinless live eternally thing that dies is identical with sinner man then do you say that all men are sinners being they're all bad the price of sin is death disappears man this was he that's certain what on earth is he illusion or actuality at first i was sure he was a phantom but gradually i reached the point where i couldn't believe it for his terrible power of destruction is too plain if he's real what on earth is he i'd like to see what he really is if i but knew that i'd not fear him because knowing the real nature of those fearful things fire and water i use them according to their own laws and make them turn the wheels of my mills and heat my furnaces i'd like to know his laws i'd like to get hold of his real being otherwise my life will always be threatened it's my misfortune that i've made his acquaintance but my wisdom also has grown ah but he's fearful being reappearing you called me again didn't you man i want to see your face being it cannot be man not possibly being that wish is beyond your station so long as your eyes are impure man not though i make you being you poor thing man extends his hand and tries to take off the veil being cursed be that hand distant thunder rolls man falls to his knees a phantom procession appears being behold man a line of birds beasts and creeping things goes by the eagle controls the dove the wolf oppresses the sheep and the snake lords it over the frog but he who rides at the head of the procession on a horse clad in mail and armed with bow and arrow looks like a man being he leads the whole procession man he's their conqueror being and the most pitiful of all pitiful things man ah he's clapped spur to his horse and all have broken into a charge boisterous music is heard just like a tempest where can they be going so rapidly being to destruction to that place where go all who know me not man oh the procession passes on the stormy music gradually calms down and changes into a quiet dream tune a new vision appears being behold man it's a young man and woman isn't it he embraces her with his strong arms and she buries her face on his breast her black hair quivers on her pearly shoulders she must be intoxicated with sweet delight being look well man looking intently ah she's crying he talks to her and sighs he looks lonely being they're beginning to know that happiness breaks man aren't they calling you being they've begun to think of me but they naturally shrink from calling me they're deceiving themselves man the man tries to take her in his arms again but this time she resists and gets away and she's cursing him he seizes her he pulls her by main force to the edge of the cliff ah oh, look out he cries ah being it's the mistaken fall of those who see me not directly the music stops and the vision vanishes man i acknowledge you i look straight at you i'm importunate to see your real nature being with the intelligence of a little monkey eh with an intelligence that goes round surfaces but can't possibly go to the heart of things man 
I acknowledge your power, your power of destruction. Why do you destroy things? Being. To temper the unbreakable and imperishable. Man. I seek such imperishable things. Ever since meeting you, I've been looking for something you can't break. Being. Have you found it? Man. Not yet. You've broken everything I thought permanent. Desire of conquest, friendship, love, learning. Being. It's my work to destroy all things that deserve destruction. A pause. Man, I found what looks to be permanent. This time there's no mistake. Being. What? Man. My child. Though I grow weak and die, my child lives on with new strength. I breathe my desires into his soul. Being. You don't know yet, I see. Man. What? Being. Your son is dead. Man. What? Grows sickly pale. Is such a thing possible? Being. The bad news will be here shortly. Man. It was only this morning a letter came saying he was studying in good health. Being. He died just after noon. Man. It's a lie. The being preserves silence. Man. Staring. Ah. Oh. There's truth in your attitude. Hopelessly. It's all over. Being. Goodbye. Man. Excited. Wait. My son was concealing some illness, wasn't he? Thinking not to worry his poor father. Being. He was the liveliest of all his class. Man. Did he fight a duel? To strike down some discourteous insulter? For he prized his good name. Being. No. Man. Then how did he die? being he fell from a chimney man becomes like one struck dumb being up to within two minutes before he was talking merrily with his friends on a sunlit lawn then one of them upon a sudden impulse said won't somebody show us how to climb that chimney your son also in caprice and thinking in his lovable and humorous heart to give his friends a laugh said gaily i'll give her a try and began to climb the rest praised his nimbleness but the spike step at the very top was rotten. Man. Oh. Being. Men said the degenerate chimney sweep who came later in the afternoon was a lucky man. Man. Groaning. It's art. The permanent thing is art. I'll mix my colors with my tears. I'll paint into my canvas that which can't be broken. Being. When it comes to that, I say not whether it be permanent or not. But you don't forget your illness, do you? man not for a moment when you took my health from me my misfortunes began and i first knew you then since that time how i've suffered being if your temperature goes up two degrees you'll have to throw away your brush man oh being do you think that impossible even now don't you have fever every day man it's prayer the permanent thing is prayer though i can't move in my bed i can close my eyes and pray being if a single blow disturbs the balance of your head you'll talk silly nonsense with the mouth that has prayed till now and with the hands so admirably folded till now you'll do filthy things before the eyes of the world like a monkey in a zoo man staggering such things are impossible being they're possible for example recently your fellows have been killing each other by the millions and there's no telling how many such idiots have come of it man you're too cruel being simply according to your deserts the cry of living things birds and beasts without number arises man afraid that cry being it's the curse of the creatures you've killed man ah he presses his head in his hands being you're a thing born of adultery though you hide it under the name of love man leave off the numbering of my sins being for they're numberless man i couldn't live without eating these and i'm so made that i can't reproduce without adultery being that's the lot of mortals man pleadingly pity the sufferings of man being compassion's not my business man why not ah oh, why not being it's to punish the earth trembles furiously man falls to the ground the being vanishes the stage is pitch dark the noise of a tempest arises 
then the tumult gradually dies down the stage becomes dimly lighted a pale blue sky is seen in the distance and man's body is visible stretched out like a corpse soft music plays cherubim appear above and sing cherubim blessed be all creatures on earth joy be to the immortals dear children the cherubim vanish man standing up and raising his face to heaven far far away is the blue of the sky a vague longing pulls me thither i have the sweet feeling of being drawn in i begin to be sure that this world must be good i can no longer doubt the existence of permanent things i'm surely controlled by some power but i'm satisfied that i'm controlled with kindness as if the acceptance of it is happiness itself i go takes two or three steps forward to yonder sky till my soul be lifted up curtain end of induction recording by expatriate in bangor maine Act One, Scene One of *The Priest and His Disciples* by Karata Hyakuzo, translated by Glenn William Shaw, eighteen eighty six to nineteen sixty one. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Act One, Scene One. Persons in the Act: Hino Saemon, aged forty; Okana, his wife, aged thirty six matsuwaka his son after taking the tonsure called yuien aged eleven shinran aged sixty one jien shinran's disciple aged sixty ryokan shinran's disciple aged twenty seven scene one the house of hino saemon a hearth is cut into the middle of the floor of the room a spear hangs on the moulding and on the wall a gun a rush hat a straw raincoat and such things toward the right of the stage stands a gate outside a small open space connects with a path snow is piled deep showing a depression only where the path runs okane sewing on a garment beside the hearth at last i've got this much done i ought to finish in four or five days anyway if i don't get it done in a hurry new year's will be here matsuwaka will be twelve next year i wish he'd grow up quickly i really feel like i'd like to stretch him out pauses which reminds me i wonder why saemon dono has become so violent of late he seems to be getting worse and worse though he was no such man back in our native place really i'm anxious about the future from outside comes the noise of the storm blowing by today he went to kichisuke dono's in a fit of anger but i hope no trouble comes of it stands up opens the door and looks out at the sky oh it's cold shivers it's snowing again closes the door and comes to the hearth stirs the fire with the poker and holds out her hands to the heat how late matsuwaka is to-day when in this cold he ought to come back quickly looks about her it's dark already stands up takes a paper lamp out of a closet and lights it offers a taper at the family shrine and prays with folded hands enter matsuwaka his colour is bad he is dressed in clothes that make him look puffy he opens the house door matsuwaka mother i'm back throws down a bundle in a cloth wrapper and his copy-book oh it's cold it's cold blows his breath on his fingers okane oh you're back you must be cold come warm yourself today you're very late aren't you matsuwaka going up to the hearth there was a party at the teacher's all of us were invited that's why i'm late okane was there that's fine did you eat nicely matsuwaka yes i got the mark of the pine on my clean copy okane did you that's fine let's see your copy-book the time before you got the bamboo mark didn't you takes the copy-book from matsuwaka and opens it i see it's he who touches cinnabar gets red isn't it you've become much surer haven't you it would be still better if you arranged your characters a little more carefully this is the result of studying hard pats matsuwaka's head matsuwaka kichisuke san's boy kichiya got the plum mark okane because he's mischievous and idle pauses here just stand up a minute matsuwaka stands up 
she takes the length of his kimono with a stick three and a half inches then i must make the tuck narrow your kimono you see it'll look fine on you on new year's day you'll put it on and go call on the teacher matsuwaka when's new year's okane sleep ten more nights and it'll be here matsuwaka where's father okane father's gone to kichisuke's he'll be back any minute now matsuwaka kichisuke's kichiya teases me today again as we were coming back from our lessons they all said bad things about me okane what said bad things and teased you really matsuwaka he called father a bad man because although he's an outsider he abuses the peasants and he kills living things okane good gracious looked sad did he say that matsuwaka yes kichiya said since my father abused his father he'd abuse me and he threw snow at me okane he's a bad boy it's all right i'll tell the teacher matsuwaka no once when i told he abused me worse than before on the way home regretfully who pushed me off the roadside into a wet rice field okane gracious does he do such terrible things don't worry i'll soon fix things right for you matsuwaka all right nods his head okane getting a plate of dried persimmons from a closet come help yourself to these there's some i dried in the autumn i'm going to the kitchen for a moment goes out the back door matsuwaka eats the persimmons then he looks around him goes up in front of the household shrine and stands gazing wonderingly at the image of buddha then he sits down and touches his hands together in momentary worship then searching for a book on the table he comes to the fireside with a volume of pictures and looks at it turning the pages curiously enter okane wiping her hands on her apron okane they're good aren't they pauses what are you looking at matsuwaka yes they're good gazes intently at the picture book okane i'll sew a little while we wait brings the unfinished garment to the hearth and plies her needle both are silent for a moment matsuwaka mother what's this picture okane stopping her needle let me see looks closely at the picture it's a picture of the death of the buddha called oshaka sama goes on sewing matsuwaka is it many priests in robes are weeping beside him aren't they okane they're all his disciples they cry because their great teacher is dead matsuwaka hmm there are monkeys and snakes aren't there and doves too they're all weeping aren't they why's that okane oshaka sama was a very merciful man and loved even the beasts so they're weeping because he who loved them is dead matsuwaka hmm thinks enter saemon wearing a hunting suit he carries a gun on his shoulder and two or three birds at his belt saemon i'm back it's frightfully cold okane welcome home we've been waiting for you you must be cold is it snowing goes to the door to meet him saemon it's a big snow at this rate the roads will be blocked up brushes off the snow matsuwaka father welcome puts his hands down on the mats and bows his head saemon hm pats his head today there was a feast at the teacher's wasn't there matsuwaka yes you know well don't you saemon i heard about it from the boy kichiya at kichiska's house okane how did your talk come out hangs the gun on the wall and puts away the game saemon not well at all today i've had a hard time of it wandering hither and thither in the hills from early morning i finally bagged three nondescript birds then i called it kichisuke's but that rascal's a sly fellow when i talked strong he sobbed and wept tears and tried to beg me off yet if i should be tender he would treat me harshly it's absolutely impossible to manage the farmers in this neighbourhood changes his clothes and comes to the fire okane then how did it come out saemon i scolded him and assured him that if he didn't pay by new year's he might be sure i'd take whatever measures i thought best then he turned deadly pale his wife clung to me making excuses and even kichiya burst into tears alongside okane gracious isn't it pitiful please wait a little before you do anything for they must surely be in trouble too saemon there's no telling i hate that kichisuke cordially 
though he has some scheme up his sleeve he flatters this very spring he encroached upon our rice fields as if by accident okane of course kichisuke is bad but this too is because of his great troubles saemon when it comes to trouble aren't we in trouble ourselves ever since we moved here one piece of bad luck has followed another the rice fields we bought with our scant savings were flooded matsuwaka got sick and it's been no easy life i can tell you if i'm kind i get nothing settled it's not only kichisuke the farmers about here are all the same i sometimes feel desperate i hate all the people in the world okane but please let them celebrate this new year safely anyway if you treat him harshly and gain his enmity you'll not be able to sleep for remorse don't they say that he who's beaten sleeps but he who beats cannot pauses come please eat your supper goes out at the back door saemon matsuwaka what have you been looking at all the time matsuwaka it's mother's picture book it was on the stand in the shrine there are lots of pictures in it there are pictures of palaces and temples and goblins pulling fire cars and saemon ah it's that guide to hell and paradise matsuwaka i know about hell and paradise men who've done good go to paradise when they die and men who've done bad go to hell but is that true saemon it's all a lie these things are said as a warning thinking if it is true there's probably nothing but hell laughs matsuwaka here's a picture in which children are piling up many stones by a river and goblins are knocking them down with iron clubs but what is it saemon looking gloomy it's a sino kawara where children go when they die matsuwaka when i die shall i go to sino kawara saemon it's all a lie it's a made-up story looks into matsuwaka's face stop looking at that book matsuwaka somehow it interests me saemon no that's no book for a child to be looking at takes a picture book away from matsuwaka you're cold so go to bed now you mustn't catch cold again matsuwaka i'm not sleepy yet enter okane she places a box tray with a sake bottle on it before saemon okane i'm sorry i've kept you waiting you must be hungry now please eat takes up the bottle saemon holding out a cup to have it filled and drinking okane it wasn't my original nature to be cruel from childhood i've been so timid that my heart throbs when i see others quarrel but after i was forsaken like that by my master and came to this place a roving samurai i became sick and tired in the knowledge of the evil in men's hearts men are all bad the trustful are betrayed the good are made fools of and can't possibly get on i feel like laughing scornfully this is what i think my weak nature makes me tender-hearted i must overcome it i must make my heart strong to bear cruel things i'm trying to accustom myself to my own cruelty okane gracious is it possible that any man would do such a thing strive to make his heart bad instead of good saemon drinking and drinking and talking i intend to become a bad man i want to strip the hide off the faces of the rascals who go round looking innocent they all do nothing but lie i even i sometimes try to work it out but i think there are only two things to do in this world either to die or to turn thief if i want to live i must eat if i want to eat without competing with men there's no way but to turn beggar if every one in the world was gifted with understanding the beggar's way of living would be the most pleasant but it's the hardest of things to live on scraps got from abominable men who throw them to you as if to a dog and look upon you with pitying eyes and all the men in the world are that sort if begging's impossible how much better must it be to take what one wants by force if i must fight anyhow rather than look benevolent or believe myself benevolent or wear the mask of hypocrisy i'd go forth proclaiming myself a bad man or else should i beg or if i be too proud should i die but i have no desire to die yet then i must be strong but i'm weak-spirited i must drill myself to be strong Today at Kichisuke's, when his wife cried, I began to feel dizzy. Scolding myself and determined that I must be strong, I thundered at them. If it was a case of matching badness, I felt that I could go to any degree. Drinks. Okane. My, I'm surprised that you can lump everything in such a general way. Please stop talking like that before Matsuwaka. Isn't this the same thing as a father teaching his own son to be a thief? 
You're by no means the type of man to be a criminal. For you're gentle at heart. Isn't that a good nature? Saemon. No, I don't want to think of myself as good-natured. If I'm good, why don't I turn beggar? No, why don't I die? It's all a fake. Don't you understand what I say? Gradually grows violent. Okane. I understand how you feel, but... Saemon. I'm too weak. That's why we've got poor since coming here. I'm taken for the fizzle of a samurai who doesn't understand affairs, and I'm given business that's known to be worthless, and my fields are encroached upon, and money I've loaned isn't returned. Soon I'll have to beg in spite of myself. The three of us will have to stand in front of detestable men's gates begging for pity. I love you and Matsuaka. If we don't become strong before long, our end is sure. Anyway, it's no good being weak. Gulps down Saka. Okane in troubled tones. Please stop. The Saka, you're gradually getting violent, you see. I'm really worried. And you're getting a bad name in the neighborhood. Today again, listen. Lowering her voice. Matsuwaka tells me that Kichiya urged on the other children and abused him. That, husband, is all the reward of your violence. Sayamon, why do you blame it on me? Okane, he said, your father's a taker of life and an abuser of peasants. Because he abuses my father, I'll abuse you. And he threw snow at him and pushed him down off the road. Sayamon, did he do that? He's a scoundrel. Tell the teacher. Okane, he says if I do, they'll treat him worse on the way home. Sayamon angrily. That little devil, Kichiya. All right, if he's up to such tricks, I know what to do. Tomorrow I go to Kichisuke's again and give it to him hot. Okane. Such rough treatment, on the contrary, will not be for Matsuaka's good. It would be better for you to turn gentle and be kind to the peasants. Wouldn't it be best for you to be reasonable and act according to your original nature? Sayamon. If I did, this house would go to ruin before our eyes. In this world, men are not made so that they'll repay gentleness with honesty. If you mean to be gentle to the end, there's no way, as I've said, but to resign yourself to standing before detestable fellows' gates. Are you ready for that? I wasn't born with a nature skillful at getting along in the world. Unless I harden it, I can't make a living. I can't keep my wife and child and ward off other shame. Gets excited. I must make myself stronger to bear evil. Thank heaven, I seem gradually to be getting worse. Long ago, if men spoke ill of me, it troubled me and I couldn't sleep. Now, though they talk, I'm indifferent. No, it even makes me feel good. I've grown strong, I tell myself. At first, even when I shot a bird or a beast, or even when I killed a chicken, I hated it thoroughly, but now it's nothing. Drinks. Okane. I've been wanting to talk to you. For heaven's sake, give up hunting. I hate killing from the bottom of my heart. We don't need to hunt to eat. Saemon. At first I found it unpleasant, but now it's so much fun I can't give it up. There's a bird on the branch of yonder tree. That's mine already, I think, and I feel a triumphant joy. It lives or dies as I wish, you see. When the thing comes fluttering down and I pick it up, the blood's on its feathers and it's still warm. And sometimes when I hit one in the wing, it comes flapping down still alive. Then I don't let it suffer long, but twist its neck and put it out of its misery. Okane, I've heard enough of such talk, so please stop. How my mother loathed the taking of life when she lived. She was so deeply pious, you know. Perhaps because of her teaching, I hate it with all my heart. There's nothing I dislike so much as the cry of the chickens when you kill them in the yard. And, glancing at Matsuaka, and somehow I feel that Matsuaka's grown weak like that since you began to kill. Saemon, is such tomfoolery possible? I'm tired of your superstition. Okane, and you have no faith. Please just give thanks at least just in the morning and evening, won't you? If I neglect my prayers just once, I feel awfully bad. I really worry about my future. It's not unnatural when you act so that good fortune's kept from coming round. Saemon, it's no use praying to Buddha. It bores me to sit looking at the face of his image. Pauses. Tonight I feel queer and can't get drunk at all. It's because you talk nothing but gloom. I've got to get drunker. Drinks two or three cups, one after another. Okane, please stop that reckless drinking. Looks with worried eyes at Saemon and is quiet for a moment. I'm truly discouraged. The roar of the storm passes outside the door. It's a dreadful snow, isn't it? Saemon sits helping himself and tippling. Okane is buried in thought. Matsuwaka looks at his book. 
Shinran, Jien, and Ryokan enter right. They are dressed in black robes, carry boxes on their backs, wear straw sandals on their feet, and walk with staves. The snow is heaped up on their big rush hats. Jien. It's turned into a terrible snow, hasn't it? Ryokan. It seems to be getting fiercer and fiercer. Jien. Master, you seem to be very tired. Ryokan. The sleeve of your robe soaked and grown cold as ice. Shinran. It's some time since the sunset, isn't it? Jien. The road's all blocked with snow. Ryokan. I have no strength to walk farther. Shinran. Then shan't we get somebody to keep us hereabouts? Jien. Let's ask a night's lodging at this house. Ryokan. There's no other to be seen, is there? Goes to the gate and knocks. Hello, hello. Matsuwaka listening. Father, someone's knocking at the gate. Okane. It's the sound of the wind. Saemon. For nobody would go out in this storm, you see. Matsuwaka. No, surely somebody's knocking at the gate. Ryokan knocking loud. Hello, hello, I beg of you, I beg of you. Okane listening. Sure enough, someone's knocking at the gate. It sounds like some man's voice. Goes down into the yard and opens the gate. Who is it? Sees the three priests. Is there something? Matsuwaka stands gazing curiously from behind his mother. Ryokan. We're traveling priests and distressed in this snowstorm. I'm really very sorry to trouble you, but may we not beg a place to stay for the night? Okane. You must be sorely troubled. If you'll go on some ten cho farther, there's an inn. Jien. Um, uh, we're walking about as mendicants and have no money. Ryokan. Any place at all will do, just so we can sleep. Okane. I see. Looks intently at the three priests. Then I'll just ask my husband. It's cold there. Please come in and warm yourselves. Saemon. Okane, what is it? Okane. It's some traveling priests. There are three. They're in trouble because of the snow and want to know if we won't keep them just one night. They have no money and can't stay at an inn. The three priests come in and stand in the yard. Saemon making an unpleasant face. I'm sorry, but we won't, I guess. Okane. But they're in trouble, so hadn't we better keep them? Saemon. No, we can't. Okane. Husband, isn't it all right? There'll be no trouble, and aren't they priests? Saemon. That's enough, speaks roughly. We can't keep them because they are priests. I abominate priests. I hate them more than anything in the world. Okane. Don't say such impolite things. In an undertone to Jien. He's drunk on sake. Please don't be offended. Jien to Saemon. Anywhere will do. Can't you put us up just for tonight? Saemon. I can't. Ryokan. The edge of the veranda will do. Saemon. You're persistent knaves, aren't you? Jien. Master, what shall we do? Shinran. I'll try asking once more. To Saemon. It's a nuisance, but since we're in distress, can't you take thought for your karma relations and take us in for just one night? Saemon. You're the superior, aren't you? Sneering. Indeed, you put on a gracious face. But unfortunately, I don't like priests. They don't appeal to me. Shinran. I see that you don't like us, but please take us in out of pity. Saemon. Pity you? No, thank you. You're the most enviable man in the world. In this life, you're respected by everybody, and when you die, you'll go to paradise, won't you? They say you do nothing but good, don't they? I do nothing but evil, do I? We're simply not of the same stripe at all. Shinran. Nay, it's I that do nothing but evil. Saemon, not listening to Shinran. The sermons you preach are precious things, aren't they? Thanks to you, bad men will disappear from the world. You teach that men can dispel their sins by alms and masses, and they all rejoice and come to you bringing rice and coin. Your temples flourish. You can sit down and live at ease. It's a gracious doctrine that if a man does good, he can go to paradise. But unfortunately, this world's so contrived that you can't do good in it. Everybody will go to paradise, I tell you. Laughs. Shinran. What you say is true. Saemon. You're a wonderful bunch. You can read a lot of difficult sutras, and you do what's written in those sutras. You don't kill anything, you don't eat meat, and you don't have wives. You're just like living Buddhas. You don't curse men in your hearts, 
and you don't feel carnal passion at the sight of a woman no you don't even dream foul dreams that's splendid isn't it to have such remarkable men stay at the house of a vile one like me would be overwhelming shinran extraordinary i'm positively no such pure man as you say saemon i took life once more this morning and after that i had a quarrel and then i drank sake now i've just called you okane saemon dono have you no self-restraint isn't this painful to the ears of those who stand by and hear blushes to shinran good priest bear with him please to saemon husband if you must refuse wouldn't it be better not to be foul-mouthed and sarcastic like that but to simply say so and refuse quietly saemon for which reason didn't i refuse from the first since i hate priests i can't keep them Gn. then it doesn't matter if you don't keep us two please keep just the superior for he's very tired ryokan as you see he's shivering with the cold Gn. if the storm but lets up we'll start on early tomorrow morning ryokan think of this request for a night's lodging as some fate saemon if i say i can't i can't the tempest is noisy outside Gn. i don't care about myself only the superior his eyes fill with tears saemon unfortunately i hate him worst of all he who teaches men lies is supremely detestable tell you about me i'm a bad man but i know it shinran you've hit on a good idea you feel much as i do saemon laughing there's a nice chance that we're alike ryokan then can't we stay saemon you can't Gn. then we'll swallow our lot please just let us dry our robes at the hearth they're soaked and cold as ice okane yes yes please come and dry them i'll put on charcoal at once and make up a good fire for you starts toward the hearth saemon stopping her none of your meddling his voice becomes gruff what persistent rascals you are don't you understand after all i've been saying to you get a little huffy you hypocrites you brazen-faced okane saemon dono saemon dono saemon to shinran hurry up and get out you begging shaveling pushes him Gn. this is too much the ill-mannered ryokan you put your hand on the superior didn't you saemon hurry and get out shoves ryokan ryokan what grasps his staff saemon do you mean to strike takes shinran's staff and brandishes it shinran ryokan violence won't do steps between the two saemon strikes him the staff falls on his box Gn. master please come out quickly obstructs saemon matsuwaka father father bewildered okane turning pale saemon dono saemon dono grabs saemon in her arms from behind and holds him saemon let go i'll beat them shinran Gn, and ryokan go outside the gate saemon throws the staff after them it falls on the snow matsuwaka father father clings to saemon crying okane running out and stroking shinran nervously it must have hurt forgive him what shall i do aren't you bruised shinran it's nothing when one goes about as a mendicant this sort of thing happens to one now and then okane please don't curse my husband weeps though he's an evil man please forgive him shinran don't be troubled rather i think him a sincere man Gn. he's too cruel i think ryokan tearfully master i'm utterly discouraged curtain end of act one scene one recording by expatriate in bangor maine Act One, Scene Two, Part One of the Priest and His Disciples by Kurata Hyakuzo, translated by Glenn William Shaw, eighteen eighty six to nineteen sixty one. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Act One, Scene Two, Part One. The stage is the same as in Scene One, Night, in the house saemon okane and matsuwaka 
lie asleep in a room outside shinran is sleeping with his head on a rock for a pillow ryokan and jien sit on the snow talking jien it's grown late hasn't it ryokan the wind's gone down but it's turned colder jien i feel as if my toes have fallen off my feet a pause is the superior asleep ryokan till a moment ago he was repeating the prayer to amida but he seems to have dropped off with fatigue jien he's sleeping calmly isn't he ryokan look at the nobleness of his sleeping face jien a living buddha must be like the superior i think ryokan my love for him hurts shields shinran's face with his robe against the falling snow jien this is no simple hardship is it ryokan i'm young so it's all right for me but it must be hard on you and the superior i only hope it won't injure you such as shinran's body he's just as cold as ice jien the people in the house are probably sleeping warm beside the hearth aren't they ryokan the man's too cruel isn't he though he's drunk jien it seems he might have loaned us the edge of his veranda ryokan though i've been on pilgrimages i've never met with such treatment as this before jien that he should strike the superior ryokan only then did i get angry and find it hard to bear if the superior hadn't stopped me i meant to beat him to a pulp jien that hand will surely wither pauses i admire his powers of endurance for a long time i went on pilgrimage with him through the deep snows of the mountain roads of the echigo country and there we underwent all sorts of hardships at times we were all but starving and at times we were attacked by robbers in the mountains and when we crossed the dangerous cliffs of oyashirazu and koshirazu he cut his feet on the sharp corners of the rocks and his toed socks were soaked red with blood ryokan for he probably never used straw sandals when he was in kyoto did he jien he always rode in a palanquin a big retinue of disciples accompanied him since the day he incurred the displeasure of the government and was exiled his sufferings have been beyond the power of words to express ryokan you've been with him constantly since that time haven't you jien i shall follow him till i die when i consider the love i've received from him since then i can't think of leaving him no matter what pain i suffer ryokan you're right pauses the priests of mount hiei and nara are detestable to me why did they bring false charges evilly against such a noble saint and he bore even the disorders of kyoto in those days jien the thought of those times is unbearable his greatest disciples were either beheaded or sent into exile how many who loved each other dearly must have been separated even yet i can't forget the leave-taking of the superior in honen sama ryokan how they must have lamented jien for they loved each other so dearly when the superior went to honen sama's retreat at komatsudani to bid him farewell he found him sitting before a writing desk repeating the invocation to amida he lifted up his voice and wept for he knew that in any case far from each other in tosa and echigo they would never meet again and besides honen shonin was an old man nearly eighty ryokan what did honen sama say his eyes fill with tears jien he said shinran don't cry let's part repeating amida's prayer we're sure to meet in the pure land we'll both be beautiful buddhas then namu amida butsu ryokan was that the last they ever saw of each other jien it was the unforgettable sixteenth day of the third month of the first year of shogen twelve o seven when kyoto was just at the height of its glory of blossoms they left on the same day honen sama for tosa and the superior for the north country ryokan what's honen sama doing now i wonder jien he's dead the news came when we were on pilgrimage in the province of kozuka the superior fell in the road and wept ryokan then they had truly parted for life hadn't they jien yes wipes his tears with the sleeve of his robe both are silent for a moment 
Ryokan. Daylight is still far off, isn't it? Jien. It's only a little past midnight. Ryokan. It's so cold, it doesn't seem we'll be able to sleep at all. Jien. But if we don't sleep a little, we'll be tired out by tomorrow's journey. Ryokan. Then shall we try to get a wink? Both lie down and close their eyes. Saemon, groaning. Oh, oh. Okane, sitting up. Saemon dono, Saemon dono. She shakes Saemon awake. Saemon opening his eyes. Ah, was it a dream? Sits stupidly looking about him. Okane, you groan frightfully. Saemon, oh, I dreamed a frightful dream. Okane, unable to sleep a wink, I lay drowsing when suddenly you gave a strange cry and groaned and i was startled saemon hm thinks okane i was frightened your face was terrible when you opened your eyes and looked at me saemon rather than terrible it was a weird and evil dream it went to the bottom of my soul with a serious face saemon sits following out the thread of his dream okane what sort of dream please tell me I'm worried about something myself. Saemon sitting on the bed. I dreamed I was killing a chicken. It was in the cool shade of a bamboo grove. With one foot on a big log that had been rolled there, I held the bird's two wings and head together with one hand and was plucking its feathers one at a time from its tail and breast with the other. The chicken seemed to be in pain, for every time I pulled out a feather, it drew up its feet and strained hard with its head but since its neck was twisted round it couldn't cry soon its yellow and spotted body was stripped bare from tail to breast that featherless body made me feel cynical and cruel okane gracious it's horrible you're always killing chickens that's why you dream such dreams saemon then i had to pick the wings i seized one wing and one leg and pushing the chicken down on the ground pulled with might and main the wing feathers were big and like little bones you see so they wouldn't come out with ordinary pulling every time i pulled one out the bird cried pitifully okane there's nothing hurts me so much as that cry for it seems that you might pick them after you've killed them saemon then the feathers come out hard and worst of all the meat loses its flavor when i heard that cry in my dream i somehow felt cruelly happy so i let the head loose and began to pick the feathers out slowly one by one then you came running okane dear it's terrible was i in it too saemon yes you said for heaven's sake stop making it cry so i twisted its neck round and round i felt just as if i were wringing a towel then pressing its head down against its back squeezing its abdomen with one hand and standing with legs wide apart i held it firm for a moment for the chicken would have breathed spitefully through the other end when i thought it was dead the thing which with its feathers out no longer looked like a chicken ran away six or seven feet okane stop please it's truly terrible saemon what happened next was ghastly excited i seized the chicken and thinking this time to cut its head off got a big knife and holding the bird to the ground with my foot was about to strike the chicken looked up at me with strange eyes and it cried continually in a feeble and accusing voice then in the dream i suddenly became that chicken myself terrified i cried out at the top of my voice the chicken killer stood looking coldly down into my face growing too weak to scream i raised a pitiful pleading voice then i felt somehow that this same thing had happened once before hello thought i isn't that a voice i've heard before then a scene long forgotten came with surprising clearness into the memory of that chicken which was i for away back in the past in the life before this i once had killed a woman traveller in the midst of the mountains i bared my dirk and rushed upon her she cried in a pleading voice what i now remembered was that cry now thought i retribution for that has come the knife of the butcher was about to fall but fell not then i groaned and opened my eyes okane what a weird and terrible dream shivers saemon it was frightful when i remembered the scene of my evil day in the former world it was sickeningly clear 
ah i felt this is hell when i think of it even now it sends a chill to the bottom of my soul his face is pale okane tonight i somehow feel queer i haven't been able to sleep a bit since coming to bed and i've been troubled by all sorts of thoughts in fact i've been thinking about my dead mother it's a strange thing to tell but listen i somehow feel that that priest who was here this evening is my mother reborn Simon what nonsense that's impossible okane my mother was deeply pious like that you know and a little before she died she said to me anyway this time i can't be saved when i die i shall be born again in the form of a priest please remember this well for i shall come to your door as a pilgrim she said it seriously since then i haven't been able to treat mendicant priests badly i think of her words you see matsuwaka opening his eyes is it time to get up okane no it's still night don't get up for it's cold puts a wadded quilt over him matsuwaka is it goes to sleep again the two sit in silence the wind is heard passing outside Simon, i wonder what became of the priests this evening okane they're probably lost in the snow Simon, i feel bad about it i was drunk with sake you see i was a little too cruel thinks okane you struck the priest with his staff didn't you Simon, i did wrong okane as i looked on this evening i didn't think you did well it wasn't only your roughness you see it was your sarcasm your insinuation and your crabbed coolness those things you always detest Simon, i agree with you this evening i wasn't myself at all okane in addition that priest seemed to be a good man there was nothing affected about him and he maintained a humble attitude i liked him and wanted to give him a place to stay but you wouldn't listen to reason at all Simon, he seemed somewhat different from ordinary priests okane his address was noble and not the least abashed rather did i blush with shame to have you show off your manners before him Simon, i did very badly didn't i okane and he found interest in what you said and listened attentively rather he listened with an expression of loving good will Simon, i wasn't unaware of that myself okane you were truly pathetic he was not put out by your sarcasm but rather seemed to be looking at you with compassionate eyes Simon blushing even to such words i can but listen okane his disciples begged earnestly saying that they could sleep outside the house only they didn't want their master to get cold but you maintained a chilly attitude i pitied them Simon, i wonder why i was like that could i have had an evil spirit within me okane worst of all you struck him with his staff when you did that the old disciple wept when the young one got angry and grasped his staff the priest stopped him he wore an expression of authority Simon sits silently with folded arms okane i ran out and rubbing his shoulder unconsciously begged his forgiveness for he was so lovable Simon, what did he say then okane he said it was nothing when he went out on pilgrimages he often met with such things Simon, after that i wonder what he did surely he cursed me thinks won't you go and call him back i can't bear to think of that priest travelling in the snow cursing me with a curse that a lifetime can't dissolve okane no when i asked him not to curse my husband he said not to worry that he rather thought you a sincere man Simon, did he say that tearfully please bring him back again i can't rest unless i apologize okane is there any use searching for him at this snowy midnight hour without the least idea where to look Simon, i can't bear to part like this forever okane but it can't be helped Simon, may they not possibly be out by the gate yet okane do you think such a thing possible if they stood in such a place they'd freeze to death Simon, anyway since i can't rest go and look okane i'll go and look but it's no use lights a hand lamp goes down into the yard and opening the gate peers outside oh screams rushes out through the gate then hurries into the house again Simon dono please come please come quickly rushes out 
Sayamon follows with a tense and ashen face. Matsuwaka, wakened by his mother's voice, runs out after his father. The three priests open their eyes in surprise and stand up. Okane. My, are you here yet? In this snowstorm? In the middle of the night like this? My, what's this? You must be cold. Freezing cold. Sayamon to Shinran. I, 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 weeps. Please forgive me. Kneels down in the snow. Shinran is moved. He becomes a little nervous. Then, without a word, he strokes Sayamon's shoulder. Okane. He's a good man at heart. He's a good man at heart, you see. Jien, tearfully and in a low voice. Namu Amida Butsu. Namu Amida Butsu. Ryokan. Namu Amida Butsu. Namu Amida Butsu. All are under the influence of strange and strained emotions. They remain in silence for a moment. Okane. Please all come into the house. Warm yourselves at the hearth, please. You must be cold. In the middle of the night like this, with nothing but thin robes on. Really, please, come in. Brushes the snow from Shinran's robe. There's such a lot of snow on you. Goes in. Sayamon goes in after her. Shinran, Jien, and Ryokan go in silently, and brushing the snow off their robes at the gate, stand in the yard. Sayamon, stepping up into the front room. Please, come in. Okane, put on a lot of wood. Okane, putting on wood. Please come in. Please dry your robes beside the hearth. Shinran, to the disciples. Then let's go in. He takes off his straw sandals, steps up into the room, and goes to the fireside. Jien and Ryokan follow his example. Sayamon, this evening I behaved cruelly. I'd been drinking sake and was mad. Of late I'm always mad. I did wrong. I'm ashamed. I spoke sarcastically and sneered. Grows eager. That troubles me most. You must have thought me a despicable knave. And I can't help it if you did. I've always despised such things. But last night there was some strange power within me, and I was driven to act like that. I couldn't fight against that power. Shinran. That was the working of your karma. When men do evil, they're all forced to it by that power. None of them can fight against it. Pauses. I didn't think you despicable. Rather, I thought you sincere. Sayamon. Thank you. When I'd pronounced one curse, the next one mounted spontaneously to my lips. Until I'd reviled you to the full, I couldn't stop. After I'd sent you out, I began at once to regret it in my heart. But temporizing, I beguiled myself with drunkenness. This morning I was ridden by a fearful dream and woke. My drunkenness had already cooled away. I thought again of what I'd done in the evening, and my heart was filled with the pain of sharp regret and the desire to make amends. I wondered what I should do if things ended there without my begging forgiveness. It was then we found you freezing in the snow. Please forgive me. End of Act 1, Scene 2, Part 1 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Act One, Scene Two, Part Two of The Priest and His Disciples by Karata Hyakuzo. Translated by Glenn William Shaw, 1886 to 1961. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Act One, Scene Two, Part Two. Shinran, Buddha forgives you, I'm sure. That your heart may be at rest, I'll say that I forgive you too, if you've done me any wrong, but I've no desire to judge you. In the first place, I have no such worth. Last night, when I heard you speak for the first time, I understood the goodness of your heart at once. I faced you with a loving heart, but you wouldn't receive me. At that time, I felt resentment toward you. When I was driven out, my heart was angered. If it hadn't been for your wife's intercession, I might have cursed you. I promised her positively that I wouldn't. But as the night grew late and the cold began to eat into my body, my heart began to hate you. I didn't say my prayers with the beautiful heart of a Buddha at all. First of all, I was about to be overcome by bodily anguish. And then I had to fight against my desire to curse you. My heart was held captive by sin and pain. Simon, 
Your words are different from those of the priests I've heard before. You talk as if you're a bad man yourself. Shinran. I'm convinced I am a bad man. It's true. I'm all but an irredeemable sinner. My heart would curse another child of Buddha like myself. My flesh would eat another child of Buddha like myself. If I'm not a bad man, what am I? Jien. The master always talks like this. Okane. Saemon Dono always talks that way too. Shinran to Saemon. You've put your mind on a good thing. Your idea's right. Saemon. Then aren't you troubled? When I think, I become desperate. I have a heart that loves good. But I can't live without working evil. And I can't help thinking of that evil. This is fearful, I think to myself. I feel the unreasonableness of it. Because there's nothing else for it, I sometimes feel like telling myself to go ahead and be bad. Okane. Saemon Dono says he'll harden himself into a strong man who can bear evil and is going to accustom himself to cruelty deliberately. Yet he's always blaming his own heart. Thus goaded by pain, he gets desperate and turns to sake. He goes on getting rougher and rougher till I'm truly worried. Saemon. For if I absolutely must be bad, I hate to think of being insulted by other bad men, you see. And again, I don't want to think of myself good. I feel that I want to call myself a villain and go about desolating society. Pauses. Honest priest, teach me, please. Do paradise and hell really exist? Shinran. I believe they do. First of all, I feel that there's no reason why there shouldn't be a hell. When I've injured the life of another and haven't been able to wipe out that injury, I feel like crying out to somebody, please flog me, please punish me. I haven't been able to find any way to make compensation. And when I've done something cruel, I feel that it can't be left unpunished. This is the actual experience of my soul. Saemon, I felt that way a while ago. If I should have no opportunity to apologize to you, and things should end where they were, if you'd gone on your way never to take back your curse, I felt that surely the evil I'd done would go solemnly on forever unextinguished. And I always feel this whenever I kill a chicken. Can such things go unpunished? When I think how I struck you, I feel like saying, please beat me. Shinran, I think there must be a hell. And then at the same time, I think there must of necessity be a way of escape from that hell. I feel that if there isn't, this world must be a lie. I feel that this existence could not be. We're born, and this world exists. Then this world must be a harmonious whole. It must be possible for us to be saved somewhere. I feel that it must. When we repent and confess our sins, is there not in our feelings a sense of the existence of paradise somewhere? We're all sitting about the fire like this, talking intimately. Those who were fighting before are now mutually forgiving. Somehow I feel as if I want to cry. Don't you feel that there must be a paradise somewhere? Saemon, I feel that way too. But such feelings are soon upset. Whenever I run into a new happening, my mind immediately changes. And in my heart as before, hate and anger stand victors and I am filled wholly by a feeling which proves the existence of hell. Shinran, I am like that too. That's the true condition of man's heart. The human heart changes according to its stimulations. The wise men of old referred to that when they used the words fickle groundlings. Our hearts are as easily scattered as the leaves of a tree before the wind. Saemon, and the organization of this world compels us to sin. I tried hard to make a living as a good man but for that I was injured by the men of this world. Then I knew that I couldn't possibly make a living. It was either die or become a beggar. But I won't die. I love my wife and child. And I can't bear to stand before detestable men's gates begging for pity. There's no other way for me but to be a bad man. But I hate that too. My heart always blames me. Shinran. Your anguish is the anguish all men must bear. Only hypocrites are without it. Men, who, longing to be good, can bear to look honestly into their own hearts, verily suffer as you do. I consider your anguish noble. From the time I took to the priesthood at the age of nine, through long tens of years, I trained myself on Mount Hie and at Nara in an effort to make myself good. How I suffered, trying to cut the curse away from my heart. But my hope was not fulfilled. I knew that my fate would not allow that in this life. I lost hope. 
This is what I believe. Man can't make himself wholly good. He can't leave other lives entirely uninjured. He's made that sort of thing. Saemon. This is the first time I've ever heard that sort of talk from a priest like you. Then are all men bad? Are you too? Shinran. I'm the greatest of sinners. The more I meet my destiny, the better I understand the depth of my sin. To the extent that the appearance of good unrolls itself in my heart, my wickedness, which I haven't noticed before, becomes plain. Saemon. You said there was a hell. Shinran. I believe there is. Saemon looking serious. Then won't you have to descend into it? Shinran. If I'm like this, I shall. I don't think that unreasonable. Saemon. Aren't you afraid? Shinran. I am. Day and night I tremble with that fear. All my life I've not doubted the existence of hell. When I played with my friends as a child, we sang St. Mukren's mother, for her cross heart got the car of fire. I was unbearably afraid of that song. I've had this horror ever since then. How can I escape from hell? I've thought in agony. It would be all right if I did no evil. If I accumulated good, I was taught. I tried hard to do as I was told. Then I put myself through religious austerities with pain and hardship. I tortured myself sorely at that. Once in the time of snow, I went back and forth in pilgrimage between Mount Hiei and the Rokukudo, which is eight and three-quarters miles away, every night for a hundred nights in succession. But for every merit I accumulated, ten evils grew, just as it is in the Sai no Kawara, where no matter how many stones the children pile and pile, the devils come and knock them down. The wickedness twining about in my heart proved to me more and more clearly the existence of hell, and I lost all hope of escaping from that evil. I decided that in the end I must go to hell. Saemon, I'm terrified. As I listen to you, I can't doubt the existence of hell. A sharp and deep-rooted power in the depths of my soul presses upon me. My fate has spoilt me with the thought that there might be no hell. Today I was asked by my boy whether hell and paradise are true, and I said they were lies, made-up stories, but I lacked assurance. I added jokingly that there might be just a hell and laughed, but really I felt that there probably is, and was strangely uneasy. Having met and talked to you, I've lost all desire to be flippant. The deep wisdom of my soul's been summoned and awakened, and the fear of hell assaults me. Okane. I somehow feel very uncomfortable at the story of last night's dream. Saemon. As the noise of the tempest passes outside. Is there no way to escape that hell? Shinran. If it were necessary to become good to reach paradise, there would be no hope. But even in my wickedness, I can by another way get to paradise, I believe. That way is love. It's forgiveness. It's the power that makes it possible to go beyond good and bad. This world's supported by that power. It's deeper than the distinction between good and evil, but it also gives birth to good and evil. Up to this time, priests have taught that paradise is to be attained through good actions. I no longer believe that. If that's so, I go to hell. But the Buddha saves us in our evil. He forgives our sins. That's the love of Buddha. I believe in that. If I didn't, I couldn't live. Saemon with sparkling eyes. Though one take life, though one whore? Shinran. Though one commit the ten sins and the five disobediences. Ryokan. His compassion is uniform. Jien. Reliance on a power outside ourselves is the way of salvation opened up by our master. Saemon sits in silence with a pale and serious face. Then he begins to speak in a voice strained with a great emotion. Saemon. I have a strange feeling. I feel as if I've suddenly heard the voice of a great and mysterious bell. It resounded clearly away down into the bottom of my soul. I have an intimate and responsive feeling, as if that for which I've long waited has finally come. I'm full of thanks. I'm able to believe in that salvation at once. That's why. It's not a lie. It must be true. I've become aware of it. It's mine now, as if I'd known it before. It's wholly mine now. I feel thankful and as if I want to cry. Shinran. That's true. When I met Honen Shonin at Yoshimizu, that salvation entered into me all at once. I felt just as you do now. 
it was as if i'd recalled a thing forgotten it was truly a simple thing it seemed strange that everybody didn't understand this near at hand and simple fact look at the reality of our souls we love we forgive we pardon others faults then our hearts are most peaceful we do but evil we hate and curse but in the midst of the diverse workings of our soiled hearts we know love and we forgive we all know the thankfulness and tears of those moments the fundamental truth of our salvation is the same simple law that simple thing is resurrected again from the depths of our souls and it becomes faith Gn, you've tortured yourself sincerely for a long time you've examined your own heart faithfully the steps taken by your heart have been ample preparation for acceptance of faith in the saving grace of another ryokan when the necessity arises of that which went before giving place to that which is to follow then it's as easy to make the sure transition as for water to flow to lower levels shinran i believe your faith is firm saemon tonight i'm happy i feel as if the peace that's been absent from my soul for years has now come back his eyes become moist okane really that's true for a long long time now your richness and peace of heart have been gone shinran you said you were trying to accustom yourself to evil didn't you saemon my native spirit's too weak that making it hard for me to get along in the world i thought i must become a worse man okane so he began to hunt to kill chickens and to quarrel with the farmers shinran i sympathize with your feelings but that's unreasonable haven't you thought of the thing called karma though a man worked to make himself bad he can't get bad that way and again in the hands of his fate he'll commit the most heinous crimes please don't be unreasonable but follow obediently the true dictates of your heart since your nature's good you can't help it saemon then is it unreasonable to strive to be good shinran if a desire to be good wells in the heart it isn't unreasonable when i say obediently i mean to follow the true inwardness of the soul it's natural for man's soul to be good but obstructed by his accumulated karma he's not able to fulfill the soul's desires we're being punished we can't put off evil redemption means our salvation with the evil in us but i can never lose my desire to become good it's determined that i can never attain that desire on earth by repeating amida's prayer i believe i can satisfy that longing when i leave this world as spirit i mean to carry it with me till i die saemon won't it be impossible to make a living in the world shinran not to make a living is natural it's natural for a good man to be poor if you grow poor naturally since there's nothing else to do please grow poor man's able to live no matter how in the sutras it's written that idaten speeds about through the three worlds gathering food and raiment for the children of buddha and nourishing them oshaka sama too went about as a mendicant i also am walking as a pilgrim as you see but i've lived up to this day my son's living somehow too okane have you a son shinran yes i left him in kyoto i parted from him when he was six and haven't seen him since okane oh dear and his mother shinran we parted when i left kyoto and she died when i was in echigo okane and you weren't with her at the hour of death Gn. for the sake of the law the master incurred the displeasure of the authorities and was exiled when his wife died since he was in disfavor he couldn't go back she was only twenty-six when she died ryokan her name was tamahi and she was a beautiful woman after that his affliction was tremendous anyway for the son of a prince shinran don't speak of that okane tearfully surely you must long to see your son shinran yes at times i worry about him okane of course you do shinran to matsuwaka how old are you matsuwaka blushing eleven shinran you're a good boy pats his head saemon we're troubled because he's a little sickly shinran truly his color's a little bad isn't it they all remain silent for a moment shinran ryokan just look in my box a while ago when the staff struck there was a strange sound and possibly ryokan 
opens the box and looks in. Oh, the image of Amida's broken. Takes out a little figure of Amida Nyorai. Jien. The left hand's gone, isn't it? Saemon blanching. Show me. Looks fixedly at the little Buddha. Great tears roll down his cheeks. Shinran. Saemon dono, what's the matter? All look at Saemon. Saemon. I can't bear it. See the nobility of this little carved face. I broke this sacred image with the blow of a staff. This beautiful left hand. This hand so exquisitely carved down to each separate finger. I'm made suddenly aware of the coarseness of my soul. I've done an evil thing. The depth of my karma's fearful. I struck Shinran-sama. I reviled his disciples. And I crippled Buddha's image. I... I... He weeps. Shinran. Saemon dono, don't cry. The mercy of Buddha will forgive you, deep in sin as you are. I'll give you this image as a remembrance. When you see it, please think of the depth of your karma and believe in the Buddha who forgives his children heavily burdened with sin. And with the same heart, please love your neighbors. Pauses. Day will soon break. We must be going. We must be off on the morrow's journey. Ryokan, Jien, please make ready. Shinran stands up. Saemon, seizing the sleeve of Shinran's robe. Please wait. I'll become a priest. I'll go with you hereafter. Please lead me on forever. Shinran, moved. I know your heart. My tears flow. But give up your idea. The worship of the Jodo sect is family worship. It's the worship of the merchant as a merchant and the hunter as a hunter. Wherefore I too marry and eat flesh. I'm not a monk. A family man, I have the heart of a recluse. One mustn't be captured by forms. The heart's the important thing. Simon, But it's painful to part with you like this. I don't know whether we'll ever be able to meet again okane at least please stay with us four or five days shinran those who meet must part in the end that's the law of this world when your heart turns to me please recite namu amida butsu i dwell within that saemon then must you go positively shinran if fate permits i'll see you again okane where you go from here shinran i have no fixed destination Shinran, Jien, and Ryokan make themselves ready and go out. Day is beginning to break. Sayamon and Okane go to the gate. Matsuwaka, too, his hand in his mother's, goes out to see them off. Shinran, I parted like this with many, many people. In my heart are the faces of people I can never forget. Today I add you to that group. I shan't forget you. Though separated from you, I shall pray for you. Sayamon, and I shall never forget you all my life. I shall pray for you. Okane, please take good care of yourself. Her eyes fill with tears. Jien, days begun to break. Ryokan, and the snow seems to have stopped. Shinran, then sayonara. Sayamon, sayonara. Okane, sayonara. To Matsuwaka, come, say sayonara. Matsuwaka, uncle, sayonara shinran folding matsuwaka in the sleeve of his robe sayonara please grow up big and great jien sayonara ryokan sayonara exeunt shinran jien and ryokan saemon okane and matsuwaka watch them go with tearful eyes end of act one recording by expatriate in bangor maine Act Two, Part One of the Priest and His Disciples by Kurata Hyakuzo, translated by Glenn William Shaw, eighteen eighty six to nineteen sixty one. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Act Two, Part One. Persons in the Act: Shinran, age seventy five; Matsuaka, now called Yuien, age twenty five three priests six pilgrims a wife a maid two shop boys aged twelve or thirteen the priest's quarters at nishino doin a waiting room at the back of the main hall it is in a high building from which the streets of kyoto are visible there is a road immediately beneath people are passing 
it is an afternoon in autumn fifteen years later than the events in act one the three priests are talking together first priest we have yet a little leisure before the services haven't we second priest they'll begin shortly the main hall's already packed with worshippers third priest the prosperity of this sect is ever surprisingly great isn't it first priest many who can't squeeze into the hall have overflowed into the corridors no wonder for today's is the mass in honor of the so deeply reverenced honen shonin sama second priest it's well for during his lifetime was he not worshipped as the living buddha of kurodani when he was exiled to tosa from shichijo to toba all along the road traversed by his palanquin old and young men and women stood like walls and saw him off with weeping eyes third priest at that time i accompanied him as far as the south gate in toba from there he went by river boat his beloved form as he stepped from the palanquin into the boat garbed in a long robe of light blue silk with a ceremonial hat on his long white hair is still as vivid to me as if actually before my eyes first priest it's been twenty-three years since he passed away hasn't it how time flies that we're old's no wonder is it second priest both honen shonin sama and the superior suffered great hardships didn't they today's prosperity's due to their labors isn't it third priest if honen sama could see the power of the jodo sect today he'd surely be pleased wouldn't he second priest the superior himself's aged greatly hasn't he first priest isn't it likely that his present indisposition's serious second priest no it's nothing but a cold third priest being old he must take good care of himself first priest with yuien dono carefully looking after his needs all's well second priest despite his youth yuien dono's most faithfully attentive in all things third priest he's so gentle and mild-spirited isn't he first priest and the superior seems to love him exceedingly second priest he asked yuien dono to look after all his personal affairs enter yuien walks along the corridor toward the main hall speaks to the priests yuien excuse me please third priest yuien dono yuien yes stops first priest are you in a hurry yuien no not particularly i was just going into the main hall second priest then please come here a moment i have something i want to talk to you about third priest while we wait for the service to begin let's brew up some tea and talk yuien goes to the priest and sits down the third priest pours out tea and offers it to him first priest how's the superior yuien now he's asleep second priest i suppose there's no cause for anxiety in his condition is there yuien no he's practically all right now today he said he would get up and conduct the service as it's the important anniversary service for honen sama i persuaded him to give up the idea and take care of himself he already gets up and walks in the garden third priest that's good no harm must come to his body first priest for unlike ours his is precious isn't it second priest he's truly the pillar of our sect third priest after the death of honen shonin when the enemies of the law were many it was the great virtue of the superior that made it possible for him to shoulder the jodo sect and bring about today's prosperity first priest if worst should come to worst with the superior now our sect would fall into darkness second priest we and our countless followers would lose our good light and go astray third priest with his son zenran on whom we should have to depend such a man as he is first priest with the succession of the law in this sect lying in his person it's too bad that he should turn his back on his father second priest his disposition's exactly the opposite of his father's and most unruly third priest he's an unnatural child isn't he yuien i hope his father's displeasure will quickly melt away first priest no it seems to me natural while his conduct such as it is his father's displeasure should not melt if such a son receives the succession it'll injure the fame of our sect second priest i believe it'll prove an obstacle to our propaganda third priest already the world reproaches us 
saying that our philosophy sweeps away all idea of good. Yuien. Zenran-sama's a good man. He's no such man as you think. After I'd had a little talk with him, I liked him at once. What he's done, I don't know, but I can't think he's bad. First Priest. So you say, but Zenran-sama not only dissipates and conducts himself evilly, but he's opposed to the faith of the Jodo sect. Second Priest. If he's profligate, probably there's no way for him to get to paradise but through the Jodo faith. Third Priest. Then he doesn't give himself up to evil in the belief that he can be saved even if he be bad, it seems to me. First Priest. I was under the same illusion as you were, but we both seem to have been wrong. That's why I can't understand him. Second Priest. Then the superior's anger's not unreasonable, is it? Yuien. There's no telling how the superior's troubled in private about Zenran-sama. Third Priest. But if he goes on like this, there's not the least likelihood of his father's displeasure being dissipated, is there? Anyway, it's a long separation dating from way back in the Inada days. Yuien. It's said that Zenran will soon come up to the capital from Inada. First Priest. It isn't at all likely his father will see him. Yuien. I entreat you to intercede in his behalf and arrange a meeting for him. Second Priest. We seldom do such things. We would be scolded. Third priest. Unless he reforms, it would rather be to his disadvantage. Yuien. I'm grieved. All fall silent for a moment. First priest. Who preaches today? Second priest. It's my turn. Third priest. What do you intend to talk about? Second priest. About the ecstasy of the law, the joy of those who believe in the salvation of Buddha, the feeling of dancing exaltation mentioned in the sutras. I need not wealth, I want not fame. I have within me the delight of the law more joyous than these. For with that delight indeed have I lived up till now in black robes and poverty. First priest. It is true, verily. I feel no envy for the finery of others. For I believe that in my heart I wear invisible brocades. Second priest. Today I intend to say this. Do you all know the sweetness of this delight of the law? If not, though you've heaped up abundant wealth, I assure you that you're poor. Raises his eyebrows. Third priest. That's a courageous and strong declaration. Second priest. Young men and women, I shall say. Do you all know this sweetness of the joy of the law? If not, though you be intoxicated with glad love, you're pitiful folk, I assure you. Third priest. The young people will most likely prick up their ears, won't they? Second priest. Take everything from me, I shall say, riches, fame, love, but leave me this joy of the law alone. To have that taken away would be to me the same as death. First priest, I have a happy feeling, as if you're saying exactly what I wish to say. Third priest, I feel that way too, for without that joy we'd surely be in a sad plight, wouldn't we? There's no man so poor as a priest, is there? I too live by that delight. Second priest, I intend to say that this joy is the proof of our salvation. We found not our hope on this world of woe, but cling to expectations of the pure lotus land. Though we fall ill, we fear not death. Death to us isn't loss, but gain, for we go to live in the land of bliss. I shall speak of such things. Third priest. That's all true. It's the actual experience of all believers. First priest. Through the ages, the founders of temples have spent lives of poverty but their appearance of calmness and wealth has all been due to this feeling of exaltation in their hearts, I believe. Second priest. Yuien Dono, what are you pondering over? Third priest. You're most glum. First priest. Your color's bad, too. Aren't you sick? Yuien. No, only somehow my spirit's heavy. Third priest. When your spirits are low like this, try sitting down before Buddha and repeating the invocation. Your mind will become clear and serene. Yuien. Will it? First priest. It's good to recite the sutras in a loud voice. Second priest. For one thing, it's probably the fault of insufficient faith. Don't be offended. I speak because I'm an old man, you see. But if you've accepted the mercy of Buddha, you ought always to be happy. You must always be full of hope. Again, if you think of the hardships borne by Buddha through millions of eternities... Your heart must always overflow with thanks to him and compassionate love for all living things. I think lack of ecstasy is proof that faith hasn't yet been attained. Don't feel bad. 
Nay, in youth everybody's like that. First Priest. Hello, the bell's ringing for the service to begin. Second Priest. I must go to the hall. Third Priest. Then let's go together. Yuien dono? Yuien. I must wait on the superior. The three priests go out. Yuien remains silent for a moment. At last he puts the tea things in order, stands up, goes out into the corridor, leans against a pillar, and looks vacantly down on the road below. Enter a merchant's wife and her maid at the far end of the road. Wife. Today many people have come to worship, haven't they? Maid. Because it's fine weather, isn't it? Wife. There's much dust in the air. Frowns. Maid. Your hair's white with it. Wife. Is it? Takes out a towel and wipes her hair. Since we've walked a little hurriedly, I'm covered with sweat. Wipes her forehead and neck. Maid. Really, it's a little too hot, isn't it? Wife. You've got incense, rice bag, flowers and everything, haven't you? Maid. Every single thing, just so. Wife. Dear me, the bell's ringing for the service. Maid. We're just in time. Wife. Let's hurry into the hall. They go out at the other end of the road. Enter Shinran. Shinran standing behind Yuien. Yuien, Yuien. Yuien looks round, sees Shinran and blushes. What are you doing there? Yuien, looking vacantly at people passing along the street. Shinran. Today the weather's fine, isn't it? Yuien. It's rather hot for autumn. Shinran. There are many worshippers, aren't there? Yuien. Yes, from here we can see all sorts of people pass. Enter two shop boys. They wear stiff sashes, aprons, and two-toed socks. One pulls and the other pushes on a cart loaded with a bamboo box bearing the mark of some merchant. First shop boy. Let's go more slowly. Second shop boy. But if we're late, we'll be scolded again. First shop boy. I'm tired. Second shop boy. If you fall asleep again as you did last night, you'll catch it. First shop boy. But I was so sleepy I couldn't help it. Second shop boy. It's awfully hot, isn't it? Wipes off the perspiration with his hand. First shop boy. Don't flap your sandals like that. Second shop boy. Swarms of people, aren't there? First shop boy. They're all going to the temple. Second shop boy. Shan't we go have a look at the show banners? First shop boy, stopping as if somewhat tempted. But we'll be scolded if we're late, so let's hurry along. They go out. Shinran, we can see various phases of life here. I've always felt lonesome when looking at people passing by. Yuien, I too have had the same feeling for some time. Shinran, shall we rest here for a while? Yuien, I'd like to. Brings a cushion and puts it on the floor. It's very fine today, and see how distinctly Mount Hiei stands out. Shinran sitting down. In that mountain there are many men practicing religious austerities even now. Yuien. In the early days you also were on that mountain for a long time, weren't you? Shinran. I first went up at the age of nine, and from that time till I met Honen-sama when I was twenty-nine, I was training myself there most of the time. Yuien. Surely you recall the things of those days, don't you? Shinran, I can never forget them, for what with joyful devotion and aspiration, I earnestly and wholeheartedly tormented my soul. Sometimes I mused calmly in the woods, and sometimes I read the sutras hungrily, and evenings I gazed down on the darkening streets of Kyoto and thought yearningly lonely thoughts. Yuien, then you were in the mountain at my age. How did you feel living there? Shinran, when I was your age, I was gradually oppressed by uneasy feelings. Those were my bitter days, for though I read and read the sutras, they didn't bring solace to my soul. Moreover, I had to get on absolutely alone, cherishing my uneasiness in my breast. Yuien. Weren't there many young men of about the same age practicing religious austerities near you? Shinran. There were hundreds of them. They were of all sorts, some heroic men who mortified their bodies, some who studied hard, hardly sleeping nights, and some who kept themselves pure like godly hermits. I wasn't behind the rest in the practice of these things. Indeed, I did most desperate penances. But in my heart, there lay a lonesomeness of which I couldn't speak to them. I felt a yearning for the love and sorrow of man's life. I kept it in my own breast for fear that it would not be heeded or would be despised. 
that loneliness grew and grew unperceived of others in my heart a little before the time i finally came down off the mountain i even felt that my heart would break with this loneliness yuien master these days i somehow feel unbearably lonely sometimes i'm abstracted today as i stood here gazing down upon the people passing tears came unbidden to my eyes shinran looking into yuien's face most likely pauses for you're sensitive yuien there's no special reason but i feel lonely and sad sometimes i feel as if i'd like to cry my eyes out eiren says it's probably due to my weak body i too wonder if it may not be that but i can't help thinking that's not all i can't understand my own heart is it all right for me to feel lonely shinran your loneliness is natural when you're lonely there's nothing to do but to feel lonely yuien will i get over it by and by shinran i wonder you may feel more lonely now you feel a dreamy loneliness but afterwards you may come to feel a hungry loneliness yuien don't you feel lonely shinran i'm lonely too i think i'll be lonely all my life of course my loneliness now is different from yours yuien how are they different shinran looking at yuien compassionately yours may be cured by its objects but mine's already beyond cure by anything it's the destined loneliness of human life it's a thing you can't understand until you've experienced life your present loneliness will gradually take shape and form about a centre after that loneliness has been endured true loneliness will come such loneliness as i now feel but such things as this can't be understood through words you'll come to know them for yourself yuien then what should i do shinran when you're lonely it's all right to feel lonely life's training you only do everything earnestly and wholeheartedly don't be crooked delude others and cheat yourself but follow faithfully the entreaty of your own heart all's well if you bear in mind but this and you can't discover the true need of your heart at once you'll make various illusions for yourself but if you're only in earnest the wisdom to discover it will gradually be polished out yuien i can't understand what you say very well but i intend to live earnestly shinran that's right you have a good nature obedient and straightforward i love you you must take care of that nature go straight on to your destiny there's nothing but life to polish our wisdom now you seem young for your age but later you'll grow up yuien i was scolded by chio dono a little while ago shinran what did he say yuien he said my loneliness was due to insufficient faith one who believes in the salvation of buddha must have an ecstatic feeling that ecstasy is the proof of salvation if your heart's filled with exultation you can't feel lonely he said my loneliness was proof that i wasn't saved shinran hmm considers both are silent for a little the sound of a bell and voices chanting a sutra in the main hall are faintly audible yuien master uh blushes what's love like shinran seriously it's a painful thing yuien is love a sin shinran love twines together with sin we can't love in this world without sin yuien then we mustn't love must we shinran all the same everyone loves once in his life loves like a barrier which stands in the path of human life when one passes this barrier a new scene spreads out before his eyes it may be said that many men's lives are determined by the way they pass this barrier yuien is it so important as all that shinran it's the uniquely important factor in life if a man approaches this barrier seriously he'll understand life he'll understand love his wisdom will blossom forth all at once his soul will begin to be able to see into the essence of things if he approaches this barrier with an immoral and frivolous heart he'll become blind and slovenly he'll lose the power to yearn for the refreshing land on the other side and his energies failing on this side he'll fall down exhausted yuien then do love and faith go hand in hand shinran love is a road leading to faith if men are earnest in their pure and honest desires they'll all enter into religious consciousness when a man loves his heart's wonderfully purified he understands the grief of human life he touches terrestrial fate then faith's not far off yuien 
Then is it all right for me to love? Shinran smiling. Your way of asking is naive. I won't say whether it's good or bad. If you love, you may love. Only love seriously and straightforwardly. Yuien. Have you ever loved? Shinran. Yes. Pauses. It was when I was practicing religious austerities with all my might on Mount Hiei. I went down to the imperial palace as a substitute for the priest Jichin and was asked to compose an ode in the presence of the emperor. The subject given was love. The emperor was pleased with my effort and said it was better than any produced by the noble court poets, and I received a reward. Embarrassed, I was about to leave, whereupon one of the noblemen said to me that to compose such a poem I must have loved. His sentiment was one that could be understood only by one who had loved. How about it, he asked. You've been in love, haven't you? Yuien. What did you answer? Shinran. I replied that I had not. Then he said, there was no use telling such lies. It was shameful for a priest to love. I heard the other nobles chuckle. Yuien. Was he joking? Shinran. He was poking fun at me and making me a laughing stock. I left the palace, my dignity hurt. How ashamed I felt. Then on my way back up Mount Hiei, I couldn't but think earnestly. Was I really unacquainted with love? I couldn't say that. Then why couldn't I say that I had loved? Why had I lied? Because it was held that priests shouldn't love. I felt disgusted. I despised the falseness of our lives, as if made aware of it for the first time. And the fact that our mountaintop penances had become mere form gave me an unbearable sense of hypocrisy. From that time, I began to feel that I wanted to go down off the mountain. Was there not some way to live without lying so much? I couldn't but wonder if there wasn't some way to love and yet be saved. Yuien. On the whole, of all sins, there's none so bad as hypocrisy, is there? Once you said that the hypocrite is farther from the Buddha than the murderer, didn't you? Shinran. Yes, just that farther from the grace of Buddha than the evil doer of a hundred wrongs who feels his guilt is the hypocrite who piles up petty deeds of charity and doesn't recognize his own sin. Buddha saves us knowing that we are bad, for his salvation is for sinners. Yuien. How different is the teaching of the sages that only the good are saved. End of Act 2, Part 1. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Act Two, Part Two of *The Priest and His Disciples* by Karata Hyakuzo, translated by Glenn William Shaw, 1886 to 1961. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Act Two, Part Two. Yuien, how different is the teaching of the sages that only the good are saved? Shinran, it may be so with others but there is no prospect of a man like me being saved through his own goodness i still can't forget how i met with a lone woman once on my way back up the mountain when out on a night visit to the rokakudo it was a night when the moon was shining like frozen ice in the cold sky she asked me to take her up the mountain with me i refused saying that i couldn't as mount hiei was closed to women then she clung to the sleeve of my garment and cried she implored me with all her strength saying that i must take her up and make a nun of her as she too wished to save herself through religious practices no matter what i said she wouldn't listen at last she asked in resentment if it was all the same whether women were saved or not i was truly troubled on the mountain it was held that woman deep in sin had been cast off by all the gods of the three worlds since i could do no other i told her this in so many words and urged her to be resigned to her lot then as i watched she turned deathly pale finally striking her breast she pronounced upon the buddha one curse after another then like a flash she ran away yuien my you did a pitiful thing didn't you shinran but i couldn't take her up the mountain the forests were crying fiercely in the mountain wind deeply affected by the woman's curses i went as in a trance back up to the summit that night i couldn't sleep a wink after that i couldn't but feel in my heart that it was a lie that woman couldn't be saved i went every night to the rokakudo and prayed to kanon sama i prayed in a transport of tears i was willing to die 
from that time i began to look at things in a very different way i came to hate extremely the life on the mountain top on my way back from the rokakudo i used often to lean against the rail of the sanjo bridge and gaze at the people passing warriors with frowning faces merchants head over heels in their mental calculations and old people with girls went by or young men who were probably making for the gay quarters went by whistling how lovingly i looked upon those people i felt that they must all be forgiven i felt that the world should be preserved as it is i cried in my heart as it is as it is i asked myself aren't they all saved though i went back up the mountain i always felt that it was no longer my home yuien that was when you met honen shonin wasn't it shinran surely through the kind intervention of kanon sama i could do nothing but cry before honen sama yuien tearfully i understand well how you felt they fall into silence for a moment enter first priest and third priest first priest master are you here shinran i've been talking with yuien in the sunshine third priest how do you feel shinran practically all right thanks first priest i'm glad please take care of yourself shinran come talk with us here how are things in the main hall yuien brings cushions puts them down for the two priests to sit on and pours out tea third priest it's packed with worshippers the prayer service is over and chio dono is now in the midst of his sermon first priest they all seem to be moved by his earnest preaching third priest it's an authoritative and strong sermon they're all listening with the deepest respect first priest today's sermons especially fine shinran the text is religious ecstasy again isn't it third priest do you know shinran chio once talked to me and i heard a little from you a moment ago first priest he's telling enthusiastically how much more precious is religious joy than such earthly pleasures as wealth and fame third priest he even says it's more pleasant than love yuien he says that with it there's no fear of death no sadness in solitude and no worldly temptation first priest he says ecstasy is the proof of salvation third priest as i listened to him talk i felt anew the especially blessed position of us priests yuien when i hear those things i feel uneasy i'm always lonely lately i'm listless and at times my heart won't dance even when i read the sutras i'm weak of body and last month when my fever got a little high i was terribly afraid i might die i don't want to die now at all i somehow feel a yearning and an unwillingness to give up the bright world i can produce no such strong proof as chio sama can if ecstasy in the law is the proof of salvation is it that i'm not saved i can't doubt the one fact that even as i am buddha will save me but first priest i think it's because your body's weak third priest after all isn't it because your faith's young yuien master what on earth can be the matter please tell me i'm unbearably distressed am i saved am i lost shinran you're saved there's nothing to worry about in truth i too live on with the same feelings as yuien when i'm sick i fear death and when caught in the relentless clutches of worldly passions i'm sometimes so lonely i can hardly stand it i'm prone in spite of all to neglect this dancing joy sometimes i fall into fervently ecstatic meditation but it's easy for that white heat soon to scatter like ashes i'm always troubled first priest looking at shinran in surprise you did you say shinran i'm always blaming myself and asking myself why i should be like that my karma is very very deep since i'm like this in my old age it's not unnatural that young yuien should be troubled but i don't doubt of salvation at all buddha knowing beforehand styled us common men dressed in worldly passions he saves us helpless sinners as we are third priest then is chio dono's idea mistaken shinran no it's not mistaken men's karmas are deep or shallow according to the individual blessed are they who fall heir to ecstasy all joy be theirs in some there's little worldly passion in some worldly passion is strong and they suffer only it's shallow to call ecstasy the proof of salvation 
i mean to tell chio too but please heed well what i say there's no one proof of salvation to seek such a proof is to rely on our own discretion and is one sort of self-dependence salvation is accomplished through the vow of buddha it's well for us not to depend on our own contrivances but simply to have faith he whose karma is shallow and he whose karma is deep must pass through this world in entirely different ways but they're both saved yuien i feel thankful it's beyond my deserts first priest i hadn't thought of that whether we experience religious ecstasy or not and without relation to the changes in our hearts our salvation is established isn't it shinran otherwise it couldn't be called genuine salvation indestructible by fate for the condition of our hearts is controlled by fate third priest after all the original nature of self-reliance by which we would save ourselves by our own merit is left in us isn't it it's not easy to restore all things to buddha shinran would that i could grow simple-hearted and trust everything to him yuien the more i hear the deeper this teaching becomes shinran all are saved only they don't know it enter second priest second priest are you all here i finally finished my sermon he is excited shinran you've worked hard please come rest here a while second priest i have a favor to ask of you master just now when i got done preaching a little party of pilgrims came up to the pulpit and beg me to introduce them to you as they're most eager to meet you shinran have they some particular business with me second priest they say they've come all the way from a great distance to ask you about the important question of rebirth their faces are full of eagerness shinran if it's a matter of rebirth they should have heard about it many times ere this it's truly a simple thing and i have nothing to add on the subject second priest so i told them especially since you're a little ill i asked them if they couldn't put off the day but they all but cried and said that since they'd all come a long way i must get you to see them because they were so earnest i sympathized with them and though i hate to trouble you in your illness i beg that you'll receive them shinran that's a simple matter if anybody wants to see me i'll see him at any time only please tell them this one thing that i don't know anything difficult then please bring them here at once second priest thank you they'll surely all be glad goes out first priest they seem to have come a long way don't they third priest they're an earnest band of pilgrims aren't they yuien they've come all the way up to kyoto in their desire to see the superior i think it's admirable shinran sits in silent meditation enter second priest conducting six pilgrims shinran seeing the pilgrims hesitate just come right over here don't stand on ceremony yuien places cushions for them and the pilgrims sit down shinran i'm shinran indicating the disciples these are my people who are always with me first pilgrim are you shinran sama looks intently at shinran with tearful eyes second pilgrim i'm rejoiced i prayed that i might see you once in my life third pilgrim i wept when we passed the osaka barrier and they told me this was kyoto fourth pilgrim truly this has been no easy quest fifth pilgrim nothing could please me more than this fulfilment of a long-cherished desire sixth pilgrim i was beside myself with fear lest we might be refused a while ago in the main hall shinran moved it's very kind of you to come i too am happy where have you come from first pilgrim we've come from the province of hitachi fourth pilgrim we're from echigo shinran my have you come so far as that second pilgrim we've made a very long trip shinran you surely have i have deep memories of hitachi and echigo fourth pilgrim in my province fellow religionists meet together everywhere and talk about you first pilgrim the influence you left behind you reaches into every corner of my province third pilgrim how i love you whom i've never seen before shinran i'm drawn to you too i'm reminded of the days when i was journeying about in those regions fifth pilgrim many things have changed since then shinran anyway it was twenty years ago sixth pilgrim only the snow goes on heaping up deep as usual shinran 
i'll never in my life forget the sight of the echigo region covered with snow fourth pilgrim don't you feel that you'd like to come back once more shinran if destiny permits but probably i'll never go again i've grown old you see first pilgrim how old are you shinran seventy-five second pilgrim a while ago i was told that you're not well shinran no i've caught a light cold i'm practically all right now second pilgrim please take good care of yourself third pilgrim for how everybody depends on you shinran you're very kind pauses and points to yuien he comes from hitachi yuien i was born in hitachi near the village of daimon first pilgrim when i hear that you're from my province my heart goes out to you have you been a long time in kyoto yuien it's ten years since i left the old province my father's still there and i love the place shinran fifteen years ago when travelling in hitachi i was snowed in and was given a night's lodging at his house that was the destiny that led to our living together day and night as we do now second pilgrim destiny's a mysterious thing isn't it first priest they say even the touching of sleeves is a karma relation from a previous life second priest we couldn't all be talking together intimately like this for half a day but for destiny third priest even a single meeting or a single parting is by no means brought about by the will to bring it about in the world of men sadness and gladness are deep arrangements fixed in former lives yuien when i think of destiny i feel like crying i believe this world's born enemies who are busy bruising each other should they turn their thoughts to their karma relations would gladly forgive each other wouldn't they grasp each other's hands and weeping cry ah oh, what an evil destiny is ours shinran even a married couple that's incompatible can't separate all their lives if fate so decrees when they've gone to their graves they'll probably know all and they'll be glad together because they've never parted but lived as man and wife all their lives yuien then they'll think it was well we loved it was well we forgave we're fortunate not to have cursed then third priest all men should live amicably together that's it isn't it they fall into a deep silence first pilgrim coming forward in truth we've crossed more than ten provinces and come all the way to kyoto because we're troubled by the single matter of rebirth we beseech help on the great problem of the life next to follow this on behalf of all these others i pray that you will help us please teach us the way of rebirth shinran it's truly admirable of you to seek the way so earnestly i always feel unhappy that the men of this world think faith a thing of no account faith is the most important of all things it's the real test it's the place where the roads to hell and paradise fork it's the thing that men must face most seriously of all then have you not been taught at your temples at home second pilgrim we're always being taught shinran what are you taught third pilgrim this that if we pray with all our might to amida sama saying please save us in this life to come he will surely save us though we be the worst of sinners shinran that's true that's all you need to do fourth pilgrim we've heard this often and know it well we beg you to teach us in detail what comes next shinran what do you do with it when you've heard fifth pilgrim we want to go to paradise shinran verily you can go to paradise by repeating the prayer to amida which you've heard in your own provinces and know so well sixth pilgrim but somehow we feel uneasy shinran set your hearts at ease that alone's enough first pilgrim may i ask what gives you comfort shinran i too depend on amida's prayer alone second pilgrim but it's too simple shinran that simplicity is the characteristic of this sect without simplicity there's no truth and again the heart of the masses could not be touched without it third pilgrim that may be so but you studied for many years on mount hie and at nara we unlettered men may not be able to understand but please share with us a part of the education you got there fourth pilgrim we've come all this distance to receive it fifth pilgrim we'll take it home to our provinces as a souvenir of this trip shinran looking serious 
no that varied learning is in truth a hindrance on the journey to paradise and cannot help faith and learning are different things though you examine the whole storehouse of the eight myriad sutras they'd have no power to open the gates of paradise the prayer to amida is the only established way if in the envious thought that i understand difficult interpretations of the sutras or that i ought to know further details about the ways of rebirth you've come all this way to ask i'm truly sorry i know nothing difficult you see if that's what you want there are grave scholars on mount hiei and in nara please go there and ask first pilgrim your modest words touch me i admire you more and more second pilgrim what lack can there be in you who are known as the greatest genius of mount hiei shinran i was not able to find the road of deliverance through the learning heaped up on mount hiei i threw away learning and having accepted the assurance of a good teacher that one can be saved by the repetition of amida's prayer there's nothing to it but faith third pilgrim are you serious they all look doubtful shinran why should i deceive don't think that i'm playing with your feelings most truth is simple as a process of salvation nothing could look so simple from without as the prayer to amida only six ideographs you see but if you go into the mood of it from within it's infinitely and profoundly complicated probably you can never reach the bottom of it in your whole lives it's the love fate and sorrow of human existence the substance of all the experience that could come into your whole lives boiled down and packed into one simple formula along the road of human life every time you look back you can see the depth of these six characters it grows more and more earnest that's the increase of wisdom it's a different thing from the study of the sacred books for though your knowledge increase the eyes of your soul see no more clearly if you should consult me i would say that the prayer you know so well is sufficient it's absurd to take pride in the hearing of expositions of the holy texts it's better that each of you should take care to cultivate a taste for the feeling of the amida prayer love men forgive bear grief strive painfully to fulfil your fate look squarely at your destiny then the eyes with which you look upon the varied phenomena of human life will become moist the compassion of buddha will sink gratefully into your hearts namu amida butsu fits the heart exactly this is true learning fifth pilgrim we've been in the wrong even we stupid men have understood you well to go to paradise it's enough simply to repeat the prayer to amida isn't it that's all that's necessary isn't it sixth pilgrim like the cutting of a sharp knife my heart sees distinctly first pilgrim only please tell me one thing is there any proof that by repeating that prayer we can be born to the pure land shinran there's no proof to faith if you seek proof you don't believe in one earnest breath if amida's great desire to save the world was true shaka son's teaching was not false if shaka son's teaching was not false zendo's interpretation was not deception if zendo's interpretation was not deception honen shonin's teaching surely was not empty pauses nay though having been made proud by honen shonin i be about to fall into hell i'll feel no resentment but for amida's vow there could be no possible end for me but hell i'm an utterly irredeemable sinner that's true if i express my heart clearly i must admit that i don't know at all whether the prayer to amida can truly be the seed to birth in paradise or is the reason for falling into hell i leave everything to buddha i entrust my hope my life myself to him i wonder where he'll lead me all falls silent for a moment first pilgrim i feel ashamed how vile i am in the shallowness of my heart to say that without proof i can't believe second pilgrim the self-dependence of my heart has been exposed as if bleached out in the sun third pilgrim i realize that i built all sorts of walls and shut out the mercy of buddha fourth pilgrim i still hadn't surrendered all by any means fifth pilgrim i feel as if that in my heart which spoils and flatters me is broken down sixth pilgrim tearfully when i think of it it's the vow of the reliable buddha shinran i'm afraid i've spoken impertinently please please don't try to learn difficult things 
lean on buddha with the simple hearts of children our talk has grown too serious let's just chat a little have you been to see the famous places first pilgrim we haven't seen anything yet second pilgrim we came here the minute we reached kyoto shinran gion kiyomizu chionin and the maples must be beginning to redden at arashiyama if you'd like i'll send somebody to guide you first pilgrim we would thanks the evening bell sounds yuien master the day's dying and the air is chill please come rest in your room or it'll be bad for your health fourth pilgrim please rest fifth pilgrim we'll take our leave shinran no please stay at my temple tonight now let's brew some tea in my room and have a leisurely talk to the disciples you please come with us too yuien lead the way shinran gets up first and goes out they all stand up yuien come just walk this way curtain end of act two recording by expatriate in bangor maine act three scene one of the priest and his disciples by kurata hyakuzo translated by glenn william shaw eighteen eighty six to nineteen sixty one this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine act three scene one persons in the scene zenran son to shinran age thirty two yuien asaka a harlot age twenty six kaede a harlot age sixteen three harlots two waitresses a tea-house clown kiyamachi and sanjo a room at the tea-house called the matsunoya it looks out on the kamo river it is toward evening on an autumn day the three harlots are leaning on the parapet talking first harlot how good it feels in this cool wind second harlot my face burns frightfully puts her hand to her cheek third harlot i'm all played out with the reveling first harlot yes for the last four or five days it's been nothing but drink 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 and sing 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 second harlot i've been drunk down by zenran sama and have run away worn out with drinking third harlot zenran sama can down any amount pell-mell you can't possibly keep up with him still he doesn't seem to like it first harlot the more he drinks the paler he gets second harlot he's a queer fish who just as you're thinking he's absurdly hilarious suddenly bursts into tears i hate a man who cries when he's full of sake third harlot really sometimes i'm disgusted recently when i was drinking with him he was strangely depressed and looking into my face intently he said i love you i love you and threw his arms around me and it wasn't lust first harlot when you're wondering if he isn't crazy you find that there's a strong side to him too second harlot at first i wondered if he was all there but on the contrary he's so steady he's almost too sharp we can't talk recklessly third harlot anyway he doesn't know how to win a woman does he first harlot if you say that asaka-san will be angry second harlot speaking of asaka-san she has an awful crush on him i wonder why a gentle girl like asaka-san likes such a man third harlot there's no accounting for tastes as for you you probably fancy the handsome young priest who came to see zenran sama the other day second harlot you're always joking pretends to strike at her he's kaede san's singing and talking voices are heard and the sound of people walking first harlot they seem to be coming here enter zenran followed by asaka kaede the clown and a waitress clown mercy me has everybody come here to hide zenran have you been planning something secretly here to fool us laughs clown for our sakes please stop your secret talk first harlot to zenran it's you who are enjoying yourself second harlot finding our presence a nuisance we took the hint zenran i'm sorry clown sorry as tosai bozu zenran bozu is a bit rough laughs clown a thousand pardons beats his own head with his fan all laugh 
Zenran. As punishment for running away without a word, I'll make you drink more sake. Here, ring sake. Waitress. At your service. Starts to go. Asaka. Please don't drink any more. It's not good for you. Haven't you done nothing but drink since last night? Zenran. Do you ask me to take care of my health? You're a good wife, aren't you? Laughs loudly. Let's have another drink here looking at the river view. That melancholy talk of yours just now depressed me. To the waitress. Bring it quickly. The waitress goes out. Asaka. Really, you ought to quit, since you don't like it so well as to require it. Zenran. I'll drink and drink till I burn my body up. I live by lighting the fire in my body. When it goes out, I'm so lonely I can't stand it. Asaka. But there's a limit. Zenran. There's no limit to my loneliness. I'm lonely to the bottom of my soul. Asaka. Aren't we here to dispel that loneliness for you? Zenran. Yes, I couldn't get along without you. I couldn't live without you. All the same, when I'm playing with you, I get more lonely than ever. Asaka, you always wear a lonely face. Today, brace up and be more lively. Asaka. But it's my nature, so it can't be helped. Zenran. Today we'll all let loose. We'll forget everything. Though we're lonely, we'll force ourselves to think we're happy against all reason will make it true that man's life's good and harmonious raises his voice come now this world's a harmony men depend beautifully on each other the root of the evil in men's hearts is severed there's not a single soul unhappy all rejoice they all play like children ah the river flows the river flows gently and peacefully fastens his eyes on the river enter the waitress with sake food and the utensils needed for a drinking bout zenran come all drink drink offers cups to the harlots first harlot please excuse me second harlot i've stood all i can zenran no you must drink spite of everything clown for my lord's commands may not be denied the waitress goes about pouring out sake for the harlots zenran raising his cup how rich and strong is this brimming and overflowing liquid of gold it's as if the spirit of joy has been melted and made to flow i feel as if the sensations of man's mean and defective world have utterly disappeared drains the cup to whom shall i give this cup looks about the room kaede kaede to little kaede presents the cup to kaede kaede many thanks bows her head slightly and takes the cup the waitress pours out sake Kaede barely touches it to her lips and puts it down. Zenran. Kaede sings something for us. Kaede. I don't want to. Aren't there a lot of my elder sisters here? Zenran. No, I want you. Clown. Come, we want you, we want you. Kaede. Oh, there's no getting out of it. She sings in a childish voice. Asaka plays the samisen your precious letter i conceal in bluebells and lespedeza the moon is o'er the meadow and the dew is on the grass for you my love i pine insects cheer up nightly here through the sky of deepening night comes the cry of flying geese love like this zenran that's enough that's enough as if finding it unbearable ah how small that mouth asaka still holding the samisen my how you stopped it all at once right in the middle zenran look this little child making her sing songs for strange rioters tearfully drink another gives a cup to kaede kaede i've had enough clown in falsetto i'll help you picks up the cup from before kaede and drinks asaka what's the matter with you today zenran nothing at all asaka let's quit for today your color's bad i don't feel a bit like making merry zenran you're a lonely-spoken girl aren't you looks attentively into asaka's face then suddenly sticks his fingers into her front hair asaka in surprise here what are you doing puts her hands to her head zenran says nothing kaede your side hair's come down zenran when i look at your woolly black hair i don't like it to the clown here let's hear you mimic a cock clown all right sir cries like a cock the harlots laugh zenran let's see you walk on your knees clown like this sir walks on his knees the harlots laugh 
Zenran. Let's see you pound your head. Clown. With pleasure. Beats his head with his fan. Zenran madly. More, more. The clown rains blow after blow on his own head in rapid succession. Zenran. Oh. Shuts his eyes. Second harlot. You're frightfully down in the blues, aren't you? Asaka looking at Zenran fondly. Zenran-sama, I understand. Your heart's troubled over the messenger you sent to the temple. A slight chill falls on the party. Zenran sits buried in thought. First harlot, what are you thinking about? Second harlot, you're awfully depressed, aren't you? Zenran suddenly lively. I was just thinking of redeeming you. Second harlot laughing. Thanks very much. Then what'll you do? Zenran, dear me, that's plain. I'll take you home and make you my wife. Come, come here. Rises and taking the second harlot's hand, pulls her to her feet. Second harlot, quit fooling. Zenran, come, come here. Drags her forcibly. Second harlot, as she is dragged along totteringly. Don't play tricks. Shakes him off and starts back for her seat. Zenran, you dear. Takes her in his arms from behind. Second harlot, here let me go please let me go please squirms when you do that it hurts it hurts unbearably zenran laughing what an irresponsive individual she is this girl all look on in surprise enter a waitress waitress yuien sama has just come zenran releases the harlot he's a little shaky bring him here returns to his seat all are silent enter yuien he is dressed in his priest's robe yuien excuse me struck by the appearance of the party he hesitates a little zenran i'm glad to see you i was waiting just come over here there's nobody here to be afraid of it's a remarkable show isn't it laughs loudly waitress please come in yuien going in and kneeling down before zenran i'm indebted to you for the other day zenran it was rude of me to send a messenger today. Didn't it give you trouble? Yuien. No, when I heard a messenger had come from you, I came gladly. Is there something I can do for you? Zenran. No, there isn't anything I want done. Only I was lonely and wanted to see you and talk with you. Yuien. And I wanted to see you. Waitress bringing a new cup and placing it before Yuien. Please take this. Yuien hesitating. I don't drink waitress but just one zenran no don't urge it on him seeing yuien's discomfort since we have something to talk over you all go out and leave us alone waitress i understand sir then all come they go out and leave the two alone zenran i'm ashamed to have called you to such a place as this and what's worse i'm drunk yuien i don't care i was glad to come zenran i've been lonely there's nobody who can understand my heart even when i'm drinking sake like this i'm cool in the bottom of my heart i'm suffering ever since meeting you recently i felt loving and warm toward you i feel that you easily take in the thoughts in my breast when i'm with you i feel like making you listen to all sorts of things yuien and i after leaving you the other day could think of nothing but you i'm always thinking i'd like to see you how glad i was when the messenger came from you zenran only once in my life long ago was i ever drawn to a man like this i've lived a long while with a desolate heart pauses i love you yuien oh, i'm glad why do men speak ill of such a man as you i can't understand that the other day at the temple i got angry because they were all saying bad things about you and i said he's a good man and not the sort you think him zenran what sort of bad things did they say about me they said you were a child of destruction who was not only dissipated but didn't believe in the salvation of the jodo sect they said you were of a violent disposition unlike your father's zenran that's not unreasonable they're right very likely i'm a soul doomed to destruction my disposition's utterly violent i fit all their criticisms yuien my with a gentle nature like yours zenran no cuts him off when with you only the good in my nature is aroused but with others it's altogether different and my violent nature comes out yuien i think they're all wrong 
You're a good man yourself, surely. That's what I believe. Zenran tearfully. Nobody else talks to me like that. I can't do as I like with my disposition. And my situation ever since I was a little tyke and the flaws in my heart I received may be to blame. As you know, I've been disowned by my father for a long time. Yuan listens in silence. I gave my father all sorts of trouble, you see. He must hate me even now, doesn't he? Yuan. No, you're wrong. You don't know how much the superior worries over you in secret. Zenran. How does he live? Yuien. From morning till night, he's absorbed in repeating the prayer to Amida. Recently he took a cold and has been resting, but he's nearly well. But he's grown quite old. Zenran. He must have. Since I'm always in Inada and seldom come to Kyoto, and especially since I'm in no position to see him, I know nothing of his circumstances. I'm unfilial, but I've not forgot my father. Please take care of him. Yuien. I'm always with him as his personal attendant. Zenran. Does he love you? Yuien. Far beyond my deserts. Of all his many disciples, he loves me best. Zenran. Everybody must love you. That Kaeda says she loves you. Smiles. Yuien, blushing. You're joking. Zenran. How do you feel toward women? I pity them and can't help loving them. Especially when I'm with the women in such a place as this, I feel that I'm associating with the cream of humanity. The world's people decorate their outsides with form and etiquette and don't show the least bit of their real hearts. They make such things their armor and protect themselves with them, you see. I want to associate with people who aren't so cautious. I want to mingle without hiding my ugliness and weakness. In such a place as this, you see, people share the burden of their shame. You don't know what warm and honest intercourse it is and i can't help being attracted by the mood inspired by women it's sadder than the dews of autumn yuien away back in my heart i feel a desire for woman but as yet i know nothing about what sort of thing she is nor do i know what procedure is good if one would have to do with her shinran looking at yuien lovingly you're truly pure i've soiled myself through and through but i respect a pure man for he's utterly different but it's not likely you'll be able to get through this life without being tormented by woman. As for me, ever since I've known anything, the consciousness of woman has never been out of my head. But I'm not tempting you. He laughs. Yuien. Seriously. Recently, I talked of such things with his superior. Zenran. What did father say? Yuien. It's all right to love, but he said to love seriously and earnestly. Zenran. Hmm. Yuien. I've been wanting to ask you why you were disowned. Zenran, looking gloomy. I loved unlawfully. No, I don't know even now whether it was lawful or unlawful. I loved another man's wife. Yuien. Oh. Zenran. The girl loved me before she was married. The justice of this world took her from me, but it couldn't take the love out of my heart. What happened afterwards was the natural result of the contradictory state of affairs her husband was a relative of mine that complicated the tragedy for love i broke the law and became a wicked man railingly whether love breaks the law or the law breaks love i don't know even yet yuien what became of the woman zenran she was sent home and fell ill in consequence they wouldn't let me see her she finally died even at her death i didn't see her yuien what became of her husband zenran he wept and was angry he still curses both our names i can't bear to think of him i loved him he was gentle he was good i don't know whom i ought to blame for it that i did wrong there's no denying but is that all i rather want to put the blame on the disharmony of human life if there's a buddha who made the world i want to put it on him yuien oh zenran sama that's terrible i love you i weep for you please don't repeat that last again Zenran. I don't know anything. I can't believe anything. I harbor doubts as to the foundations on which the world is built. What an absurd world it is. What a discord human life is. After that, I lost the blessings out of my heart. I came to take a biased view of things. I got so I couldn't believe anything. In the midst of anguish, indignation, and worry, woman alone appears to my eyes like a red flower. Clasping her body, I found a way to forget my anguish men call me a profligate i accept the name yuien i don't know what to say 
i grieve over your unhappy fate you must truly feel as if you can't bear it but i've heard that buddha will pardon a man just as he is in his sin no matter how great his crimes the superior is always teaching me that for the sake of man who is so made that he must sin buddha achieves redemption Zenran, i congratulate you on your pure and readily believing heart but i can't easily believe in that perhaps my heart's grown cynical maybe i've seen too much fraud it's too conveniently fashioned a salvation it's the sort of peace of mind the smooth heart of a selfish scoundrel would invent before you i'm ashamed of my perverted way of thinking but the jodo faith looks like a salvation for the evil though in truth unless one's a good man with a pure heart it too is a hard teaching to accept also i think it incontestable i think my inability to believe is the punishment for my sin and dissipation you and my father are both good and pure you see though you think yourselves great sinners if a man soils his soul too much he reaches a point where he can't accept things as they are i'm frightfully soiled you see you simply can't imagine for instance mumbles as if in anguish no you see i do things that i can't possibly mention in your presence really i do malicious mean and unnatural things you see i'm positively no man to be forgiven unpunished that would be too impertinent though i'm despicable i haven't grown so brazen-faced that while i commit foul sins like this i can pray to be saved as i am that shows a conscience at least it's my pride i'd rather be told do such and such penances and i'll save you i'm willing to undergo any hardships if that's impossible i'll take my punishment that's my sincere desire yuien what you say hurts me you suffer deep anguish unknown to me a noble conscience beats in your words nay i feel as if i've been listening to a noble sermon Zenran. no i stand before you a devil i'm saddled with a life of destruction please pity a soul cursed with the inability to believe yuien i believe you're a child of buddha as i listen to you i can't get the slightest impression of a devil zenran sama listen to me though i haven't any wisdom to impart to you i think you insult your own soul i think you're perverse and consider things rebelliously i sympathize infinitely with the course by which you've reached this stage but i'm convinced that the way you're walking is not carrying you directly forward along the main road according to what the superior constantly tells me when we're in difficulties and can't see our own sins we feel an unreasonable resentment at such times we want to heap that resentment on buddha resist that it's not unnatural but endure steadfastly never never curse he says that at such times faith is born of that endurance when we come to our graves don't you suppose we'll understand everything when we come to know that buddha's deep love is bound up in that unreasonableness won't we be ashamed of having been angry with him isn't the wisdom of man vastly different from the wisdom of buddha Zenran, your words are simple but true though callow they gleam with wisdom i feel as if i'm being whipped i feel deeply that i must try to think yuien i've been told that the worst sin is to kill the true desire of one's soul Zenran, ah i want to revive an honest and straightforward heart they sit in silent thought yuien wouldn't you like to see your father Zenran, i would but i can't yuien shall i ask him Zenran, thanks but let it go for he'll positively not see me yuien but in his heart he wants to see you both father and son want to meet then it's a shame if they can't what power prevents i want to smash that power i can't bear it Zenran, that power is the same that shattered my love it's frightfully strong i curse it but i haven't the strength to smash it yuien it's the social will it's the stubborn will of the countless men in the world that power rules everything in my temple too recently i bumped into it ah why don't the people in this world know more affection they probably don't realize that their hard hearts are afflicting others it makes me miserable Zenran. it wouldn't do father any good either for me to see him now even though he should permit it the justice of the world is painful i've been in contact with that cruel power since infancy the truth is i'm not the child of my father's wife yuien surprised i never heard that before Zenran. 
my mother was the daughter of a certain samurai of inada when father was in echigo his wife died after pilgrimages all over the country he came to inada and stopping in the house of my mother's father lived in that town for fifteen years meanwhile they fell in love that's how i was born i passed dark days before i was allowed to call them father and mother i don't blame father at all that's the love of human life and the sadness of fate i suppose yuien what became of your mother zenran when father went back to kyoto she was left in inada but she's dead now yuien really life in this world is an infinitely melancholy thing isn't it zenran to me this world looks like a valley of sadness the two fall silent yuien today i must be going zenran must you today i've been happy though i wish we could talk longer yuien and i wish i could stay on indefinitely but i came away without letting the superior know zenran you're worried for my sake aren't you forgive me today you've made me think of many things i'm thankful yuien i've never had such a satisfying talk before i'll surely come again zenran please come as often as you can i'm always lonely yuien then good-bye gets up goes to the door and looking back speaks earnestly if your father says he'll see you what do you do zenran thinks then speaks positively i'll go to him gladly yuien then sayonara zenran seeing him off sayonara yuien goes out zenran stands motionless for a moment then he walks up and down in the room then putting his back against a pillar he falls into deep reverie enter asaka with a silken lantern in her hand standing in the doorway she looks at zenran oblivious of her presence he continues in absorption asaka zenran sama zenran looking at asaka asaka what do you think here's a father and a son the father's bathed in the grace of all heaven and people look up to him as a saint the sons drowned in drink and lust and men despise him for a libertine father and son separated by the world's justice are yearning for each other asaka oh you surprise me listens attentively zenran they're starving for each other but if they meet the beautiful peace surrounding the father will be broken men will knit their brows in suspicion and disgust denunciation will gather about the father then what should the son do should he go to him or not asaka in a trembling voice he'd better not go zenran what if the father calls him what if he says wandering child come back asaka painfully he'd better not go zenran oh staggers supports himself against the pillar asaka zenran sama zenran sama runs and embraces zenran zenran i don't know it's too much for me i help me asaka don't go but pray pray for your father's peace and happiness i must be strong if you call on me on me whom you know to be weak to help you long ago in that dangerous time when your fate for this life was settled didn't you stand at the parting of the ways just as now when it was your duty to protect the lifelong peace of the dear one you loved and your cousin you were weak you told me you injured both others and yourself how often you've regretted and asked yourself why you didn't endure in your tears it was only today you told me your pitiful story for the first time you wept on my knees your tears are hardly dry yet you praised then my sacrifice for my poor father and mother you said bear your troubles for the sake of the happiness of others zenran you give me back my very words asaka weeping i whip you how strong my words are zenran you've taken the place of my conscience asaka poor zenran sama zenran yes i must be strong my darling squeezes asaka's hand the stage turns round curtain end of act three scene one recording by expatriate in bangor maine Act Three, Scene Two of the Priest and His Disciples by Kurata Hyakuzo, translated by Glenn William Shaw, eighteen eighty six to nineteen sixty one. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Act Three, Scene Two. Persons in the Scene: Shinran, Yuien, Two Priests, an Acolyte. Shinran Shonin's Living Room: A tidy room of eight mats with a little shrine in one corner. A scroll with a vow written on it hangs in the ornamental alcove. Beside the bed there is a low table with a book open on it and in the other corner a night lamp autumn plants grow luxuriantly in the garden it is the evening of the same day shinran is sitting on the bed talking to the two priests first priest then you still say you won't see him shinran yes nods second priest i too think that'll be by far the best first priest for it wouldn't be pleasant to have the communicants fall to discussing it would it second priest there's no telling what sort of rumours would be started by the gossipy public and it would be a catastrophe to have it prove a stumbling block to the young disciples first priest gradually there are beginning to be irregularities in conduct among the young disciples there are those who say they've seen one of them coming out of a certain tea-house in kiamachi second priest the world says it's because the shinshu teaching doesn't condemn debauchery first priest it's a time when the other sects envying our prosperity are looking for excuses to find fault second priest anyway it's a critical time demanding prudence the truth is there are rumours that yuien dono goes to see zenlan sama from time to time shinlan it seems so though yuien said nothing to me about it first priest somehow his conduct's a little strange the other day he was defending zenlan furiously shinlan i'll speak to him second priest they say zenran is living in a continual round of pleasure at a certain tea-house in kiamachi shinran he's a sore trouble to me and i'm sorry he's always a worry to you first priest no we only pray that no injury may come to your merit second priest i wonder why such a child was ever born to so pure a man as you first priest if he only wouldn't come up to kyoto it would be all right Jinlan, i'm earnestly praying that he may not embarrass other people hangs his head and bites his lip they are all silent for a moment first priest it's time for the evening service so we must be going i'm sorry we've told you this worthless stuff today Jinlan, not at all second priest please don't worry too much about it your health mustn't be injured Jinlan, thanks first priest then we'll see you later on second priest please take care of yourself the two priests go out shinran shuts his eyes and falls into thought enter an acolyte acolyte it's grown dark i'll light up he lights the lamp shinran where's yuien acolyte soon after noon he said he had some business to attend to and went out he'll probably be back right away now he said he'd be back in time for the evening service shinran oh acolyte how do you feel this evening shinran thanks i feel fine today you worked hard cleaning the garden acolyte if i neglect it for a moment the weeds spring up immediately shinran you must be tired go to sleep early tonight acolyte all right then if you wish anything please call me goes out the bell in the main hall is heard ringing in the evening service shinran sitting straight up in bed namu amida butsu namu amida butsu closes his eyes enter yuien yuien i've just come back puts his hands to the mats shinran ah you've come yuien i'm late shinran where have you been yuien to kiyamachi shinran oh yuien i'm sorry it took so long your supper shinran i've already had it i thought of waiting for you but i ate a while ago yuien and i didn't serve you shinran never mind pauses you've not eaten yet have you yuien i don't want anything tonight shinran are you unwell eat a little anyway he looks into yuien's face yuien no it's probably because i walked a little fast i'll take something afterwards shinran oh be careful you're not naturally strong yuien thanks how are you tonight shinran practically well 
I'm so well I'm almost ashamed to be like this. But for you, I think I'd get up. Yuien. I'm glad. But please be careful a little longer. Yours is a precious life. Pauses. Aren't you cold? The nights have grown very chilly. Shinran. No, they make me think clearly and feel fine. Yuien. Autumn's well advanced. This morning I went out into the garden to cut flowers to offer to the Buddha. But the frost covered everything. Many of the flowers are faded. Shinran. The leaves will soon be falling from the trees. Yuien. The time's near for the gardener to grumble because the leaves of that maidenhair tree behind the living quarters fall and fall, and he must sweep endlessly. Shinran. How rapidly the seasons change. When one grows old, they seem to change especially fast. This world is transitory and fleeting. Its transitoriness you can feel even in youth, but you can't feel its swiftness till you've grown old. Sometimes I've thought, is another year gone already? And felt terrible. In human life, there's a lonely feeling you can't know till you've grown old. Yuyen. Probably the world's no such place as we young people think it. Shinlan. The mistakes of youth are many, but men's eyes gradually open and they get so they can see the truth of life. But in youth, there's nothing to do but live with a young heart. Youth should go directly into its destiny, cutting straight ahead. A man can't have a deep old age without passing through a real youth. Yuyen. To me, life's a mysterious land of joy and sorrow behind a curtain. Shinlan. That's just about it. Yuyen. The insects are crying, aren't they? Listen. Shinlan. Just like a rain. Yuyen. I always think of home when I hear those voices. When autumn came, the insects used to cry incessantly in the thicket out behind our house. My dead mother often took me on her back and went out into the dooryard garden. And when the cricket called Korogi cried, she would tell me that it said, Sew your rags, sew your rags. And when poor men heard it, they got their winter clothes ready. Then I had a singularly helpless feeling of sadness in the approach of the cold. So when I hear these crickets, I think of my mother. Shinlan. How many years has it been since Okane-san died? Yuyen. The seventh anniversary will be this winter. Shinlan. Her death was a loss indeed. Such good mothers are rare. Yuyen. How she loved me. Every time I fall to thinking of my boyhood, I feel her warm love intensely. Shinlan. Have you heard from Saemon Dono? Yuyen. Yes, he says he's in good health. He's been unbearably lonely since mother's death. He feels the mutability of life and yearns earnestly for the black robe. And on the seventh anniversary of mother's death, he wants to become a priest. He's thinking of converting our house into a temple. He says for the principal image he intends to worship that figure with the broken hand you gave him as a keepsake. Shinlan. He's finally made up his mind to become a priest, has he? Yuyen. It's been his desire for a long time, you know. He says the name of the temple will be the Temple of the Stone Pillow. He says it has reference to your sleeping with a stone for a pillow before the entrance that snowy night. And he asked me to ask you to give him a Buddhist name. Shinlan. He too has been sore distressed, you see. Yuyen. My father's dear to me. We haven't seen each other for a very long time. Shinlan. I haven't seen him since we parted that snowy morning. I can't forget that night. Yuyen. It was a frightfully stormy night, wasn't it? I remember it distinctly in my child's heart. Shinlan. You were still a little boy, weren't you? At about that time your mother was worrying because you were not strong. Yuyen. I still remember perfectly how out by the gate when you were leaving you folded me in your robe. Shinlan. I went away with no destination, not knowing whether we should ever meet again or not. Yuyen, I never dreamed that we should ever be bound up together as master and disciple. Shinlan, our destiny was profound. Yuyen remains silent for a moment, then speaks determinedly. Master, do you love me? Shinlan, you ask a remarkable question. What do you think? Yuyen, you do. Suddenly bursts into tears. You love me as I've never deserved. I'll never forget your kindness all my life. I'd do anything for you. I'd die. Sobs. Shinlan, putting his hand on Yuyen's shoulder. What's the matter? Yuyen, what's excited you like this? Yuyen, I rely upon your love. Please.
Please forgive Zenran Sama. Please see him. Shinran makes no reply. I can't bear it. Zenran Sama's a good man. He's unfortunate. Is there anybody who can hate him? They're all evil. The world's out of tune. They've all crowded around him and made him what he is. He loves you. Please see him. Please forgive him. I'll go and get him at once. You don't know how delighted he'll be. Shinran, controlling his pain and speaking quietly. Have you seen Zenran? Yuien, yes. Today a messenger came from him to me, and I went to see him without letting you know. I lied. What I said about going to Kiyamachi on business wasn't true. Zenran sama's in Kiyamachi. I lied. Shinran, how did you find Zenran? Yuien, resolutely. When I got there, he was drinking sake with harlots and a tea house clown. Shinran, did he call you to such a bout? You in your purity and innocence? Licentious men can't consider the danger of making a little one stumble. Yuien, but he said he hated to show me such a place, and when the waitress wanted me to drink sake, he told her not to press it on me, and he said though he was soiled himself, he respected the pure. He invited me to see him just as he always lives. He didn't want to show me all that, but he didn't want to deceive me. Shinran, why did he send for you? Yuien, he's lonely. He said he wanted to see me and talk to me. He's a very lonesome man when he's driven to calling me for solace. He seemed utterly forlorn. He looked truly unhappy as he sat recovering from his drunkenness amid a confusion of sake cups, trays, and samisen. I'd never seen a man so lonely looking before. Shinlan. The loneliness of human life is not such a shallow thing as to yield to sake and women, you see. Many weak men turn to sake and women when they're lonely, and they're made more and more lonely. Their souls are laid waste. They fall into an unnatural, ugly, and bad condition of heart. That's not unreasonable, but it's not the right way. There's something in it of self-delusion, evasion, and deception. A strong man must embrace that loneliness and go on living. If it's man's fate, he must accept it. He must live his life with that loneliness in it. By the religious life is meant that kind of life. The place where the roads of dissipation and faith divide is treacherous. It's the difference between going straight on and deceiving. Yuyen. Zenran is not living his life with any assurance in it so he's the more unhappy. Feeling as he does now, I think there's probably no other way for him to live. As I listened to his painful story, I felt oppressed. Not knowing what to say to console him, I simply sat with feelings of sympathetic grief pounding in my breast. I felt not the least tendency to blame him. I simply saw before me a man in pain and torture, and when I tried to think who should be blamed for his injury, I was left with nothing but irrational feelings. As I pondered on my way home, I felt dizzy, for there was nothing my head could comprehend. I came home brooding over the one thing I made out clearly in the tempest of all my thoughts. That was that Zenlan sama must be forgiven. Shinlan. I, too, think him a pitiful fellow. He may have many good excuses, but he's injured the lives of others. One poor woman died. One virtuous young man's heart was broken for life several families have been robbed of their peace all this was due to his weakness he's receiving his reward yuyen but he's not alone to blame the injury to his whole life must be blamed on the unnatural will of society it's the law of heaven that men and women who love should be married it's the sin of society that that law is broken it's too cruel to blame him alone shinlan society's receiving its reward too the inharmoniousness of the world arises out of the punishment people are receiving as they go on injuring each other like that. It's because the karma accumulated by the giving and receiving of injuries since the most distant antiquity is all confused. We who've received our specks of life in the knots of that tangled thread are burdened from birth with inharmonious destinies. Moreover, the punishment for our sins and faults will descend forever upon our descendants. Yuyen, our existence is truly perilous, isn't it? Shinlan, if there was no Buddha, I would probably curse this existence before anybody else, and more fiercely than anybody else. But in this world, his grace is felt more deeply, the deeper our misery and sin. 
the harmony of the world becomes all the more complex and delicate namu amida butsu untangles the whole confusion of karma yuien zenlan sama says he can't believe in that namu amida butsu shinran why not yuien how his explanation moved me zenlan sama blames himself beyond his deserts he says that while committing foul sins as he is he hasn't the gall to pray that he be saved as he is at least that's my conscience my pride he said and the tears shone in his eyes the prayer to amida is suitable for a pure man like father but for a soiled man like me penance is more becoming i want rather to be punished i'm a child doomed to destruction he said and wept i loved him unendurably shinran if he would but become a little more tractable he's in rebellion against himself and others he flatters himself when he says he wants to be punished he mocks the terrors of the fires of hell it's impossible to bear to the end the bodily pain of even one finger burning pauses it seems he hasn't yet lost that which he must lose yuien if zenlan sama should die now where would his soul go shinlan his face becoming tense in the effort to bear his pain to hell yuien oh master please see him please save him don't you love that child of yours shinlan is silent you're too strict with him alone you're too severe if he weren't your child you'd have forgiven him long ago once ryonen dono committed a sin far worse than his but you forgave him and when yushin dono did wrong last spring and all the disciples advised you to expel him you protected him alone why are you strict with zenlan sama only i don't understand you're always telling me that the love of flesh and bone and of husband and wife is not pure love you teach me that we must call every man our neighbour and love him then isn't zenran sama too a neighbour of yours isn't it right to forgive that neighbour until today i've never once opposed you but in this matter only i must oppose you it's the prayer of my life please make him your neighbour and see him shinran tearfully i understand well how you feel i'm glad thanks does zenlan say he wants to see me yuien at first he said it wouldn't be for his good to see my father now but when at leaving i asked what he'd do if you said you'd see him he said he'd gladly go to you shinran he felt resentment toward me didn't he yuien no he said he'd wronged you greatly and he anxiously asked many things about you it seems that his coming up to the capital this time was because his heart was drawn to you and his calling me was because he wanted to make various inquiries into your circumstances shinran the truth is i'm always worrying about that boy especially when i think of his mother it's almost more than i can bear at times i feel that his unhappiness is my crime yuien i heard about that too from zenlan sama today shinran what did he say yuien he said everything's the sorrow and fate of human life i feel no desire to blame my father shinran hm thanks after all it's my crime my fault if i may call it that i meant to treat asahima that was his mother's name like a neighbour but in the end that was impossible i was weak i was overcome by the fervent love of the gentle but determined girl my heart was lonely as a wilderness with my long pilgrimage in the north country why couldn't i treasure faithfully the memory of tamahi and live alone when i think of that my feelings of self-censure are unbearable i'm in agony yuien remained silent asahime was too good and gentle to blame she gave the impression of weakness though strong passion was concealed behind that how terribly she wept when i came back to kyoto yuien she's gone now isn't she shinran yes pauses i've lost many loved ones the compassionate honen sama the chaste tamahi the worthy okane san yuien and that filial first son hani sama shinran closing his eyes now they're all beautiful buddhas and they're all taking care of us compassionately they forgive all the wrongs i did them on earth yuien with the hearts that have seen off the dead in loneliness i think we who are left must live together in friendliness for that reason too please hurry and forgive zenlan sama shinlan i have forgiven him there's no one who can judge him but the buddha yuien then please see him 
Shinran is silent. Master, you really want to see him, I think. Shinran, I do, puts force into his voice. Though he's profligate, I recognize his sincerity and love him. Never has a day passed that I haven't thought of him. I want to see his face. I'm hungry to hear his voice. Yuien, please see him. Master, both father and son want to meet. Then why is it such a difficult thing for you to see him? Isn't it really simple? Shinran, truly it's simple. If this were the harmonious pure land, it would be a spontaneous and easy thing. This is the inconvenient world where that simple thing can't be. Throws strength into his voice. The peace of many people hangs on that simple thing. Many powers come together to prevent me. Now I'm keenly aware of the oppression of those powers. I have no strength to oppose them. Rives. I can't see him. Yuien. Yes, please see him. Please see him. You act too much from a sense of duty. Don't think of him as your son. Make him a neighbor. Make him an absolute stranger. Shinran painfully. Ah, oh, if I could have done that. I believe I should think that way. I teach you to think that way, but I can't. A moment ago you said I was gentle with others and strict with my own son. That's because I love my own son only and can't love other men. I love Zenran. I'm often inclined to take him to my bosom and blame others, just as a fond mother embraces a mischievous child and scolds its poor nurse. I know the weakness of my heart, and since I do, it's difficult to pardon Zenran. I must think of the family of the woman who died on Zenran's account, of her husband and of his family, of all those who are cursing Zenran. Their eyes are saying, because of your son, because of my son, I must say an apology, especially since I don't love these people. Though I don't see him, I don't feel the torment of not loving him. In my heart, I love him to that extent. Yuien, I'm in torment, I don't understand. Shinran, moreover, most of my disciples would not like to see me meet Zenlan. A while ago, Chiyo and Eiren came and urged me not to see him. Yuien. My, without understanding your heart. Shinran. They spoke intending it for my good, but though I'm sorry to confess it, it didn't sound pleasantly in my ears. Yuien. I wonder why they all think that way. Shinran. There are few warm-hearted men like you. Yuien. Do you really intend not to see him? Shinran. Yes. It would disturb the peace of the people around me. Yuien. Then what'll become of Zenlan sama How disappointed he'll be. And more important, what'll become of his straying soul? Shinlan. That's what worries me most. If there was no way for his soul to be saved but through me, and if I had the power to save it, I'd probably meet him and preach to him, though I shut my eyes to all other feelings. But I haven't the power to save him. His salvation or abandonment rests in the holy will of Buddha. I can't carry out my plans as I please. Since he, too, is a child of Buddha, he can't escape from the protection of Buddha. I think it improbable that he'll be cast out. All I'm allowed to do is to pray. Without meeting him, I'll pray for him morning and evening. I'll pray, O oh Buddha, please save that child. In the end, love must come back to the Amida prayer. That alone is true, ultimate love. When I think fondly of him, I feel like folding my hands and reciting Namu Amida Butsu. You, too, please pray for that unfortunate child. Yuien, I'll pray with you. Ah, but how lonely your heart must be. Shinlan, this is the extremity of man's affection. Yuien, I can't bear it. Human life is too lonely. Shinlan, in human life there are still more lonely things. Things it's difficult for man to part with gradually fall away. How many I've lost up to this time as if to himself ah ye perishable things perish ye crumbling things crumble and ye true things that can't be broken by fate alone remain i want to go to the grave grasping them fast praise in silence yuien ah i'm afraid curtain end of act three recording by expatriate in bangor maine Act Four, Scene One of *The Priest and His Disciples* by Karata Hyakuzo.
translated by Glenn William Shaw, 1886 to 1961. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Act Four, Scene One. Persons in the Scene: Yuyen, Kaede, Four Little Girls. The Cemetery at Kurodani. Countless tombs, stone monuments, and images of Jizo stand in close rows. There are trees that cast deep shadows. A little meadow with clumps of wild rose and raspberry scattered about here and there. A road comes out from beyond a thicket, crosses the meadow, and disappears in the trees. It is an afternoon in spring, one year later than the events in Act Three. Yuyen is sitting on the stump of a tree alone. Yuyen. Spring's here. The buds of the trees and grasses are all ablaze. The earth drinks in the sunlight and is swollen and mellow. Little birds are singing with happiness. Ah, oh, the preciousness of myriad flowers. I feel as if the joy of young life's welling up out of my body. Stands up and walks to and fro. She ought to be here by now. Gazes through the thicket. Maybe circumstances are unfavorable and she can't get away. I barely sneaked out myself. Pauses. Gradually I've got used to lying. Stands still and thinks, then suddenly becomes all animation. No, now I can't think of such things. Walks again. In these high spirits I can't stay still at all. Bursts into song. Of early spring the gladness, gladness, heart that smiles in budding fern. As for you I gather, gather, on my sleeve the snowflakes burn. On my garment sleeve enter Kaede from beyond the thicket. Kaede, yuyen sama i've come have you waited yuyen yes a very long time kaede coming to his side conditions at the house were a little bad but anyway i hurried and ran she is out of breath yuyen my heart almost failed me at the thought that you might not be able to get out at all kaede i forced my way out through impossible difficulties but having made so firm an agreement with you i couldn't spite of anything let you walk here alone in vain but i must get back early to-day yuien don't talk of going the minute you get here looks into her face how i've longed to see you kaede drawing near i too have longed have longed her eyes fill with tears they both fall silent for a moment yuien let's sit down here he sits down on the grass Kaede sitting down beside him. Won't somebody see us? Yuyen. People seldom pass, but if they do, isn't it all right? We're doing no wrong. Kaede. But I'd feel ashamed. Yuyen. I feel that I haven't seen you for ages. How many days has it been since we parted in the back room at the Matsunoya? Kaede. Half a month. Yuyen. How long that half month has been! And all the while I've thought of nothing but you. Kaede and you've not been out of my mind for a moment times without number has my love made me want to fly to you instantly but i was without resource i was beside myself with impatience yuyen and i even when i'm reciting the sutras at the temple am absent-minded and thinking of nothing but you my happiest time is in the evening after the service when thinking of you i walk alone in the quiet and deserted garden kaede you're lucky to have such times I'm in a painful fix. All day long I'm in a turmoil and have no time to think steadily of anything. Yuyen. If only we could meet more often. Kaede. That time before, if Big Sister hadn't interceded for me, I couldn't have met you. Yuyen. What's Asuka-san doing? Kaede. Since Zenlan-sama's departure for his home province, she's passed lonely days. Yuyen. It's through her kindness I'm able to send you letters. Recently I sat up late writing you a long one, then I put it in the bosom of my garment and went out. It was a night of liquid moonlight. Though I felt it would be utterly impossible to meet you, I turned naturally toward Kiyamachi, and before I knew it was at the gate of the Matsunoya. A light shone through the paper windows upstairs, and shadows were moving on them. I thought you were probably there. Hating to leave, I hung about. Then Asaka-san came out. I handed her the letter quickly and hurried back to the temple. Kaede. That night in the darkness at the foot of the stairs, she said she had something nice for me and handed me I knew not what. I looked at it, holding it up to the paper lamp in the hall. It was a letter from you. How delighted I was. 
i read it slowly syllable by syllable i hated to come to the end your letters are really wonderful i'm full of thoughts but i'm mortified by a limping brush that won't write yuien please write won't you kaede but i know only the simple symbols of the syllabary blushes and i'm a poor writer yuien they're good enough moreover if you write what's in your heart straight off without ornament your letters will be good naturally if only the thought's sincere kaede if it's a matter of sincerity i yield to none after this i'll write you thinks a moment it's impossible how can i send them to you yuien that is a question you can't go out it would be awkward for a messenger to come to the temple kaede isn't there some good way yuien thinking i'll go for them kaede can you do that yuien please write a letter and keep it i'll go to those stone steps under the projecting balcony of the matsunoya and whistle you please come down by the back entrance that gives out to the river bed and give me the letter kaede then i can see your face for a moment anyway can't i but if i'm found out it'll be terrible lowers her voice mother thinks very badly of our intimacy she says if a man wants to enjoy himself let him bring money and enjoy himself and she's very angry yuien clenching his fists if i only had the money kaede it's all right you're the one man with whom i associate as no patron however able you might be i'd rather die than be bought with your money tears stand in her eyes yuien you're having a bad time on account of me aren't you kaede i don't care rather aren't things going badly with you at the temple yuien looking gloomy there seem to be some of the disciples who think things a little suspicious kaede doesn't the superior know yuien no looks uneasy kaede what did you say to get away today yuien that i was going to kurodani to pay my respects at the master's tomb kaede what did he say yuien he said while i was at it to go round by the shinyodo and take my time about getting back kaede oh thinks yuien it grieves me almost beyond endurance to lie to the superior this morning i went to kurodani and kneeling before honen sama's tomb begged forgiveness from the bottom of my heart kaede suddenly looking depressed it's my influence that's put lies into your pure mouth yuien no it isn't kaede please forgive me clasps her hands yuien i'm at fault pulls her hands apart and continues gripping them firmly there's no necessity for perjuring myself i ought to tell the superior the plain truth i'm simply a coward kaede but if you tell him such things won't you be scolded yuien we're not doing anything bad we must first of all have that faith in ourselves kaede san do you understand you mustn't be cringing kaede but you're a priest and i am what i am of all women i'm the most despised in the world a harlot yuien it's not the belief of the shin sect that a priest must not love and it's not the teaching of the superior that one should be despised because she's a harlot though a harlot if she loves sincerely her love's pure and stainless there are in the world many daughters of good families whose love is mean and stained i don't associate with you as with a harlot and you've just said you don't associate with me as with a guest i was thankful for that for you truly have a chaste heart i love you he holds her hands firmly in his kaede but i i weeps my body's stained covers her face with her sleeve and cries yuien embracing her kaede san kaede san kaede please cast me off i'm not worth your love i'm stained your body's like a pure pure jewel i don't know how to apologize enough i can bear my lot in tears i've borne everything up till now i've resigned myself to being the plaything of men all my life i've determined to be content with even that shame as my fate for there's nothing else to do i'm weak and everybody treats me in such a way as to make me resign to my fate every guest every single one has used me as a plaything and they've compelled me to think myself but that i've got used to it i've decided that i'm a victim of pleasure and the guests are tormenting devils you're the very first man that ever treated me as a maiden you're the first that ever taught me that even i'm a human being 
You went so far as to show me that even I'm a child of Buddha. Weeps. I never dreamed there could be a man who would treat me as you've treated me. I thought you were like an angel from heaven. As I associated with you, my lost maidenhood gradually came back to me. My maidenly hopes were reborn. Moistened by your rain-like love, my maidenly hopes, joys, life, oh, my love, which had been crowded down in my breast while in the bud, burst forth all at once. I was in a trance of delight, and I forgot my position and my circumstances. I dreamed of the world denied me. Now I understand clearly the position in which I stand. I must not blemish your jewel-like lot. Please cast me off. I'm resigned. I shall never forget you all my life. I shall live on guarding the memory of this happy dream which I've been permitted to dream for a while. Yuien. It's no dream. It's no dream. I think to make our love the most real of realities. I respectfully cherish it as the essence of all beautiful things that exist in majesty between heaven and earth and compare it to the stars shining in heaven. Let's prize this treasure born between us. Let's nourish it. When I think it's for love, I'm all energy. Power boils up in me. Let's fight bravely against all enemies who would interfere with our love. You, too, leave sad thoughts alone and keep your heart strong. To perfect our love, difficulties are stretched out before us like mountains. We must climb over them to victory. No thought could be so far from the truth as that our love's a dream. Kaede-san, mine's no such fickle heart as that. When I but think of love, my eyes fill with tears, weeps. Instead of sweet and delightful things, I think of difficulties and struggles. I think of the hundredfold pilgrimage. Love's a pilgrimage. It's the daily pilgrimage. Looks fixedly into Kaede's face, then folds her tightly in his arms. You're distracted over the contamination of your body. I know how you feel. It must be unbearable. At the thought of it, I too have reeled. I've not been able to sleep nights. I've lain in an agony of thought. But I've conquered that agony. It's not your sin. It's your misfortune. It's unjust to blame you. It's the sin of others. You're grieving thus because of the injury done you by others. For that, you're about to deny yourself the happiness of a lifetime. What's this? I curse this fact. It's terrible. It's unreasonable. It's all the work of demons. Oh, I defy these devils. Clenches his fists. Kaede. They're all demons. They're heartless devils. Every night they come and force indignities upon me. They're none of them to be denied. Yuyen. On that beautiful little body. Oh. Staggers. Kaede supporting Yuyen. Yuyen sama. Yuyen sama. Yuyen. Beasts. I can't go on like this. To Kaede. I must protect you from the claws of the demons. I must rescue you from that horrible situation at once. Be brave. You mustn't lose heart. Before long, before long, I'll help you out. Kaede. But the body once defiled can never again... Yuien. Don't say that sort of thing any more. By no means feel restrained before me on account of that. For it's not your sin. That's not all. Even if you yourself had been guilty of the worst of vile sins in the past, I should pardon them and love you. Kaede, with tears in her eyes. Oh, do you love me so much as that? Yuien, taking her in his arms convulsively. I love you eternally. You're my life. Kaede, pressing her face against Yuien's bosom. Please love me forever. Yuien, forever, forever. Both are silent. The sound of children singing comes from beyond the thicket. Then four children enter. They are all girls. They have towels on their heads and carry a large basket. Yuyen and Kaede separate. First child singing. Flower of bog rhubarb, grow to ten, and I will grow to twenty-one. Second child. I found one. Picks a rhubarb flower. Third child. Here's another. Fourth child. Put it in. Holds out the basket. See how many we've got. The children stop a moment looking silently at Yuien and Kaede. Then they go here and there, searching and picking flowers. They sing as they pick. Kaede looks intently at them. First child. Here's a bottle brush. Second child. Is it? Looks. Sure enough. Let's all pick bottle brushes. First child, singing with a bottle brush in her hand. Picking one to start with, goes on searching. They all look for bottle brushes. 
Second child. I see one. Sings. I add a second to it. Third child. Here's another. It's a big one. Fourth child. I've got one too. Mine's bigger. Third child. Let's compare. They hold the flowers side by side and compare their lengths. Fourth child. Mine's a little longer. Third child. That's disappointing. First child. All come and see. Here are some Jizo-san with little bibs on. The others go where the first child is and look at the Jizo. They all laugh. Second child. They look like babies, don't they? Strokes the head of a Jizo. Third child. How many are there in the row? Fourth child. Counts. Six. First child. The fourth hasn't a head, has he? Second child. Ah, I know. These are what they call the six Jizo. Third child. Who's Jizo? Fourth child. He's a Buddha, I think. First child. Then let's offer him these flowers. Take some wild chamomile from the basket and puts it before a Jizo. Second child. Let's all worship. Kneels down and clasps her hands. All the children kneel in turn and press their hands together. First child. Shan't we go over by the pagoda in that forest? Second child. Yes, let's go. They go into the grove and leave the stage singing. Kaede. Children are innocent things, aren't they? Thinks. Yuyen. They're wholly sinless. Kaede. They seem to have no troubles. Pauses. I'd like to go back to that time once more. Then I was happy when father was still alive. Yuien. You have no father, but I have no mother. Kaede. Where's your father? Yuien. He's at home alone in the country in Hitachi. Kaede. Hitachi's very far away, isn't it? Yuien. Yes. It's far in the east across more than ten provinces. Where's your mother? Kaede. In the heart of the mountains of Banshu. She's an invalid. Thinks. I wonder which is worse, to have no mother or no father. Yuien. If one has no mother, he doesn't know a thing about his clothes, and this gives him trouble. Kaede. But if one has no father, she's troubled about her living. If I'd only had a father, there'd have been no need for me to become what I am. Yuien. Let's stop. It makes me feel very bad to compare our misfortunes like this. Kaede. When I was a child, I romped about and played with my friends in utter ignorance of my family's poverty. But those days were brief. When I was thirteen, my father died, and then my mother and I had a hard time. There were times when we had nothing to eat. Meanwhile, mother became ill. After that, we found it very difficult to keep alive. It was at that time. I went out barefoot every day to a jizo, which stood at the edge of the village. I prayed madly that my mother might recover. A moment ago, when I saw the children worshipping Jizo, I thought of that time, and tears came to my eyes. Pray as I might, she never got well. Yuyen. Then did you sell your body because there was nothing else to do? Kaede. I didn't know very well what it meant to sell one's body, for I was only fourteen. A go-between came and urged me, saying that if I would go to Kyoto and serve, I could make much money. Mother said she wouldn't let me go, but I resolved to set out for Kyoto. Her mother had neither medicine nor anything else. Yuien listens in silence. With a small bundle and a cloth wrapper on my back, I was led by the go-between out of the village. My mother came out with me as far as the earth-covered corduroy bridge. When we parted, she embraced me and cried and cried. Yuien, it must have been unbearable, unbearably bitter. Kaede, after I came to Kyoto, I was worked cruelly every day. I was obliged to practice on the samisen and sing. I couldn't learn well and was beaten with the plectrum. Between lessons, everybody was after me to run errands and sweep as if they'd suffer loss if they didn't use me. Once I thought I'd rather die. Yuien. Were you driven even to that? Kaede. Yes. Once when I broke a dish, they scolded me cruelly and persistently. They abused me, calling me a dog and a pale-faced monkey. Even then I swept the garden without a word for if I'd answered back, I'd have had a bad time of it. I took my dustpan and went out into the riverbed to throw away the trash, and I stood staring at the running water for a long time. It was then I thought I'd do away with myself. Yuien, naturally. Kaede, but for big sister, I should have died in those days. Yuien, was Asaka-san good to you? Kaede, yes. She took care of me in private and public. Pauses. 
After a younger girl came, I had it a little easier. But then I was forced to do abominable things. Yuien. No more of that. No more of that. Shuts his eyes. Kaede. Forgive me. There's no one but you to whom I can tell such things. I just drifted into talking about my personal affairs. Yuien. Never mind that. I'm only troubled because I don't know what to say to comfort you. Please bear up patiently. That's all I can say. You're not alone in sadness. The superior, even, and Zenlan sama too, are suffering from deep and unbearable sadness, though, of course, over other troubles. Still, they bear up and live. You mustn't die. It's wrong to die. No matter how great your trouble, it's wrong to die. The superior says self-destruction's worse than murder. We must hold in the highest reverence the life given us by Buddha. It's often harder to live in this burning house of a world than to die. The superior says that if we don't die at such times but bear up, faith becomes possible in us. Kaede. Can even such a one as I attain to faith? Yuyen. To be sure you can, being pure as you are. Kaede. I have no learning at all. Yuyen. Such things have nothing to do with faith. It's enough to have a heart that responds to sadness and love. Kaede. What shall I do? Yuyen. You prayed to Jizo-san that your mother might recover from her illness, didn't you? But she didn't recover. Then did you feel resentment toward Jizo-san? Kaede. Yes, I did. Yuyen. At such a time, not cursing the Buddha, you should have the faith to say, though this sorrow's come upon me, it's but the punishment for some previous sin of mine. But Buddha loves me, and he'll save me sometime. That's faith, for it's the truth. That compassionate superior would not lie. Kaede. Will Buddha save even a despised and contaminated woman like me? Yuyen. Of course he will. He forgives and saves people no matter how bad they may be. Kaede. I'm glad. Since I've been with you, I've gradually come to pray for the beautiful and good, and am almost able to believe. In the past, I saw and heard nothing but flattery and deception. I resigned myself in the belief that no such thing as love existed in this world. But recently I've begun to feel that I can wait for, hope for, and believe in the warmth of the love that enfolds me. I've begun to feel as if a bright light from somewhere has entered into me. Yuien, the people you've been thrown in with have been bad. From now on you must think of bright and beautiful things. Kaede, men like you are fortunate. Every day you sit beside the noble superior, listening to his pure words, and before Buddha reciting the sutras. What hateful work is my daily round compared with yours? I loathe it with all my heart. Yuyen. I think from the bottom of my heart that to be beside the superior is a great blessing. But in a temple, all's not pure, and there are many detestable men among priests. Temples and priests are not such great things. The important thing is a believing heart. I'll teach you everything I've learned from the superior. And what's more, I by no means mean to leave you forever where you are now. Kaede, please find a good way to really bring this about quickly and lead me to be a good woman. Yuyen, could I do anything else? Raises his shoulders. Kaede, I've somehow become glad. Looks lovingly into Yuyen's face. Truly, keep me beside you always, won't you please? Yuyen, I truly will. Kaede, oh, I'm glad, and I'll take good care of you. An evening bell booms. She stands up. For today I must go back. Yuyen. Stay just a little longer. Kaede. But if I'm late, I'll get into trouble again. Yuyen. Then just a little, until the evening sun goes down behind that camphor tree. I'll not let you go. Makes as if to stop her. Kaede sitting down. I don't want to go at all either. They are silent for a moment. Yuyen. Kaede-san. Kaede. What? Yuyen. Kaede-san, 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 Kaede. My, opens her eyes wide. Yuien, I want to call your name over and over and over again. No matter how often I call it, I can never grow tired of it. Kaede tearfully, I'll never leave you, not unto the grave. Yuien, when I think of love, I don't want to die. I want to live forever. Kaede, but men all die, don't they? Look at the many graves here. Yuyen. Ever since I fell in love, death's plagued me strangely. As if to himself. 
love and fate and death all have something in common that makes me feel their eternity thoughtfully possibly i may die young kaede why yuien i'm weak of body kaede is that possible both fall silent for a moment already the sun hangs on the camphor tree she gets up yuien oh we can't help it stands up kaede then i'll go yuien when'll we meet again kaede i can't fix a time i'll tell you by letter later yuien as soon as you can kaede yes you'll surely come for it yuien surely a whistle kaede what'll you do now when you get back to the temple yuien i'll pray to buddha in the vesper service kaede ah probably i'll have to sing again sighs then speaks resolutely it can't be helped then sayonara yuien sayonara they embrace then separate and kaede goes off behind the thicket yuien stands dazed then sits down on the stump oh i'm lonely lonely puts his face in his hands and sits silently resting his head on his elbows end of act four scene one recording by expatriate in bangor maine act four scene two of the priest and his disciples by karata hyakuzo translated by glenn william shaw eighteen eighty six to nineteen sixty one this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine act four scene two persons in the scene kaede asaka murahagi a harlot sumino a harlot a waitress asaka's room the decorations are somewhat antique a candle offering is burning in a little buddhist shrine kimono are hanging on a clothes rack two samisen hang on the wall one of them in a bag a lighted lantern a mirror stand and a brazier there is a railing on the side toward the river it is the evening of the same day asaka murahagi and sumino are playing flower cards for a moment they play in silence murahagi hello the maple if we're not careful asaka san will get the blue banners sumino i won't make a slip she needs a chrysanthemum asaka i'll make it surely murahagi there an iris i've thrown in three sumino oh you're playing a fine game aren't you murahagi there aren't many cards left asaka turning a card here's the chrysanthemum frowning a little hello that's a boar it's a polonia blank sumino that's too bad murahagi turning a card here's a chrysanthemum it is sumino that spoils the blues asaka that's vexing murahagi laughing i'm sorry they play round in silence sumino that's all they count their points enter the waitress waitress sumino san they've been calling you in the parlor for some time sumino i'll go right away to murahagi that makes ten months there are two left aren't there i guess i'll finish while we're at it waitress they're very tired of waiting murahagi if you don't go at once it'll be bad for you afterwards sumino can't be helped can it waitress then please come immediately goes out sumino then i'll go i'll play with you some time later goes out murahagi shall we two play asaka dejectedly let's leave the flower cards putting up the cards i've done nothing but lose tonight thanks this year my star doesn't seem at all lucky murahagi it doesn't feel good to be beaten even at such a thing as flower cards does it asaka not a bit murahagi haven't you been unwell of late asaka why murahagi somehow you don't look well you're always downcast asaka it's my nature murahagi you've grown a little thin asaka have i murahagi you take things too hard turn happy-go-lucky like me asaka but everything's full of misery murahagi that's true enough but in our position when once we begin to worry about things there's no end to it 
Asaka. There isn't for a fact. Murahagi. At first I too thought and thought and grieved and grieved as you do. For a while after I came, I did nothing but cry. But cry as I might, nothing came of it at all. So, convinced that it was a dead loss to go on brooding, I made up my mind to abandon thinking altogether. I decided to be satisfied if I could but get somehow through each day. Because if I should begin to worry about the future, I'd be so lonely I simply couldn't go on like this. Asaka. I think I'd like to get to feel as you do. Moreover, there's nothing else to do. But perhaps it's my worrying nature. Things get on my nerves fearfully. Pauses. I, too. I don't worry about the future so much any more. But today I've lost heart and am so lonely I don't know what to do. Murahagi. Really, you're a melancholy soul, aren't you? When talking to you, even I'm drawn in and feel lonely. And I think again of the unhappiness that, rather than having forgotten, I'm trying hard to forget. Pauses. Come, let's quit. Let's quit this sort of depressing talk. Isn't this the merry springtime? Let's talk about something more joyous. Asaka. Really, it is a spring evening, isn't it? Murahagi. The streets are spring-like and very gay. Early this evening, when I was out in the window, amid the sound of light-seeming clogs, the people passing outside the grating talked of the cherry flowers. Asaka. They'll be out in no time now, I suppose. Murahagi. Let's all go out flower-viewing for a day. Asaka. It would be nice. Falls to brooding. Murahagi. Come to think of it. Hasn't Kaede-san got back yet? Asaka. No, not yet. Murahagi. I wonder where she went. Asaka. When she left, she said she was just going over to worship at Kiyomizu for a moment. Murahagi. She's awfully late, isn't she? Asaka. She'll probably be back in a minute. Anyway, she's only a child yet. Murahagi. It doesn't look just that way, I tell you. Pauses. The truth is, mother got angry and told me about her. Asaka. What did she say? Murahagi. She said, Kaede's way of doing things is impertinent. She gives herself to such a fellow as that overgrown priestling and neglects the house's business. It's too presuming to amuse oneself with a girl in the business without paying for it. The other guests are treated shabbily, and I'm so troubled I don't know what to do. And there's that Asaka. Asaka. Did she talk about me too? Murahagi. Yes. She said Asaka seems to be helping them to get together. It's wrong of her when she ought to be looking after her little sister. Asaka. Did she say that? Murahagi. She was angry, I'll tell you. If you don't watch out and that mother gets angry again, you'll have a lot of trouble. Asaka. I'll tell you. Falls into a reverie. Murahagi. I think Kaede is young, and it's natural for her to get like that. I'm not without my own memories, but she's too impertinent, though in the business she wants to love just like a virgin. Asaka. To mother that must be a trouble, but don't you see? Murahagi. Anyway, it's no good for the business, and Kaede-san doesn't tell us anything but goes about it all secretly. If she'd say this and this is true and ask it, I myself am not one who'd refuse to fix things up and bring them together once or twice. But that way of hers is not becoming. Asaka. Since she's having a good time in secret without getting any money, she probably feels guilty and can't tell. Murahagi. But she's too proud. Today, since she was sneaking out quietly, I asked her where she was going, and she looked innocent and said, Just over there. Because it riled me a little, I said, Yes, just over to the temple, I suppose. And I told her how mother was angry and she mustn't neglect her work. Then wasn't her remark detestable? I'm not doing anything wrong. I look at things a little differently from you. So it's all right and you please let me alone. That's what she said. Asaka. Did she say that? When she comes back, I'll give her a good talking to. So please don't be offended, but forgive her. For by nature, she's gentle. Murahagi. She looks upon us too lightly. Asaka. She's been brooding recently, too, and her nerves are on end. When she talked like that, it was probably because she'd thought herself to her wit's ends. Murahagi, you spoil her too much. Mother said so recently. Kaede's pride's due to Asaka's training, she said. Asaka, it's no such thing. Murahagi, anyway, it'll be well for you to warn her a little. Everybody says so, for if you're mild with her, she gets stuck up. Asaka, I'll warn her. Please forgive her. Tears come into her eyes. Murahagi. There's nothing for me to forgive or not to forgive. I just told you by the way. 
I don't think it's good for Kaede to go on as she is. Asaka. Thanks. Bites her lip. Murahagi. You needn't take it so much to heart. Then I'll be in again. Stands up. Asaka. Oh, can't you stay a little longer? Murahagi. I'll see you again. I got interested in the flower cards and haven't done my evening dressing yet. Asaka. That's so. Then come again. Murahagi goes out. Asaka sits absent-mindedly for a little. Finally, she puts the flower cards in the box. Then she loses herself in thought again. Soon coming back to herself, she gets up and going over to the mirror stand sits down before it. Asaka looking into the mirror. Really, I do look a little thin. Puts her hand to her cheek. It's not surprising if I am. Takes a comb out of a drawer in the stand and begins to comb her hair. Why do I fix myself up like this? That I should have to beautify my face to flatter the detestable men who come to trifle with me, to flatter my own enemies? No, now I don't think of such things, but simply through habit go every evening to my mirror. That was still well enough while I yet believed in my own charms. Pauses. How my hair comes out, cleaning the hair from the comb, making capital of one's weak body, using it unreasonably and taking out of it every ounce of work it can do, and then, when it can no longer work, trembles. Ah, I won't think of that. I won't think of that. The sound of a hand drum comes in from another room. Enter Kaede. Seeing Asaka, she weeps aloud. Asaka going near Kaede and looking at her intently. Kaede-san, what's the matter? Kaede-san. Kaede, it's too much. It's too much. Trembles. Her ornamental hairpin falls out. Asaka, what's the matter? All at once. Puts the hairpin back for her. Come, sit down. Sits Kaede down beside the brazier and takes her place beside her. Kaede suppressing her tears. Mother scolded me cruelly. When I came home, she called me. It's my fault. I came back late, but I couldn't get back. Anyway, she spoke too cruelly. Asaka, I thought that was probably it. Kaede, she railed at me mercilessly as if she'd lay hands on me. She used the cruelest words she could. I don't care. Anyway, when I'm up against her, I'm like a weak little worm. Whatever I say, it's no use, and I'm used to scoldings now. But she said things about him so bad that I couldn't sit by and listen. Asaka. About Yuyen sama too? Kaede. She said a man who enjoys himself without paying is just like a thief. She compared him to a thieving cat that snatches fish from the kitchen asaka my she was nasty kaede i was so angry that i said no that man's pure and gentle as a dove then she said you'll talk back will you and struck me with her pipe asaka she struck you kaede yes here with all her might she rubs her knee and she said i couldn't go out at all any more asaka she's cruel she's always rough but it's going too far to strike you when it seems it would be enough to warn you. Kaede. murahagi sans surely peached to her. Tonight she was by her putting in one ill-natured sarcasm and biting remark after another. Kaede. murahagi san too? For them all to band together and abuse a little girl like you? Pauses. murahagi san was here until a little while ago talking to me. She was angry because, she said, you're proud and despise your elder sisters and she doesn't like it because you don't confide in her kaede horrible to confide in that woman could i bring myself to talk frivolously of the precious love i treasure in my heart to that light and heartless busybody truly you're the only one the only one to whom i tell everything moreover what she says about my being proud may be so for all i know once you told me didn't you you hate a woman who no matter what her position has no pride of any sort in her heart asaka tearfully you remember well ah but for a harlot whom men consider the meanest of beings it may be foolish to think of such things kaede san i have nothing to say i only love you there's nothing to do but bear everything nothing but to be resigned ah how lonely is the feeling of resignation kaede i understand sister grows tearful without you i don't know what would have become of me ere now in my heart i fold my hands in prayer they fall silent there is no sound but the thump of the hand drum kaede goes to the railing and looks out sister come see the moon's coming up over higashiyama 
asaka going to kaede's side and leaning on the railing the outline of the mountain's grown a little bright hasn't it kaede how beautiful are the lights on the opposite bank asaka there are a few people on the bridge aren't there kaede when i look on a scene like that i feel strangely drawn to people they stand for a while looking at the night view in silence asaka where did you meet him today kaede in the cemetery behind the tomb of the saint at kurodani asaka were you glad smiles kaede of course but our pain's greater than our happiness and we cried asaka why kaede when we two are together we become sad naturally and for some reason or other he weeps easily asaka because he's gentle when you meet what do you talk about smiles kaede happily we talk about all sorts of things how we've longed to see each other our letters our lives the future asaka seriously what do you say about the future kaede that we'll get married rapidly i say i'm not worthy i ask him to cast me off because of what i am but he says he'll marry me in spite of everything he says that in the shin sect priests may have wives asaka then he doesn't care about your bodily pollution kaede no when he thought of that his anguish was so great he couldn't sleep nights but he conquered that anguish he says the pollution of your body isn't your sin it's your misfortune and that's not all but he says though of your own accord you had polluted your body i'd forgive and love you asaka tearfully his is indeed a sincere and warm heart kaede yuyen sama's sincere even when with me sometimes his talk becomes serious as a sermon and i like to listen to such talk i like him best when with sober face he's telling me about things i don't understand very well about beauty and truth asaka smiling then haven't you done anything yet kaede seriously no there's nothing of that kind asaka really there's not another man like that in the world treasure him kaede i do i feel unworthy asaka i too like him from the bottom of my heart if you were carrying on with some hateful and low fellow i'd refuse to handle your letters for you but with him it's different kaede you've truly helped me greatly yuyan sama likes you too recently he asked me many things about you anxiously and many times over he said he was grateful asaka the other night everything went fine when i chanced to go out to the gate he was walking about in the moonlight i felt such pity that the tears came into my eyes i ran to him and said haven't you something for kaede san and he said please give her this and handing me a letter hastened off in the other direction kaede he said if you hadn't met him that time he'd probably have passed the whole night loitering about asaka he wouldn't hesitate to do that smiles but i've got a good job haven't i kaede my do you say such things smiles asaka suddenly looking gloomy how do you intend to meet him after this kaede looking worried i wonder i'm worried to death about it after mother's attitude tonight she probably won't let me out at all and yuyan sama can't come here asaka not unless he raises the money kaede however much money he might have i wouldn't be bought with it by him only today we vowed i that i wouldn't think of him as a guest and he that he'd treat me as a maiden he said again and again that i mustn't think of myself as ignoble asaka then there's nothing for you to do but give up the business is there kaede yuyen sama says he'll soon help me do that asaka hm thanks has he anything in view do you suppose kaede uneasily i wonder asaka though he's sincere the affairs of the world by no means run in a straight line kaede he doesn't know the first thing about the world he hasn't as much discernment as i have asaka that's probably true indeed kaede he said he'd confess to the superior and talk it over with him that seems to be his only dependence asaka to that shinran sama kaede yes he says the superior doesn't hold that priests shouldn't love he says he helps him in everything he says he doesn't despise any woman because she's a harlot asaka i've heard from zenran sama that he knows everything but still kaede sister what do you suppose will come of me asaka i wonder they say that not all the disciples are good 
Kaede. Truly, I'm utterly forlorn. Asaka. Even if you are to marry him, in the meantime, how'll you meet him? Kaede. Since there's no other way, we've agreed that he's to go round into the riverbed and give a signal from the stone steps, and I'll go out by the back entrance and we'll exchange letters. If we're slow and get caught, it'll be awful, but anyway, I'll see his face for a moment. Asaka. Do you want to meet as badly as that? Kaede. Even for a glimpse. Pauses. Yuyen sama says he spends many sleepless nights. He thinks that much of even such a thing as I. Asaka kindly. Is that why you love him with body and soul? Kaede. Yes. Nods tearfully. Asaka changing her mood. It'll all come out right. I'll pray for that. When I spoke, I meant that it probably couldn't happen at once. All sorts of difficulties may come up, but if your two hearts are only firm, your desire will surely be fulfilled. Perseverance is the first thing. Kaede, I'll persevere through any anguish. Asaka, you must make your spirit strong. Mine soon grows weak and I'm useless. You must protect your own happiness with courage. Everybody treats a gentle person selfishly and takes lightly from him forever that which he treasures above his life. In calling it justice, they make him bear it. Zenlan Sama's always telling me, when there's no determination to see justice through to the end, he says, the lukewarm effort to establish it rather results afterwards in trouble for others. If Zenlan had joined hearts with the girl he loved in the beginning and had fought hard for their happiness, they wouldn't all have come to grief and he needn't have wept. Again, if once one decides to sacrifice his own happiness, he must consider himself as dead and lead his whole life in loneliness and strength. But a gentle soul can't do that. At first he's entangled in justice, and afterwards he can't bear his loneliness. Pauses. He's truly unfortunate. Pauses. You mustn't give in. Kaede. I'll strive with all my might. Today Yuien too said to fight against every difficulty and win without fail. Big sister, you'll help me too, won't you? Asaka. I'll do anything for you. Kaede. I'll never forget your kindness. Her eyes filled with tears. Asaka, I feel as if you're really my little sister. Kaede, and I feel as if you're really my big sister. Asaka, do you remember how when you first came to this house, you came to my room, and putting your hands to the mats and bowing, said, henceforth I rely on your friendship? Ever since then, I've been strangely fond of you. Earlier, mother had said to me, a new girl's coming, so make her your little sister and train her. But I hadn't thought much about it. But at first glance of you, I felt an indescribable pity. You trembled bashfully, and you spoke with a country brogue. Kaede, I didn't know about anything, and was forlorn. At that time, you said you were a little unwell, and sat quietly leaning on the brazier and doing nothing. I thought you were a gentle soul. As I saw more and more of you, I came to know that there was a loneliness and sweetness about you that my other big sisters lacked, and I fell wholly in love with you. Asaka, at first you had a frightful time, didn't you? Almost more than your little body could stand. Kaede, you shielded me constantly. Asaka, how startled I was when you almost killed yourself. Kaede, you wept and stopped me and said, Don't give up, I understand everything. I also suffer the same thoughts. It's all for your mother at home. Asaka, and you understood well. Since then we've wept together as we talked over our mutual lot. Kaede, We've strung out our mutual misfortunes just as if we'd counted them. Asaka, we wondered together why we were unfortunate like this, and then, unable to figure it out, we finally decided there was nothing to do but be resigned and gave it up. Kaede, since then our intimacies increased. Asaka, telling each other everything. Kaede, looking into Asaka's face, you mustn't desert me. Asaka, indeed, you mustn't desert me. Kaede, Big sister, give me your hand. Asaka, yes, reaches out her hand. Kaede, pressing Asaka's hand to her breast. My, how cold it is. Asaka, I'm thin-blooded. The two are silent for a little. Kaede, do you hear from Zenlan-sama? Asaka, yes, sometimes. Kaede, what's he doing at home? Asaka, he's sitting in a temple as usual. He says in his letters that he worships Buddha conventionally, but since he's not able at all to really believe, his heart's simply growing more and more forlorn. Kaede. He's the most lonely man in the world, isn't he? The more I saw of him, the more I was made to feel 
How great was the burden of unhappiness he bore way down in his heart. Asaka. He really came up to Kyoto because he wanted to meet his father. But considering many things, such as his father's welfare and the feelings of the disciples and his relatives, he finally decided not to go to him. Kaede. Then he must have gone back home with a lonely heart, didn't he? Asaka. It was more pitiful than lonely. Pauses. But thanks to Yuien-sama, he learned his father's feelings well and was greatly relieved. He said, separated, we'll pray for each other's happiness. It's the common duty of man to make all men his neighbors and pray thus. No matter how much people may love each other, they can't be together always. They can't do other than live apart and commune in prayer. It's the same with us. We must soon part. When we'll be able to meet again, I don't know. Though we part, please pray for me. I, too, will pray for you. Kaede. Zenlan-sama liked Yuien-sama very much, didn't he? Asaka. He called him the warmest and purest of men and was always praising him. Kaede. And Yuien-sama said he couldn't see why everybody spoke ill of Zenlan-sama. Asaka. He's out of tune because his good heart's been bruised. If the heart once goes wrong, it can never get back to its original nature again, you see? To bring it back, warming and moistening love must ever be near that devastated heart. Yet his surroundings not only are loveless, but overflow with curses and contempt. Kaede. And he's not a man who can ignore the condemnation of others, though he says things that seem strong. Once he asked me seriously whether I thought him a good or a bad man, and when I answered that I'd never known a man with so good a heart, he asked if I really thought that. So I said I wouldn't flatter him, and he grew tearful. Kaede, he said, I'm really a good man. Don't think me a scoundrel such as everybody in his abuse makes me out to be. It was the night of the very day he forced me to drink sake in the parlor and acted badly. Asaka, he's a man whose depth becomes more evident the longer one knows him. I've never seen another guest of his worth. Kaede, what sort of relation is there between you and Zenlan-sama anyway? Even now I don't know well. Asaka, laughing dismally. It's different from that between you and Yuien-sama. We're both old. Kaede, but you both loved each other, didn't you? Asaka, we did indeed. Kaede, then why did you part like that? Asaka, that's the loneliness of life. We both grown into the lonely dispositions that can do like that, though you can't understand now. Kaede, can't I? But you're always thinking of him, aren't you? Asaka, of course I am. Kaede, when'll he come to Kyoto next? Asaka, I don't know. Kaede, you must be lonely. Asaka, tearfully, I'm used to that loneliness. Kaede, I somehow feel forlorn. Enter the waitress. Waitress, Kaede-san, money, come quick as you are. Kaede, ah, I hate it. I don't want to go tonight. I don't feel like the parlor. Asaka, still put up with it and go. After what's just happened, if you didn't go, mother'd be terrible. Kaede, there's no way out of it. Sits down before the mirror stand touches up her face a little and directly stands up. Then excuse me. Asaka going back to the brazier. Hurry back. Kaede goes out. Asaka is still for a moment. She levels off the ashes with the tongs. Ah, the fire seems to have gone out before I was aware. Sighs. My heart's just like these ashes. My youthful passion's gone. I can't possibly love as Kaede does. Even my tears for my own unhappiness have begun to dry up. The heart to complain, too, is gradually dying out. I hope for nothing. Still, I can't die. I simply keep on with things mechanically and without interest. What's left? What? Only a heart to endure pain, old age, and death. And after that? Ah, I know nothing. It's too dismal. Falls forward and weeps. Then after a little lifts her face and looks about hazily. There must be somebody who can help me. Really somebody. Curtain End of Act 4, Scene 2. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Act 5, Scene 1 of The Priest and His Disciples by Kurata Hyakuzo. Translated by Glenn William Shaw, 1886 to 1961. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Act 5, Scene 1 Persons in the Scene 
yuien six priests an acolyte the main hall a vast room full of great round pillars back centre an altar to right and left sliding doors designed in antique elegance candle offerings blaze in the light dishes a surrounding passage it connects with the living quarters and the holy of holies hanging in the side gallery a bell it is an evening late in spring one month after the events in act four six priests sit before the altar chanting a vesper service sutra they are nearly done priests chanting together shakamuni butso no ijinan keu shiji no o shaba kokudo go joku akse ko joku ken joku bono joku shujo joku myochu joku toku anokutara san myaku san bodai isho shujo setsu ze isai seken nan shin shiho sharihotsu to chiga ogo joku akse gyo shi nanji toku anokutara san myaku san bodai i isai seken setsu shi nan shin shi ho ze ijinan butsu setsu shi kyo i shari hotsu kyushu biku isai seken tenin ashura to mon butsu sho setsu kan kishinju sarai niko bell busetsu amida kyo bell first priest namu amida butsu priest together namu amida butsu namu amida butsu namu amida butsu note this is the end of the sutra called the amida kyo for the purposes of the play it is more effective in the japanese than in english abounding in sinico japanese derived from the ancient kingdom of wu and in religious terms borrowed from the sanskrit it is not when recited wholly intelligible to the average japanese layman it may be rendered into english as follows sakyamuni the buddha accomplished the most difficult and rare thing in this world in this evil life of the five impurities the impurity of time disintegration the impurity of self-discrimination the impurity of the passions the impurity of life degeneration and the impurity of slaughter for self-preservation he attained enlightenment for the sake of all living creatures he preached this doctrine heart of belief to all the people in the world shari hotsu you surely know that i in this world of the five impurities did this difficult thing and reached enlightenment and for the sake of all the world i preach this law most difficult to believe since it is very hard to understand i deliver this sutra shari hotsu and all the brethren all the people in the world the angels and the demons heard what the buddha taught and they were filled with joy and believed and bowing low they retired bell the amida sutra the teaching of buddha bell End note they repeat this invocation several times then all bow in adoration and become silent standing up they go in silence to right and left opening the sliding doors and going out the stage is deserted for a moment enter an acolyte he rings the evening bell this takes two minutes he goes out without a word enter yuien pale and with bloodshot eyes yuien the service seems to be over sighs the clear sound of wooden clappers is heard ah listens the clappers are being struck for supper in the living quarters falls down before the altar ah peace has fled from my soul quiet that calm and harmonious soul of mine where can it have fled how peaceful it was as i knelt before this sutra stand alone in this hall and offered up my prayer each evening what can have happened to my spirit which was softly fragrant as the smoke of incense rising from that censer i protected that quiet as if folding it in my narrow bosom with my arms pauses of late how foolish i've been my heart's always stirred up and hungry how many sleepless nights i've passed with my soul in disorder i'm tending to neglect even the morning and evening services my soul's in restless confusion just like a stray dog yes today the mistress at the matsunoya tauntingly called me a stray dog trembles she said that a hungry-faced man who feared the eyes of others and would come sneaking in at the back entrance 
was like a homeless dog oh i was standing timidly at the back door dressed in this black robe and all red in the face though insulted not able to say a word my miserable form must have looked even like a dog's even like a begging dog's weeps enter three priests yuien hides his tears rises and makes as if to go first priest yuien dono yuien yes stand still first priest i want to talk to you a moment please wait second priest we've been waiting for you to come third priest just sit down the three priests sit down yuien sitting down in fear have you some business with me you're so formal first priest in truth there's a matter about which we would inquire looks at yuien's face what's wrong with you your colour's terrible second priest your eyes are bloodshot yuien sits dumb third priest where have you been to-day yuien to kiyamachi it took me long first priest where in kiyamachi yuien does not answer second priest you've neglected the temple services repeatedly yuien i'm sorry tears come into his eyes third priest you must take care fourth priest though you're still young second priest no especially when young one should be full of devotion when young we studied with all our might getting up before sunrise in the morning we sat in quiet meditation and strengthened our souls till breakfast at night we studied the sutras till late and sometimes we didn't know when the moon hung in the daybreak sky we never thought of such a thing as neglecting the services third priest because anyhow we had different aims than the young disciples of this day it's truly matter for regret that this habit of negligence has grown up in this way that one who wears the black garb should think of a woman ah there i've said it at last first priest nay we must say what should be said though we've been silent till to-day it's no good for you Iandono, if we let the matter go indefinitely first of all it's a pollution of the law speaks more intensely yuien dono to-day you were at the matsunoya in kiyamachi weren't you second priest and with a harlot called kaede or some such name yuien preserves silence third priest we know everything all your frequent leaves when you said you were going to visit the rokakudo or the grave at kurodani were for the purpose of meeting that woman secretly weren't they yuien i'm sorry i'm sorry second priest i've long thought that your manner was strange nay now there's not a disciple who's not aware of it whenever there are three together they whisper about you third priest the younger disciples are envious of you you see though we old men don't mind as i passed through the waiting-room the other day i overheard them saying that yuien dono was a lucky man being with peculiar emphasis the favourite disciple of the superior and the beloved of a beautiful woman second priest chaffingly they say behind your back that you're the major general in black yuien biting his lip are you making game of me second priest no people say that becomes serious if the superior says nothing you must restrain yourself the more i think it's not right to take advantage of his gentleness and do as you like third priest if it were a gentlewoman it might not be so bad but that you should concern yourself with a low-down harlot a priest it's shameful yuien though she's a harlot she's a pure-hearted woman second priest exchanging glances with third priest you're deceived the proverb says there's no truth in a courtesan what a harlot says is not to be relied upon yuien but she just she is not such a woman i rather fear lest i may harm her third priest what you're still young aren't you nothing so easy as to deceive you she has only to put a hand on your knee and let fall a tear that's all yuien i believe in her second priest what though she should really feel some interest in you i should say it would be but curiosity in a young priest you see for you're good-looking you know yuien it's no such light thing we're bitterly in earnest every time we meet we cry when we two are together the tears come naturally third priest i'm surprised to hear that you're in earnest that you're sincere in whoring a priest nay but i'm completely astonished at the young priests of this day yuien i don't treat her as a harlot i treat her as a maiden nor does she think of herself as being purchased by me second priest 
if she's a maiden she must be a very whimsical sort a chinese book says she sees off the guest from wu in the morning in the evening welcomes the guest from yue think she has scores of other guests among them there are doubtless men richer than you distinguished in great merchant princes and warriors for her to pass over these men and give her heart especially to you you must have something to attract her but though it's rude to say so you're still a young probationer and have no money on the whole there's no quality in priests to make women love them eh hey, suppose you think it over men are self-conceited when it comes to women you know don't take it in bad part you're much excited but even as we talk like this that woman may be in the embrace of another man yuien ah that i should have that said to me excitedly i know very well that i'm worthless moreover i know perfectly that her body's contaminated but i can't doubt that her heart's truly mine third priest and your heart's also hers i dare say with a smile on his lips tens of millions of young men have said the same thing through the ages and when they had repented it was already all over with them so the superior man avoids danger from the outset a man of wisdom enjoys the charms of women within a limited circle in which his bodily safety is secure in your case you're about to plunge bodily into the danger without armour shall i call it foolish or childish anyhow playing with women's more dangerous than playing with fire yuien but aren't all things dangerous that are done in real earnest the superior has said that truth is gained only when one meets with experiences in the flesh he's even said that faith itself may be called one kind of adventure third priest for shame yuien dono assumes a harsh tone do you think whoring and faith all one second priest it's impudent to try to cover your misconduct with the name of the superior really the superior overestimates you you've been spoiled by his love third priest you're infatuated with a woman whose antecedents aren't known and neglect your service to buddha moreover with this and that you craftily defend yourself to tell the truth you ought simply to confess your fault and apologize when we were young anybody guilty of such conduct would have been considered a stain on the temple and straightway driven out second priest isn't it absurd to believe the words of a low-down harlot there's a limit even to foolishness don't you just about understand there the people commonly say turning the other way and sticking out the tongue though such words are not too elegant yuien getting angry you despise the heart of a girl too much moreover isn't it too great a generalization to think a man noble because he's a priest and a woman ignoble because she's a harlot there's impurity even in the heart of a priest there's purity even in the heart of a harlot she can love purely it's not right i think to suspect a person of being bad from the first when you don't know what sort she is a man becomes serious when he gives all his mind to one thing i've just heard what you had to say and i felt that you have no sober ideas about women isn't it that sort of thinking that's made women evil third priest do you mean to preach to us smiles cynically yuien beside himself you don't love me from the first i felt just as if my heart was stiff from contact with the chilly atmosphere you don't love me with tears in his eyes a moment ago when you used the word sticking out the tongue a mean expression came about your mouth when she said she was unclean and with tears in her eyes and her hands clasped confessed her shame and apologized she made me feel her saintliness to speak truth she's recently become a pious woman sometimes i even think i'm blessed when bathed in the light of her pure religious feelings second priest you'd better worship her instead of buddha yuien standing up i'll take my leave starts to go third priest shouting do as you like first priest checking him don't be rough yuien dono just wait a moment please yuien sitting down i'm wretched tears come to his eyes first priest don't you think that what you're doing is wrong yuien i don't think it's so bad as you say first priest then why do you lie and go out yuien makes no answer after all there's something wrong though since you're young it's not unnatural i think and i don't speak severely but you'd better consider a little for it affects the deportment of the other young disciples yuien it's been very wrong of me to tell lies and go out it's been wrong of me not to confess frankly to the superior 
My heart's always accused me. First Priest. Did you say to confess frankly to the superior? Yuien. Yes, without the least concealment. First Priest. You have grand ideas, don't you? Second Priest. There's a limit even to audaciousness. Third Priest. There's no telling how angry he'd be. Yuien. But the superior hasn't said that we mustn't love. Second Priest. It's surely not likely he told you to love a harlot. Yuien. But he said it was wrong to despise one because she is a harlot. First Priest. Though our sect doesn't hate marriage, that refers to men and women who marry in the proper way, not illicit intercourse between the sexes. Especially you must know, I think, whether it's good or bad, to dally in secret with a harlot. Yuien. It was quite wrong for me to go to her secretly. I acknowledge it. I won't offend again. Please forgive me. These days I'm always thinking. But I'm always in doubt about what relations between men and women are the truest. Sometimes I even wonder if the illicit sort may not really be the truest. Second priest. I'm surprised at you. Yu Yen. I mean to marry her. Third priest. That harlot? Yu Yen. Yes, we've exchanged fast vows. Second priest. I'm astonished that you should say such a thing soberly. First priest. Have you considered well? Yu Yen. Yes, so well that I haven't been able to sleep nights. Second priest. And you say the result is your arrival at this decision, do you? At this sensual decision? I'm surprised. I'm ashamed. Aren't you bewitched by something? Third priest. It's apostasy. It's dreadful pauses this is surely the temptation of the devil yu yen sighs first priest yu yen dono i'll not go on repeating forever for i know your undeviating character i believe i've always loved you i'll speak just once more please think calmly and composedly you're excited since love blinds even the eyes of wise men i can't but think for the temple and the law besides i must take into consideration hundreds of young disciples that flock of sheep easily led astray i understand the heart of youth i don't think it unnatural that you should find women lovely for that matter there would be no trouble about your making a suitable maiden of good family your wife well, fortunately this sect doesn't condemn matrimony i have in mind a suitable person but it's outside all reason to marry a harlot of unknown antecedents in these days the public's clamorously condemning the doctrine of resignation of our sect saying that it tolerates evil conduct if at such a time the young people who waits upon the superior should marry a harlot it would become a pretext for an attack upon us by the enemies of buddha the devotion of the young disciples would be dulled usually you're quick you must see the reason in this if you don't change your mind i won't have you in this temple or else i shall leave myself but probably you'll give up your idea and not occasion me that pain i'm convinced i love you you see don't you you yendono no doubt you're excited now you'll probably decide to give her up please give her up altogether and hello you're crying second priest you're not a woman are you third priest no he must have given her up so he may feel bad yuien i can't give her up i've already thought it all out i've considered the temple the law and the other disciples but i can't desert her she's without guilt i can find no reason for deserting her i can't possibly think that love's bad if it's bad why do tears and thankfulness go along with its emotions my heart of love for her is filled with sincerity love flows shining through my breast warm gladness drenches all my body i feel that now indeed i live ah if you only knew how truly we love each other i want to live cherishing the longing that gushes forth from my heart so long as that desire isn't bad i feel i can't possibly give it up the superior has taught me religion is the determination in a man to preserve unto the grave those hopes which mortals may entertain and to bring them to perfection in the land beyond the tomb that poor little girl she's fallen to the bottom of a pit and is struggling there in the slime she's given herself up for dead now the rope of her salvation comes down to her if she seizes it she's saved but she's so surrendered herself to unhappiness that she refuses it at first how i've worked to arouse in her the desire to be saved at last she's grasped the rope 
she's been pulled up to the bright brink of the land now happiness and hope are before her eyes now suddenly to cut the rope asunder oh could i do such a cruel thing could such a thing be pleasing to the heart of buddha it's unthinkable i can't do it feverishly i want to live with her always forever second priest don't you care what becomes of the temple don't you care what becomes of the law third priest or though the young disciples stumble yuien ah when it comes to that i don't know writhes second priest you must choose between the two is it love or is it the law yuien that's chaotic it's positively irrational it's unreasonable to say that one can't abide by the law except he cast away love unless one have both third priest what impertinence second priest do you think to serve both the harlot and buddha i've heard enough for shame first priest quietly you mustn't be so violent calm yourselves yuien dono you must be distressed but this pain's temporary as the days go by it'll become milder before you realize it man's heart's not so narrow as to be inflamed by but a single object the butterfly doesn't light upon just one violet now you feel that this matter is important above all things that's natural but to the eyes of us old men it's no more than the same old story of any taro finding out his ohana yuien angered i'd be ashamed to think such a thing first priest you'd better not get excited like that as an old man speaking to a young man like you i well i only said that it was that sort of thing there's no use arguing with you further there's nothing for us to do but carry out our intention but i ask you just once more do you positively refuse to give up that harlot yuien positively first priest then it can't be helped to the other two since it's useless to talk further let's go gets up the other two get up the three make to go yuien grasping the robe of the first priest what will you do first priest i can't stay in the same temple with you i'll ask the superior to decide which of us must go yuien that's too much just wait a minute first priest i've said all i had to say pulls his robe away there's nothing else to do the three priests go off yuien looks after them vacantly and sighs what shall i do i didn't think love was such a painful thing this anxiety is practically without end and i feel heavy in spirit as if my soul were under a burden pauses but the profound joy that wells up out of the midst of that anxiety that quivering tear engendering death inviting gladness madly kaede san kaede san kaede san looks about him as if startled by his own voice becomes thoughtful but can it be that i'm mistaken may i not be in the grip of some invisible power looks at the altar the flickering flame of that candle seems to be whispering something to my heart that compassionate face probably sees my misery and wretchedness i know nothing whether i'm doing right or wrong what may become of me and to think how strictly i've judged others heretofore without so much as knowing how weak and miserable i was myself though a moment ago i spoke so positively i somehow feel like a man whose every act's unforgivable o oh, compassionate buddha folding his hands in supplication forgive me i beseech thee curtain end of act five scene one recording by expatriate in bangor maine act five scene two of the priest and his disciples by karata hyakuzo translated by glenn william shaw eighteen eighty six to nineteen sixty one this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine act five scene two persons in the scene shinlan yuien the three priests shinlan shonin's room the stage is the same as in act three scene two it is the night of the same day the three priests are talking to shinlan shinlan i was somewhat aware of it myself but i was watching in silence for in such a case it's not well for others to make too much of a fuss first priest we've thought the same and shut our eyes to it up to today. 
and we put down the excitement among the young disciples. We thought that before long Yuien Dono would take thought for his own conduct, but it simply grows worse and worse. Second priest. Daily his waywardness grows upon him. He makes some excuse and goes out, and he comes back late and tends to neglect the service. Third priest. He's always sighing and coming into the reception room with eyes swollen with weeping and moping about the living quarters, so that the other disciples, finding it too much for their eyes, are talking busily. First priest. A man who had seen Yuien Dono loafing around the back of a tea house in Kiyamachi came and told us. He says he was confused and made an agitated and ignoble figure. The tea house is angry because he goes and takes his pleasure stealthily without paying. It's become impossible for me to control the young disciples. Second priest. They say the girl's a young seventeen-year-old harlot named Kaede, or something, at the tea house called the Matsunoya. It seems to have been going on since the autumn of last year. It appears that Yuien Dono often went secretly to see Zenlan-sama there when he was in Kyoto. He met her then, it seems. Anyway, it's a troublesome matter. Third priest. Today again he came back late after the service was over. When we went into the main hall, he was crouching before the altar crying. His face was pale, his eyes were wild, and he presented an extraordinary appearance. We thought it would not be for his good to let him go on thus forever, so we admonished him kindly. First priest. We counseled him earnestly, explaining the good of the temple and the good of the law, but he wouldn't listen. Second priest. He doesn't seem to think his own conduct very bad. He said so himself third priest what can he mean he says he's plighted marriage vows with that harlot and he praised her to our faces first priest with kindness i pointed out to him the right and wrong of things and begged him to give her up for the sake of the law but he said positively that he never could second priest finally he said it was false to say that one could not follow both the law and love together he forgot himself and became like one insane third priest not only would he not listen to our admonitions, but he turned on us and had the effrontery to try to preach us a sermon. Second priest. Anyway, I was surprised. I was dumbfounded and ashamed. Even the long-suffering Eiran Dono finally got angry and said he couldn't remain in the same temple with Yuyan Dono. First priest. I can't bear the shame of being in the same temple with Yuyan Dono. Either he goes or I go. I've come here to ask you to decide. Shinlan is buried in thought. Second priest. The aged Eiren Dono can't go out from this familiar temple in which he's lived so long. Third priest. If you leave us now, who'll manage the young disciples? Besides, you have distinguished services. First priest. Nay, though I stay on in the temple with things as they are, I have no power to control the young disciples. Second priest. Nay, if you go, we'll be in great trouble. To Shinran. Master, so speaks Eiren Dono. There's nothing to do now but to ask your decision. The three priests watch Shinlan closely. Shinlan, I'm at fault. Pauses. That's all I clearly understand and can say fearlessly. As for other things, I can't judge clearly whether they're good or bad. Though I seem to understand a little, when I think deeply I lose my way entirely. I haven't the confidence to sit in judgment on Yuyan's sin. It seems to me wrong but I can't help feeling it's not unnatural. Thinks and thinks as he talks. I have a deep and hidden responsibility for things turning out this way. All along as I've heard you complaining of Yuyen, I felt as if my sin were being condemned. In the first place, I have no positive convictions even on the subject of the relations between men and women. It was the autumn of last year. Yuyen asked me earnestly about love. He asked such things as whether it's all right to love. I simply told him that I couldn't say whether it was right or wrong, but if he did love, to love seriously and with all his heart. When I saw his evident loneliness, I judged from my own feelings in the days of my youth and felt that I just about understood his. I felt that they could never be quelled by the advice not to love at all. At that time, I did say that love was bound up with sin, but what effect could that have on Yuyan's lonely and starving heart? He surely felt as if oil had been poured on the flames of his yearning. His loneliness became fiercer and fiercer, and then Zenlan set out a gay feast for his eyes. 
the luring passion of beautiful women appeared he yielded himself to that unconsciously having once given himself up he can't stop short of the limit he surely recalled my words love with all your heart oh i'm a sort of a better and painfully zenlon's heedless invitation that took no thought for the fate of an innocent i can't think a matter that doesn't concern me i must at all events share yuien's sin with him how can such a man as i judge him first priest what you say seems right but you think too sensitively you only went so far as to fail to forbid him to love you didn't say to love above all you didn't say to dally secretly with a harlot he interpreted your words selfishly according to his own convenience i say nothing about zenlan sama's part you had nothing to do with that yuien dono went to him without your knowledge shinlan i can't think that's all second priest if you look at it the way you say you make yourself to blame for everything shinlan you are to blame for practically everything if you look into it carefully there are saints who say if there's a single sinner in the world the responsibility is all mine by saint is meant a man whose conviction of sin is deeper than that of ordinary men pauses i did wrong as for zenlan he's clearly bad truly his is an unfortunate nature so made that it must wound others third priest then it sounds as if yuien dono is sinless shinlan yuien too is bad if you look at us on the side of badness we're all bad if on the side of reasonableness everybody's reasonable it's all the work of demons there's some excuse for the worst of sins for all sins of whatever kind are caused by the demon called karma if you look at it in that way we're not responsible but we mustn't make excuses all things that afflict ourselves and others are bad yuien too is certainly bad he's upset the tranquillity of his surroundings he's broken the repose of his own soul first priest truly that's bad that he should wound the heart of the superior from whom he's received such favors is alone unpardonable our worry the young disciple's excitement he's destroyed the peace and authority of the temple as i see it the whole trouble has its source in yuien dono alone wherefore with his care alone the peace and order of the temple can be restored and i think it his duty to bring this about nevertheless he doesn't profit by our most reasonable advice he's declared that he doesn't intend to correct his present conduct isn't that unreasonable and to make it worse he spoke in disparaging terms of us his elders when zenlan sama came to kyoto i thinking that a slip would never do warned him i don't know how many times he despises me up to this time i've had charge of many disciples but i've never seen one like him before Chinlan sits in silent thought second priest nay his attitude was arrogant and disrespectful to his elders so i think eiren dono's anger was by no means unreasonable third priest i thought his hiding in the sleeve of the superior and concealing his own sin the worst of all Shinlan, he's always been gentle by nature second priest that gentleness is suspicious little demons sometimes have beautiful faces though i hate to say it don't you place too much faith in yuien dono hesitatingly there are other disciples too who think you favor him too much Chinlan. but everybody makes mistakes first priest grumblingly but those mistakes should be repented of and corrected not only does yuien dono not repent of his mistakes but he goes on repeating them does it consciously and proclaims it it's simply more than i can bear up to this day i've worked long for the good of the temple happily our sect has come into today's prosperity but the authority of the law has begun to decline it's a grievous matter i've lost my power to control the disciples i'm ashamed to live in the same temple with yuien dono if he's to stay i ask leave to go tears stand in his eyes shinlan looking at the first priest compassionately you mustn't leave the temple i know well how you've worked for it you've shared its joys and sorrows with me up to this day and hereafter please help me until the end first priest i want to stay in the temple forever second priest then yuien dono goes doesn't he third priest isn't that a matter of course shinlan i can't put yuien out either the three priests look at shinlan what you say is in short that yuien being an evil man i should expel him out of the temple 
I think that if he's evil, there's the more reason for not expelling him. If we cast Yuien, who's bad even in the midst of our love and protection, out among the indifferent people of the world, what'll become of him? Won't he simply get worse and worse? Won't he injure the people of the world? His badness goes without saying. Where's the man who isn't bad? We're all bad. Other reasons may be valid, but his badness is no reason. Anyway, in this temple, there ought to be nothing but bad men in this temple. Isn't that the difference between this temple and others? The compassion of Buddha falls on the heads of us sinners like rain. You ought all to know this well. You know it so well you forget, don't you? Eren, do you remember how you and I first started this temple? First priest, I remember well. Shinran, I can't forget that time. Our breaths thrilled with the joy of organizers. Thanks to you, we gathered alms from priests and laymen, and it was you who chose this site. First priest, how delighted we were the day we raised the ridge pole. Shinran, that day you and I kneeled down before the Buddha and adopted five fundamental principles. What was the first of them? First priest, it was, we are bad men. Shinran, exactly. And the second? First priest, will judge no other man. Shinran, please settle this affair too by those principles. It's utterly impossible to determine what's good and what's bad. That's first to be understood through the wisdom of Buddha. I have absolutely no knowledge of the two words good and bad. If Yuien's wrong, Buddha will probably judge him. The first priest sits hanging his head in silence. Second priest, but this is too much. Shinran, we must forgive without judging. Just as we're forgiven by Buddha, you see. We must forgive no matter what evil's done us. What though a devil should come and torment your child to death before your eyes, you'd have to forgive that devil. If you cursed him, you'd sin. The price of sin is death. If you commit the smallest sin, your soul must fall into hell. The terrible thing about wronging another is that oftener than not, the wronged is also drawn into the judgment. Didn't you curse Yuien? Was your soul free from sin? Forgive him, forgive him. Third priest. Under such circumstances, could we keep our tempers absolutely? In the face of that arrogance, that willfulness, and that indignity. Shinlan. That's not unreasonable, but it's not good. No matter what the circumstances, you mustn't get angry. You should really have forgiven him without the least show of anger. But who can do that? Don't, oh, don't give yourselves up to anger. If you're careless with fire, it quickly spreads. Shut your eyes, shut your eyes. Don't judge your antagonist and simply pray, Namu Amida Butsu. Second priest, that's a very hard thing. Jinlan, it's hard, but it's the noblest thing and the wisest. Namu Amida Butsu suffices for everything. He puts his hands together to show them. First priest, I was wrong after all. No matter what Yuyan Dono did, it was my place to forgive him, no matter how painful it might be. Before I knew it, the horns of my selfishness had sprouted. Shinlan, forgive him. First priest, I do. Tears come into his eyes. Second priest, I say nothing more. Third priest, I too forgive him. Shinlan, it relieves me to hear you say so. We ought all to forgive each other and live intimately together. All men are unhappy, you see, for they're all bound for the grave. We must so live that we'll never have to exclaim in regret, would that I had forgiven him then. Devils are bad, I tell you. Men are all sons of Buddha. Finding flaws in the children of Buddha, they breathe into them the spirit of execration. Against that, nothing avails but forgiveness. There's no limit to judgment. We must pray. The peace of the heart comes first. First priest. Really, that's true. After one's been reviling, his heart's lonely. My present heart of forgiveness makes me feel victorious as my angered heart didn't. Jinlan, most true, most true. If there's a vision of the pure land in a man's heart, that's exactly the appearance of the heart when it has forgiven. Second priest, then what do you intend to do with you, Dono? Jinlan, I'll admonish him well, but since you're reconciled now, I'll tell you that I find something narrow in your thoughts. For instance, have you thought of the destiny of this harlot called Kaede? It's not right simply to call her a low woman and cast her out. Isn't she the most unfortunate of those involved in this affair? Once, when Honen-sama stopped overnight at Muro, a harlot came and asked about the way. 
then how kindly he explained the law to her she wept and went away happy and one of the disciples of ashaka-sama was loved by a harlot then it's related ashaka-sama made her into a nun buddhist affinity is a mysterious thing you must consider the welfare of that harlot too you must pray for the lots of yuyen and the harlot let's all pray and think hard won't you here i speak only of what concerns you for yuyen i'll admonish him well now won't you please go out and send yuyen to me first priest certainly we'll call him at once second priest we must pray and think hard third priest then we'll go i'm sorry we've troubled you shinran not at all i'm delighted that you've understood me perfectly the three priests go out shinran sighs poor disciples each has his own sorrows to bear i pity them every one pauses now yuyen is treading the way i followed with dubious steps sighing pauses i want to lengthen out his dream but in the end he must awake goes out on the veranda looks at the cherry flowers blossoming in heavy abundance they're out beautifully pauses a frog croaks quietly in the distance shinran thinks truly this is an old old story loses himself in reverie enter yuien when he sees shinran he falls on his knees and weeps shinran goes to him and pats him on the back yuien don't cry i practically understand i won't scold you hard for i know you condemn yourself yuien i hid it from time to time i lied to you what shall i do please do anything you like to me i'm ready to receive any punishment i deserve it shinran i have no desire to judge you i'm raising prayers of intercession to buddha for you for your sin yuien please condemn me please whip me shinran buddha forgives you i think yuien i'm guilty i'm guilty shinran deepen that feeling of guilt with the feeling of thankfulness yuien eiren sama a moment ago in the main hall eiren sama weeps afresh squeezed my hand and begged forgiveness i couldn't bear it for i'd hated him shinran he's an honest and good old man yuien i feel an indefinable fear because through me the peace of all of you has been upset but what a predicament i'm in i can't bring rest to eiren sama's soul he looked fixedly at me with tears in his eyes waiting for my assurance of one important thing but with my heart craving reconciliation and pardon i simply returned his grip firmly and said nothing of the important thing i couldn't shinran that's a thing that we must all settle by our prayers come you'd best quiet your heart a pause shinran looks intently at yuien you're all worn out yuien for many nights i haven't been able to sleep there's always a heavy load on my heart shinran the heavy load of love but you must put that heavy load on buddha too you can't settle the course of that love by yourself yuien is it possible that this love can't be fulfilled this sincerity of mine no no i can't think of such a thing we vowed time and again that though heaven and earth crumble our love will never change shinran not in a myriad ages in your condition where you don't know even the morrow earnestly man can't make vows pointing into the garden who can promise that these cherry flowers at the height of their glory will not be scattered by a storm to-night and again without the consent of buddha not one bright petal can fall to the earth every phenomenon arising and decaying in the three worlds is under his control it's the same with love of the countless loves of men and women only those are fulfilled that he approves all the rest must drain the cup of disappointed love yuien trembling that's too terrible then what's to become of my love i wonder shinran it may be fulfilled and it may not be fulfilled man can't know the future yuien is it a thing to be left unfulfilled i'll forfeit my life shinran lovers without number have vowed thus through the ages and they've raised weak arms against fate then they've been cast down on the earth many unhappy souls have done likewise and are asleep in their graves yuien please help me shinran i pray for you that your love may be perfected more than that's beyond man's province you simply pray also pray if it be our fate please unite us 
Never vow. That's the terrible mistake of violating Buddha's province. But though it's a mistake, it can't escape retribution. Yuien. If it's not our fate? Shinran. You can't be joined. Yuien. I can't think of such a thing. I can't bear it. It seems too unreasonable. Shinran. If Buddha's wisdom finds it good, it's reasonable. Created things must find their destiny in the plans of their creator. That's surrender. That's conversion. Doesn't the worker in clay take a clod and make of it earthen images, one beautiful and one ugly? Yuien. Are man's vows and his fate unrelated like total strangers? Nay, are they more often in the cruel relation of despot and victim? Is the wish, would that it might be thus, trampled underfoot by the doom, it must be thus? Every desire, no matter how pure and human? Shinlan, that's where prayer comes in. That which joins inwardly the wish and the decree is prayer. Prayer arouses fate, or we may say it creates fate. Didn't the supreme prayer of Hozo Biku change the fate of men condemned to hell into a sure fate in paradise? If the prayer, O Buddha, if it be thy will, join us two together, enters Buddha's ears and moves his heart, that will be your fate. That's called the hearing of prayer. That's its subtle effect. Yuyan springing up. I'll pray. I'll pray with all my heart. I'll arouse my fate with prayer. Shinlan. In prayer there's a great practical feeling. Nay, the deepest of practical things is prayer. Praying for love is nothing other than loving truly. Now, above all else, you must make your prayer holy. In other words, your love must be pure to please the heart of Buddha. Yuyan. Ah, oh, I wish my love to be holy and pleasing to the heart of Buddha. Master, what sort of love is holy? Shinlan. Pure love is the love permitted to the children of Buddha. It's the love that curses absolutely no one. Neither Buddha in the first place, nor the loved one, nor any other man, nor one's self. Yuien listens with all his strength. From time to time he looks uneasy. Shinlan speaks gravely. There are two ways of not cursing Buddha. One's to vow not at all. The other's to hate not the Buddha, though your love be not fulfilled. Yuien. In the end, it's a matter of leaving all to Buddha, isn't it? Shinlan. Exactly. Not to curse any other man means not to injure others because you love the one. There's this selfishness in love. It's the thing that defiles love most. It's at the bottom of this whole trouble. For the sake of love, you've deceived me and failed in duty toward your elders and friends. There's nothing so prone to exclusiveness as love. And many pairs of lovers try to increase their own intimacy by the exclusion of others. The words, I don't like such people, convey secretly, but all the more strongly, the sense, I like you. But there's a sweetness in that. But it's a sin. Think. Aren't they trying to make themselves happy by cursing others? Yuien. My breast's so full of her that there's no room left for thoughts of anybody else. Moreover, if that weren't true, I wouldn't feel that I was loving. Shinlan. In that lies love's mistake. There's an infinitude of energy in love. It's not a thing of mass that's broken into a hundred parts if one love a hundred men. The love in which you can't love this one because you love that one is not true love. Hozo Biku's myriad sufferings in water and fire were all because of his love for every single soul in the world. Holy love must deepen through loving others. The loved one sends word, please come to me, and you want to fly to her. But today your friend lies ill and you must nurse him. Then what'll you do? To desert him and fly to an ecstatic meeting is the way of ordinary love. Then, if for the sake of nursing that friend, you endure your desire to go, and the loved one who sent word that she wants to see you says, then please don't come but stay and nurse your friend, and, if thinking that by this endurance and sacrifice your love has become nobler, you afterwards in the affliction of your loneliness weep and pray for each other, that may be called holy love. Such a failure to meet doesn't weaken love, but rather makes it strong and true. That's happiness. Yuyen. What I've done has been the opposite of holy love. I've injured others for my own happiness. Jinlan. Not to curse oneself means not to break the peace of one's soul. That's the worst of things and the most likely to go unnoticed. You can't sleep, can you? Your heart's astray and restless, isn't it? You're thin and pale. That's a chaotic state. Don't you think yourself wretched? Looks at Yuyen compassionately. Yuyen weeping. Even shamefully wretched. 
I'm astray like a homeless dog. Jeering at himself. Today I was reviled for a thieving cat by the mistress of the Matsunoya. By that old she-devil not worth so much as my little finger. Shinran. You ought to be ashamed of using such words. You're completely distracted. Unless you respect yourself and maintain your dignity, your love's not holy. To rend your own body is to be in the purgatory of beasts in this life. You, a child of Buddha, whose appearance ought naturally to be calm and resigned, are completely crazed. Yuien, oh, what shall I do? I seem to be about to lose sight of my own nature. Shakes madly. Shinlan, wait, Yuien. The most essential thing remains. You mustn't curse the one you love. Yuien, curse that girl? The sweetness for whom I'd give my life? Shinlan, yes, hear me well. Yuien, there lies the distinction between ordinary love and the love called charity. The distinction became evident to me through my bitter experiences. The true nature of ordinary love can't be seen by you, who are now in the very center of love's whirlpool. A curse is bound up in love. It lies in this that the lover is not concerned to make happy the fate of his beloved. Nay, rather at times his selfish passion enters in to make a sacrifice of her. That passion's a ticklish thing closely related to hate. Lovers, while breathing curses on each other, think they're blessing each other. There are those who kill their sweethearts. There are even those who compel them to die with them. They all do these things in the name of love. True love is interested in the fate of the other. Ordinary love doesn't necessarily make the fate of the other happy. Has Kaeda made you happy? You're distracted and in anguish. And have you made Kaeda happy? Yuien, recalling a certain scene. Oh, poor Kaeda-san. Shinran, it's rarely that ordinary love doesn't injure the fate of both. That's why love becomes sin. In holy love, you must make the loved one your neighbor and love her with the love called charity. You must pity her compassionately. You must look upon her with eyes like those with which Buddha sees all living things. Not thinking of her as your own, but as a child of Buddha, an utter stranger. Yuyen crying out, It's impossible. It's impossible for me. Shinlan, Just so. It's impossible. But you must. Yuyen feels dizzy. Ah! puts his hand to his brow, that we should have to love, injuring each other as we do. Shinlan, that's human love. Yuien, as if to himself, Ah, what ought I to do? Shinlan, quietly, Namu Amida Butsu is your only hope, closes his eyes. After all, there's nothing to do but pray, O oh, Buddha, let me not injure that girl. Through my love of her, let me not harm others. Let me not madden myself. Yuien, folding his hands. If it's our destiny, grant that we be joined. Shinlan, oh, pray like that, and set yourself with all your heart to make that prayer come true, as far as you can. For the rest, the Buddha will help you. Yuien says nothing. His emotion mounts higher and higher, and he finally breaks down and sobs. Leave everything to the all-compassionate Buddha. He knows everything, the pain in your heart and your grief. Praise. O oh Buddha, grant a happy end for the love of these poor little ones. Curtain. End of Act 5. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Act 6, Scene 1 of The Priest and His Disciples by Kurata Hyakuzo. Translated by Glenn William Shaw. 1886 to 1961. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Act 6, Scene 1. Persons in the Act. Shinlan, aged 90. Zenlan, now called Jishimbo, aged 47. Yuyen, aged 40. Shoshin, formerly called Kaede, aged 31. Tone, Yuyen's daughter, aged nine. Suma, Yuyen's daughter, aged seven. Senshin, a disciple. Kenchi, a disciple. Tachibana Motokazu, a warrior. Two attendants. A court physician. Several palanquin bearers. Several priests. The action takes place at the temple of Zempoin. The time is the autumn of the fifteenth year after the events in Act Five. Scene One. The garden in the grounds of Zempoin, a wall at the back and to the right. 
a side gate at the end of the wall to the right beyond the wall the temple buildings are visible there is a pool in the garden on its banks quiet trees in their shade a summer house a road enters the grounds through the first gate which is invisible crosses the garden and passes in through the side gate it is morning otone and osuma are bouncing a ball in the summer house otone picking up the ball it's my turn suma sama bounces the ball otone and osuma singing together two balls fall in with each other and says one of the balls says she oh sister elder sister let's find a job says she chirp chirp the sparrows are singing milady milady get up get up the sun's gone down at the temple gate to the west i look and lodging there's none to the east i look and lodging there's none otone missing the ball oh osuma there you've missed goes to pick up the ball otone quickly picks it up and begins to bounce it it's mine big sister otone wait it's mine once more excuse that one osuma i won't i'll bounce it otone i tell you to wait osuma i won't i won't tears come into her eyes otone beginning to bounce the ball regardless under a tea tree stood an inn osuma trying to seize the ball it's my turn it's my turn otone turning away from her drain off one drink o choroku san drain off two drinks o choroku san on the third cup osuma bursting out crying big sister you're mean otone surprised come i'll give it to you here offers her the ball osuma shaking it off i won't i won't wails aloud enter shoshin her hair is cut tastefully she comes out of the gate and seeing the children quarrelling runs to them shoshin what's the matter suma-chan osuma in a tearful voice big sister she's mean she's mean otone well i said i'd give it to you osuma when it's my turn she does all the playing otone she excused one osuma i didn't i didn't shoshin for goodness sake don't quarrel this day otone mother are you crying osuma mother mother clings to her shoshin the superior's awfully sick so we're all worried really you don't know anything tearfully i feel as if the very birds in the sky suppress the sound of their wings in sorrow otone mother don't cry any more what shall i do to osuma suma sama forgive me osuma we won't quarrel any more mother shoshin embracing the two children you must be good friends come go into the house for to-day and play quietly in your room osuma and you mother shoshin i have something i must do for a little i'll come afterwards otone will you the two little girls go off through the gate shoshin the clouds in the sky seem sad like harbingers of a great misfortune about to visit the earth looking in through the gate a palanquin seems to be coming probably the doctor is going home goes toward the gate a palanquin comes out enter yuien following the palanquin stands in the gate yuien please go carefully shoshin stands at the gate and bows farewell a voice saying something is heard from inside the palanquin and it disappears yuien stands in dejected silence shoshin what does the doctor say yuien despairingly ah must humanity lose its greatest man shoshin then does he say too that he can't last yuien walking in the garden as if he cannot remain still the diagnosis of the doctor from tachibana sama's palace is the same as that from the court physician they say we must resign ourselves to the fact that this is the end of a long life shoshin is there no way to save him yuien that's out of the question they say it may be to-day or to-morrow shoshin what that can't be with force as if trying to make herself believe her own words he talks cheerfully yuien that's the forerunner they say like a light that flames up a little when it's about to go out they say his pulse stops from time to time there's no telling which breath will be his last they say the end always comes like that to all who die of old age without disease so there's no hope that his passing may be without regret let us resign ourselves and earnestly shoshin 
Oh, if I could but take his place. Yuien. I've thought the same a thousand times, but that too is impossible. The superior has long since given himself up. He says Buddha has summoned him. Shoshin. In truth, his talk seems to have become especially detailed of late, and he seems to be thinking of the end. Yesterday he asked me to read him that entreaty for rebirth in the highest paradise. Yuien. Now it seems there's nothing we can do but pray for an easy passing. Thinks. Shoshin. Yuyen sama, I'm always worried. Yuyen. About Zenlan sama? Shoshin. Yes. Tearfully. He positively must be with his father when the end comes. If he departs this life with his curse undissolved. Yuyen. I'm troubled about that too. When he first fell ill, thinking that he couldn't possibly get well this time, the disciples considered together. Giodono advised him to send for Zenlan sama i'm not separated from that child because i hate him so don't trouble me with unprofitable things he said and since everybody saw that he was displeased nobody has broached the matter since shoshin but he must see him just this once anyway there'll be no second i can't bear it how zenlon will grieve afterwards yuien i've sent a messenger post haste to inada to tell him to come up to the capital at once he ought to be here now i've informed all the chief disciples shoshin you must tell him at once if the worst should happen there'd be no second chance there's nobody else that can do it yuien some time this morning i'll beg it with all my soul for the superior too is surely troubled about it in his heart shoshin of course he is i'll go and beg with you looking off stage see a palanquin has come yuien it's probably somebody to ask after his health we must welcome him Yuyen and Shoshin stand at the gate to receive the visitor. The palanquin comes in, followed by two attendants. It stops. Two attendants. Our master, Tachibana Motokazu, he has come to see the sick. Yuyen. It's kind of you to come. Many thanks for being so kind as to send your palace doctor yesterday. Please come in. We'll show you the way. Yuyen and Shoshin go in first. The two attendants go in after the palanquin. Curtain. End of Act Six, Scene One. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Act Six, Scene Two of The Priest and His Disciples by Kurata Hyakuzo. Translated by Glenn William Shaw, eighteen eighty six to nineteen sixty one. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Act Six, Scene Two. The sick room of Shinlan Shonin. At the back, an altar. Around the far side of the bed stands an antique and elegant screen with landscapes painted on it. Near the head are an armrest and a little table. On the table there are two or three volumes of scriptures and picture book. A tray with a medicine jar, a mug, and such things on it. They are covered with a white silken cloth. Everything is elegantly ornamented. The designs on the sliding screens are flowers and birds in soft colors. The surrounding corridor connects with the next room where the night watch stays. In the garden, autumn plants. Beside a two-leaf screen ornamented with oblong and square poetry papers pasted on in disorderly arrangement, a brazier with an earthenware pot of medicine boiling on it a metal basin a water bottle and such things chinlon is as thin as a crane he wears a sleeping gown of thick white stuff he raises his body a little and leans on the armrest chinlon read on shoshin with a letter in her hand when we read this we can understand how honen shonin loved his mother can't we she goes on reading from the letter though till this morning she was matchless with beautiful and charmingly tumbled hair and fragrant eyebrows this evening with the smoke out in the field those who were near her suddenly draw away and she lies a lone corpse bleaching only only in the world we trifle with matters ephemeral as the morning glory and as we speed the setting suns there is no seed of wisdom in us we should busy ourselves only in preparations for the next world this world passes in a dream it passes whether we will or no and pain and grief both are empty only in a life of phantasms last year and this year 
yesterday and today, this changing world is but a moment's empty dream. In it there are joy and prosperity, and sadness piled like mountains to the clouds. But on waking we see no slightest trace of anything left. Ah, what a worthless world! Ah, ye vanities, how wretched! Shinran. When one gets old as I am, such feelings go through and through him. I feel as if all the different things I've done during ninety years are truly a dream. The pleasures of flower and bird, wind and moon, pilgrimages over snow-covered field roads, the pangs and delights of love have all gone out like bubbles in the distance. Verily, I feel that pain and grief both are empty. Everything passes away. As if to himself, it's true. It's past and gone, my human life. The lonely grave awaits me stopping shoshin who opens her mouth to say something please read on shoshin reading the world is but a temporary world the body is but a temporary body in this brief interval we must not through thinking of profitless things and committing sins be born again in this world of metempsychosis and spite as i said before things take varied forms precious desirable lovable pitiful we think but these are all in our hearts our hearts are utterly formless but then if we continue to think we become attached to things and since this makes us pass through transmigrations we must get rid of our hearts utterly because the heart turns into a demon and tortures us it is indeed an enemy because we are worldlings we get angry we lust after things we love we prize them and desire them though one desire arise let it not duplicate itself let it be as impermanent as a thing written on water. Ah, oh, how foolish I am, you must say, and cast it away. If without thought you rest in a state of ecstasy, that indeed is a true heart. Shinlan. In that part, the pure and limpid heart of Honen-sama is clearly revealed, as if thinking of the olden days. His was a pure and beautiful nature, unlike mine. That letter is the answer to a letter from his old mother, who was sick and had told him of all her sorrows shoshin that's why he comforted and encouraged her isn't it truly it's a gentle letter full of details such as a woman might write reads on a man of genuine charity when he sees another do evil takes that evil upon himself and grieves and when he sees another do good takes that good into his own life and rejoices in nothing is he divided from others he thinks no evil nor does he slander others he envies not he speaks no hate he encourages the helpless even with a single soft and gentle word he helps men giving them even a little from time to time that is the service of the most merciful tearfully really i feel as if i'm going to cry what a gentle heart reads on no matter how wise a saint he was even such a buddha as shaka himself when in the ancient days he received a sentient body could not escape the pangs of disease the universal pains of birth decline illness and death in such things as the death agony there are no distinctions between persons if you continually deepen your conscientiousness you may well resign yourself to die when your time comes and to live until it does what though men should be able to live a thousand or ten thousand years they all both young and old would have to die once it is the rule of life that those who meet must part from whom should we be unwilling to part looks at shinlan i wonder if i hadn't better stop somehow i can't bear shinlan tensely read on at the end i remember something about the attitude to be maintained at the moment of death shoshin reading and never think such things as i wish to stay a little longer in this world ah oh, how sad for now i'm about to die her voice trembles when death draws near if you are distracted in the so-called agony of death your body is sure to be scattered you cannot but suffer some pain so no matter how you suffer give yourself up to that pain in saying if i die i die with a will keep calm and undisturbed again and again i say don't forget this feeling genku to his mother she talks as she rolls up the letter it's too dreadful to read the last part Shinran that letter to his mother makes me feel as if his words of encouragement are spoken directly to me the time presses on me the time i've long awaited but still feared i feel the need of encouragement 
i feel the struggle between a terrible uneasiness and my heart which would conquer it shoshin concealing her anxiety is it well to think of such things when you're so full of life as you are now when we're all praying for your recovery the medicine's probably ready please take it starts to go into the night watch room shinran never mind the medicine stay here i've made up my mind do i seem to be so weak that you must console me with such words shoshin does not reply don't talk to me like that any more spur me on to conquer this uneasiness this inevitable fear i must gather courage and i must put my heart in order for a beautiful and unconfused end shoshin weeps and shinran speaks to her quietly go call yuyen shoshin i go goes out shinran sits quietly with eyes closed for a moment finally opens his eyes looks about as if menaced by the shadow of something what's this cold shadow that comes from nowhere stealthily oppressing my soul the paling light of the sun the lonesomely luring voice of the wind and last night's dream ah it seems to have drawn near me closes his eyes it's the inescapable fate of all haven't i waited through long decades for that day for that eternal and tranquil rest which comes at the end of this long life of ceaseless sin and anguish knowing that this is the only sure and inevitable thing in the midst of the disappointed hopes of this world of many vain longings i've waited for it used to thinking of it i've become intimate with it heaven i often thought this pain and endurance is not forever its last day is bound to come and hasn't that thought been my one great comfort at last that day has come in spite of that why this uneasiness this unconquerable anxiety death is not to me a loss for long have i made the perfection and harmony beyond the grave my life and lived by them i believe in them still there yet remains in me a something that dreads death a heart that opposes fate oh do i yet wish to live this disease-worn i what hope is there left in this world for an old man of ninety what pleasure how obstinate is the power of the passions even yet it's terrible all my life i've accepted my fate in docility and loved it i've served it i fought against the heart that rebelled against it that's true i must keep this fight up till i go to the grave it won't be long now it'll be soon now the bugle blowing to cease fighting then i must stand before the judgment a valiant warrior who has fought the evil of a lifetime in the midst of the spiritual legions filling the sky and i'll have a crown put on my head i'll receive it kneeling down before buddha his face grows brighter and brighter from that day i'll be one in that noble host of saints what peace what glory we'll pass our days morning and evening singing songs of praise to buddha then not even the shadow of sin will knock at my heart and tearfully i can save the most unfortunate mortals suffering on this earth pauses oh anxiety go from me he prays silently enter yuyen and shoshin yuyen putting his hands on the mats and speaking gravely how do you feel shinran it's come near me i feel a foreboding yuyen tries to say something shinran cuts him off no i'll not try to avoid the unavoidable i'll accept my fate let's talk together only of important things yuyen is silent i've made up my mind yuyen painfully tense then now may your last moments be peaceful shoshin weeps shinran and yuyen are silent there is no sound but shoshin's weeping finally that too ceases and all is silent shinran buddha is calling me my mission in this world is finished he probably thinks it a pity to make this old and disease-worn man suffer on any longer in this painful world for i've lived a very long time you see ninety years is a ripe old age seldom permitted to mortals it's a good time to take leave of this world thinks yuyen i pray that you may live on and on but shinran that's the true heart of man while i am ashamed to confess it even at this time i still feel that i don't wish to die though i'm perfectly aware that it's illusion i'm ashamed i've lived my whole life perplexed in the forests of worldly passions and rising and sinking in the sea of affections ceaselessly calling on the name of buddha i fought against the impulses of my karma 
and i must keep up the fight to the grave yuien pray for me at this critical time that's necessary i must keep my heart firm to pass with as little shame as possible through the greatest single event of a lifetime i'm praying for that i want to die with a heart pure as the clear moon crossing the sky yuien please leave all to buddha i'm praying for you with all my soul with emphasis that you may realize your long cherished desire of happy rebirth in paradise shinran to die has long been my wish it's been my single hope how i've dreamed of the blessing awaiting me on the other side of the grave now has come the time for that dream to be realized the happy time pauses last night as i prayed i fell into a sleep it was blessed with a grateful dream the unworldly pure land bright with majesty and beauty spread out before my eyes my soul was filled with a mysterious joy i don't know how to convey to you that unearthly happiness the amida sutra says all the men of highest virtue come together in one place i was surrounded by a throng of saints they all wore beautiful crowns abashed i hung my head when i heard that i had that day been added to that company i wept for joy then looking i saw that a beautiful crown was set on my head as on all the rest then far off in the sky began to sound ethereal music to this the throng of saints joined their voices and sang songs of praise to buddha then flowers fell from heaven and all the air was filled with perfume as i looked fascinated at the flowers raining down on the earth all covered with golden sand i thought ah these must be the lotus blooms of paradise then i awoke yuien what a holy dream shoshin nothing could be so becoming to you as a beautifully shining crown shinlan even after i had awakened my heart danced with the after-effects of that joy but since then i've begun to feel one sign distinctly that i shall die it's a presentiment the color leaves his face shoshin please lie down she helps shinlan to lie down in his bed are you in pain shinlan yes give me a drink shoshin pours water into a mug and gives him a drink bodily anguish gives much uneasiness to men it's the worst direct evil on earth many men in their effort to escape this evil go so far as to forget the peace of their souls it's a punishment given to men i'm afraid of the death agony i must conquer that agony i must support this last heavy burden beads of sweat stand on his forehead everything will soon be over and for the rest repose like a lake awaits my soul yuien and bright and shining glory shinlan death purifies everything all the malice i've conceived during this life and all the mistakes i have made palliated by one sad funereal feeling will be forgiven the deep grass that sprouts in the graveyard will cover all foul memories forgetting the evil i have done all men will say i was a good man and i want to depart this life dissolving all curses i want to take my last farewell thinking that all men were kind to me and good and praying for their happiness yuien exchanging glances with shoshin master do you forgive zenlan sama shinlan i've forgiven him yuien please send for him shinlan does not answer shoshin crying please tell him with your own lips you forgive him yuien this is the greatest wish of my life and there's not a disciple who doesn't beseech it you must see him by all means at the moment of your passing or how he will grieve afterwards since broaching this matter once to you fifteen years ago i've held my peace to this day during all that time there hasn't been a day when i haven't thought of it i've prayed without ceasing please grant my request but this once please be reconciled with everything so that there'll be nothing to regret afterwards that's what you've just said it's in keeping with buddha's heart zenlan sama must dip for you the last cup at this late hour i have nothing but this to say weeping only may your last moments be tranquil may your passing be in the peace of reconciliation with all the world shinlan weeping i'll do what you all want me to do yuien i'm glad putting his hands to the floor he looks down and his tears fall upon the mats the other day i sent a messenger to him he ought to arrive about to-day shinlan how's zenlan getting along these days yuien he's in good health in inada shinlan 
does he believe in the buddha yuien yes hides his uneasiness he seems to be living very quietly shoshin how delighted zenran sama will be but ah that it should be just before the long parting weeps shinran don't cry pauses only pray my heart has quieted down greatly i want to keep my spirit calm please be quiet for i want to enter my long sleep in the midst of peace shoshin suppresses her tears it becomes quiet the tranquillity of conscience of one who has worked his whole life long for buddha seems to be coming to me i feel as if my soul with the feeling of vague longing is being lifted up to the next world as it weeps a quiet brightness and moist feeling envelops me like a blessing yuien come nearer me so that i can better see your familiar and faithful face yuien going near i pray for happiness for your soul Chinlun. oh i pray for happiness for yours you've served me well all your life get my rosary from near my pillow taking the rosary and holding it in his hand i give you these paulonia prayer beads as a remembrance of me there's some i received from honen sama yuien takes the rosary i've always kept them with me the protection of all the buddhas in the three worlds is bound up in these strung beads after i'm gone whenever you look at them please remember me for i shall be praying for you in the pure land the tone of his voice begins to change little by little i've left the future affairs of the temple to you praying ever to buddha settle everything after peaceful consultation with all the others in this world there are unhappy people without number love them show forth the glory of buddha rests yuien don't worry about the matters you leave though unequal to the task i'll join strength with all the others and plan for the prosperity of the law buddha will help me the seeds of the law you've industriously sown are already putting forth young sprouts on every hand buddha's august name will receive through your death more and more glorification shinran glorify his august name he gradually grows ecstatic gradually my heart grows calm i have a far-off and yearning feeling buddha mercifully draws me to him outside a cool breeze is blowing isn't it yuien shuddering yes no the setting sun burns red shinran it's drawn near the omen the room's all cleaned isn't it yuien to the last speck of dust shinran my body's cleansed isn't it shoshin you were bathed yesterday shinran call the disciples call them all for me to take leave of them to give them my last blessing shoshin i go rises yuien suppressing his great agitation and speaking to shoshin the doctor shoshin hurries out yuien gripping shinlan's hand master please make your spirit firm shinlan nodding a taper light a taper in the shrine namu amida butsu curtain end of act six scene two recording by expatriate in bangor maine act six scene three of the priest and his disciples by kurata hyakuzo translated by glenn william shaw eighteen eighty six to nineteen sixty one this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine act six scene three the stage is the same as in scene one it is night and the temple roof stands out in black silhouette against a pale sky high in the heavens hangs a yellow moon with a rainbow-like halo about it two priests with paper lanterns stand one on either side of the gate the stage is dim in the moonlight first priest see that halo encircling the moon second priest it's a strange color isn't it first priest it's yellow and has no radiance at all second priest ah the superior is at last about to go from us you see it's written that at the death of a saint wonders appear in the skies first priest yesterday the ravens cried on the roof of the main hall in the saddest voices in the world second priest even the birds and the beasts the herbs and the trees begrudge with lamentation the death of a saint first priest 
All the important disciples have come now. Second Priest. Only two or three haven't yet appeared. First Priest. The important disciples have all gathered at the bedside. Second Priest. It seemed that his condition changed suddenly in the evening. The end is not far off, I think. Ah, a palanquin has come. A palanquin comes upon the scene. It moves rapidly toward the gate. Bearer. Senshimbo sama arrives from Totomi. First Priest. Everybody's eagerly waiting. Please go quickly to the inner hall. The palanquin goes in through the gate. Shoshin comes hastily out of the gate with a worried expression on her face. Shoshin. Hasn't Jishimbo sama arrived yet? First Priest. Not yet. How are things within? Shoshin, looking off attentively toward the first gate. The end has come. Looking up at the sky. Oh, the strange color of the moon. Second Priest. It's the time of the ebb tide now. Ah, a palanquin has come. Another palanquin comes upon the scene and moves rapidly toward the gate. Shoshin looks intently at it. Bearer. Can Chibo-sama arise from Takata? First Priest. Hurry to the inner hall. The end has already come. The palanquin goes in through the gate. Shoshin. How late Zenlan-sama is. Walks impatiently in the garden. First Priest. If he doesn't come quickly, he'll not be in time. Second priest, after an uneasy silence. A light. It's a lantern. A palanquin has come. Shoshin strains her attention. Another palanquin comes upon the scene and moves rapidly toward the gate. Shoshin running up to the palanquin. Isn't it Zenlan-sama? Bearer. Yes. It's Jishimbo-sama of Inada. Zenlan leaps out of the palanquin. Shoshin. Zenlan-sama! Zenlan. Oh, Shoshin Dono. How's father? How's father? Shoshin. The end has already come. Zenlan. Oh. Reels. Shoshin. He's dissolved your disinheritance. He's waiting impatiently for you. Zenlan. Does he say he'll see me? Shoshin. He says he wants to tell you he forgives you and die. Zenlan is about to run within. Shoshin. Wait. Just one thing. Do you believe in the Buddha? Zenlan, I don't know anything. Shoshin, your father's greatly troubled about that. He's sure to ask you. Zenlan, I can't believe anything. Shoshin, please say you believe. Say you believe to soothe your father's heart. Zenlan, but I... Shoshin, please give peace to the heart of one leaving this world. Zenlan, uneasily. Ah. Third priest, hurrying out through the gate. Hasn't Zenlan sama come yet? Zenlan, I've just come. Third priest, go as fast as you can to the inner hall. They're all impatiently waiting. Already the last moment is pressing on him. Exit. Zenlan and Shoshin run in through the gate. The palanquin follows. The two priests also go in. The stage is deserted for a moment. Four or five black ravens fly out of the trees and clouding the face of the moon float above the temple roof crying eerily. The stage turns round. Curtain. End of Act 6, Scene 3. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Act 6, Scene 4. Of the Priest and His Disciples by Kurata Hyakuzo. Translated by Glenn William Shaw, 1886 to 1961. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Act 6, Scene 4. The stage is the same as in Scene 2. Night. Tapers burn red in the shrine. In the light of the paper lamp, disciples, warrior believers, and merchants sit in respectful ranks. The physician kneels beside the bed, taking Shinlan's pulse. Yuyen is at the head, tending to his wants. An uneasy expectancy holds the room in its sway. Shinlan closes his eyes and speaks in a low voice. Since all is quiet, it can be heard distinctly. Sometimes his words become ecstatic, and sometimes he speaks as if to himself. So all remember, neither is a beautiful death a proof of salvation. My ability to die peacefully as I do, in a soft bed like this, with thoughtful attendance and surrounded by loving disciples, shows that i'm the recipient of mercy i feel i don't deserve it 
I can't believe I'm worthy. But you mustn't forget that there are men dying all sorts of deaths in this world. There are those who are hewn down with a sword, and those who perish in fire and water. There are those who fall by the wayside starved and frozen. And there are those who die in extraordinary and almost unbelievable ways, in utterly unexpected accidents. And again there is the lovely maiden about to become a bride, who on the night before her wedding suddenly falls dead, without knowing how her mother will grieve, clasping her unfinished wedding dress to her palsied heart. Or there is the carpenter, who but a moment before gaily joking at his work, makes a misstep and falls from the roof and dies. There are cruel cases, so sudden and accidental, that they do not allow even time for a tear. There are others that even make one feel cynical. The miserable death referred to in the Kamuryo Sutra is explained as a passing in agony, such as the eye can't bear to behold, in which the man clutches the empty air and white sweat runs from his pores. It's a terrible thing. There's no knowing who may die in that way, according to his karma. But though they pass on in such miserable ways, if they believe in Buddha, they'll truly be saved. Salvation is firmly established and not dependent on circumstances. In faith, there's no positive proof. This is my last lesson to all of you. I speak it because I know well that there is nothing for which it is so hard to leave stubbornness and be obedient as it is for the human heart. Make your heart submissive. Make them bright, believing in all things. How much better it is to believe and be deceived than to doubt the truth. Why are men so doubting? Because they've passed long years deceiving and being deceived too much. If this world were the pure land where no false thing had ever yet existed, nobody would doubt. There's benediction in a believing heart. There's imprecation in a doubting heart. If the shadow of a doubting soul could appear, it would appear in the form of a devil. Believe in Buddha's love and believe in the victory of good. Pauses. Then his voice becomes a little louder. I stand now in a strange position. Behind me are spread out the scenes of a lifetime of ninety years and before me all is anticipation of the next world. My soul is lifted to the skies and surprisingly expanded. The grandeur of the soul speaks ecstatically. Now my spirit soars high into heaven and is about to cross the bounds of human existence. I am about to see with the eyes of my heart the world on the other side of the grave, and this world standing opposite and their natural connection. The invisible chain that's bound my soul is now about to be severed. Breaking the indefeasible laws of this earth to which it had resigned itself, my soul is now about to enter into the control of the new laws of heaven. My tried and purified soul dances in the new life. Now, indeed, all inconsistencies are about to return into one deep harmony. And I'm beginning to understand that not one of all the sorrows of this world has been in vain. Ah! I begin to understand that these were all in the plan of Buddha's love and justice. Quietly, as if to himself, everything has been well. My errors have been well. The injuries I've received. There was an inescapable affinity between me and all the travelers with whom I exchanged greetings when I passed them by chance, and between me and all the flowers I picked thoughtlessly on the roadside. They were all used in the fulfillment of my fate. Enter Senshin he bows to the disciples yuyen senshin dono come quickly to the superior's side senshin goes to the side of shinran's bed master it's senshin shinran opening his eyes is it senshin i'm glad you came his eyes fall shut at last i'm summoned senshin may you accomplish your long cherished desire of death in peace shinran i'll go ahead and wait for you Senshin, I'll never forget your kindness. There's no affinity so deep and pure as that of master and disciple. Shinlan, we'll meet again in the next world. It's a place where there'll be no second parting. Senshin, I'll come after you. I'll soon come. Tearfully, really, it'll be soon. Tears come to the disciple's eyes. Enter Kenchi. He bows to the others. Yuien bids him with his eyes come quickly. Kenchi comes to the head of the bed. It's Kenchi. Do you know me? Shinlan opening his eyes. Yes, closes his eyes. We'll meet in the pure land. Kenchi. Yes. Shinlan. How fares the law in your province?
Kenshi. It becomes more and more prosperous. Shinran. What of Senku? Kenshi. This spring he went to Oshu. Tearfully. He can't get here in time. Shinran. I'd rather hear that than see him. Pauses. All live together amicably. After I'm gone, all work for the law with united strength. Never quarrel. No matter what arises to give you painful or outraged feelings, don't curse Buddha or man. Bless everything. Endure your pain. To endure is to make virtue your own. Love your neighbor. Treat the stranger kindly. In the name of Buddha, all be bound together. His voice becomes thinner and thinner and has a tendency to break. It's wrong for you not to treat others as you'd be treated. Yuien dips a fine-haired little brush in water and moistens Shinlan's lips. The disciples follow his example. The judging heart and the vowing heart come of devils. Be the servants of others. Wash their feet. Bind the thongs of their shoes. Glorious Buddha. Gradually becoming more and more ecstatic. All the evil I did is atoned for. It's all forgiven. I become beautiful through my sins. I become beautiful through my sins. A miracle. The seven saintly fruits, the eight right ways. Clear-voiced birds sing. The serenity of groves and temples. It's a beautiful bathing pool. They're washing their golden hair. They've all taken off their shoes. How beautiful their naked feet. They fold their hands. They're all going to sing. A song of praise to Buddha. Enter Shoshin and Zenlan. Yuyen. Zenlan sama, come to him quickly. It's the end. Zenlan, forgetting all else, rushes unsteadily to Shinlan's side. Father! His voice sticks in his throat. Shinlan, they're all on their knees worshipping the three jewels. Golden fruit falls from the branches of the trees. They all gather it up and offer it to all the Buddhas of the ten directions. Ah, flowers are falling. Flowers are falling. Yuyan, putting his mouth close to Shinlan's ear. Zenlan sama has come. Zenlan speaking loud. Father, it's Zenlan. Do you understand? It's I, father. Shinlan opening his eyes and looking to Zenlan's face. Oh, is it Zenlan? Tries to raise his body and moves his hands in vain. Physician stopping him. Lie quietly. Zenlan weeping. I wanted to see you. Please forgive me. I. Shinlan, you're forgiven. There's nobody who judges you. Zenlan. I'm an unfilial son. Shinlan, you were unfortunate. Zenlan, I'm a bad man. Others have been made unhappy on my account. I curse my own existence. Shinlan, oh, terrible. To curse one's own self? Bless yourself. It's the demons who are bad. You're a child of Buddha made in his form. Zenlan, I'm unfit. I've heaped up many sins. Shinlan, Amida atoned for those sins eons ago. They're forgiven. They're forgiven. His voice grows thin and stops. The physician raises his brows. Now I'm going to leave this world, thinly but firmly. Do you believe in Buddha? Zenlan makes no reply. Don't refuse his mercy. Say you believe. Give peace to my heart on the day my soul returns above. Zenlan turns pale with the anguish in his soul. All you have to do is receive it. All are tense. Shoshin turns pale and sits looking at Zenlan with eyes like fire. Zenlan's lips are convulsed with pain. He begins to say something and hesitates. Finally, he speaks despairingly. Zenlan, my wretchedness. I don't know. I can't decide. Falls forward. Shoshin turns deathly pale. Shinlan, oh. Closes his eyes all are agitated physician everybody this is the end the deep inner emotion reaches its height but all is still and nobody raises a voice the disciples go to the head of the bed in turn they moisten shinlan's lips shinlan moves his lips slightly and an expression of agony appears in his face then it gradually calms and finally becomes the quiet expression of peace enjoyed only by the blessed in a small but firm voice that's all right everybody's saved it's a good and harmonious world a bright beauty not of this world spreads over his face oh peace the farthest the deepest namu amida butsu physician he's dead noble emotion the whole room becomes absolutely quiet all fold their hands 
For a while they all repeat, " Namu Amida Butsu." At last they cease. For a moment all are quiet. Peaceful hymnic music. It is the sign that Shinran's soul has returned above. Curtain. End of Act Sixth. Recording by Expatria in Bangor, Maine. End of The Priest and His Disciples by Karata Hyakuzo. Translated by Glenn William Shaw, 1886 to 1961.